So we uh, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I suspect there will be a few more people uh, uh, coming along in the, in the course of the morning who haven't quite made it yet. So anybody who's had a look at this 10th anniversary brochure that we've put together for the wonderful raft of events uh, that will be running at the centre this year uh, will, no doubt, um, have been impressed. <laughs> interested by, by them all, um, but also one no doubt you've noticed that there's one event that really stands out, and that is this event, which is run in celebration of the centre and all its work in celebration of the immense work of the person who founded the centre. Um, and I was looking back, just give me two minutes on this, I'm not going to reminisce for long, but I was looking back to the very first time I spoke here, which was in a conference in January 2000, organised by Jill which was intended to be a smallish conference dedicated to looking at the sort of exciting explosion of new women's writing in French at that particular time. Um, and the paper proposals kept flooding in, I think, and it ended up being a three-day conference. Yeah, yeah, I thought we'd have like five or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it really started I mean, five papers, not five days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It really started something. Uh, it, it, it launched a, a new phase in my career because that was the first paper I'd ever given on a, a, a working writer in French. Um, and, uh, and lots of other people's careers have been changed actually by uh, Jill's support, uh, Jill's encouragement and mentoring, and by being able to organise events here and attend events at the centre. So it's become very important. It's not just 10 years old, actually, it's 20 years old. In, in its current configuration, it's 10 years old. So um, that is an awful, uh, an awful lot to celebrate. Um, you will see, uh, if you just glance at the programme, that the programme is inflected by two of Jill's huge contributions. Uh, her work on mothering, which has made a big difference to the focus uh, on, on mothering in, uh, in scholarship, in women's writing, um, across cultures. Um, and of course, a brilliant, brilliant book on mothering, which came out in... 2009? 2009, okay, which is a landmark, a landmark book. So many of the papers are celebrating uh, that thematic advance. Um, and also, we're kind of going back to Jill's first monograph, which was on reading for change. We've expanded it a bit so it's writing and reading for change, because that's just such a wonderful um, sort of holistic theme that encompasses what we do when we come to this centre. Um, we ourselves are changed. I'm going to finish this very brief introduction with a paragraph um, from a piece by Jeanette Winterson um, called Writer, Reader, Words. And the little um, epigraph here says, the writer is an instrument of transformation. And the paragraph I want to read is very, very short. When I let myself be affected by a book, I let into myself new customs and new desires. The book does not reproduce me, it redefines me, pushes at my boundaries, shatters the palings that guard my heart. Strong texts work along the borders of our minds and alter what already exists. So that's the business of a lot of the texts that we're studying here, and I think that that will be projected in the papers that we're going to listen to. Um, so welcome again, everybody. Thanks very much for coming, and I think we can start with our first panel. Um, so I'm delighted to chair this first panel um, on narratives of mothering. Um, that's um, how Jill has impacted um, on my own scholarship. Um, we have uh, three research researchers today um, from uh, French and, and German, so we're representing different languages, and looking at um, different aspects of, uh, of the experience of, of motherhood or uh, choosing not to mother. So we have uh, Egla, um, first of all, um, from University of Maynooth, who's going to talk about um, mothering uh, through the experience of uh, migration. Then we have Katie Stone uh, from Warwick, who's going to uh, talk to us about um, the taboo of uh, maternal regret. And then uh, finally, uh, Jasmine, um, who's going to talk to us about um, queer uh, mothering and give her um, own spin on that. So um, I'd like to invite Agla to uh, kick off. So I should probably 
Do you mind if I sit down? I just want to start by saying that it is an immense uh, privilege and an honor and an immense pleasure to be here uh, today because Jill Rai uh, was instrumental, has been, <laughs> continues to be uh, instrumental, and, her, and your work, Jill, has been absolutely instrumental in, in, in my career. Um, I was, I did my PhD at Vilnius University, which is in Lithuania, and I started it in, in 2002, and I had absolutely no, uh, you know, supervision, uh, there was no expertise in, in contemporary women's writing or feminist cr critical theory or anything like that. So I was actually mothered into academia <laughs> by Jill, sort of at a distance, you know, I would uh, attend uh, events as often as I could here, and 20 years down the line, here I am. Uh, so it really is an amazing um, thing for me to be here today and to be able to share my work with you. Um, <clears throat> so I it will start by saying that uh, in her seminal, uh, I'm sorry, this should somehow be one. <laughs> But anyway, sorry. I mean, I will talk you through. Bear with me. Um, in her seminal uh, monograph on uh, narratives of um, my m mothering, uh, July identifies uh, a new narrative subject, which is a mother, and she embeds that narrative voice in a specific situation, which is contemporary metropolitan France, that shapes that narrative. Uh, maternal uh, subjectivity, and then she reads a corpus of texts that focus on the difference between the, the, the different experiences of mothering through the lens of mother's narrative voice to describe the new poetics of mothering, as well as the themes explored by that narrative voice. This methodological approach was productive in two ways in that it tells something about contemporary women's writing, uh, and about women's lives, the condition of mothering, about what it means to be a mother. And so in my own uh, research, I uh, follow suit and I uh, keep the same narrative <laughs> uh, subject, uh, which is uh, a mother, and I put, I to alter the situation in which that uh, narrative subject is uh, mothering, and I put it back in the situation of migration, and then I look at migrant women's writing to see what results I come up with. So this is a project that I have been working, it's, I'm towards the end of the project, I have been working on it for a number of years now, uh, so I will just present the main findings of, of this uh, research. So if Jill Rye asked the question what it means to be a mother, or what it means to mother, sorry, my research question is what it means to mother through migration. So, uh, you know, the main uh, sort of questions that shape my inquiry is to what extent is the experience of motherhood contingent upon the nature of migration? What maternal identities does migration produce? How does motherhood influence uh, the experience of migration? And the other way around. So, there are three main findings. I um, uh, reread the introduction uh, to. Uh, Jill's book yesterday, and uh, it says that the main finding of your research was that many, many mothers um, in their literary narratives of mothering speak about loss and trauma. Uh, so that um, imagery or, or that idea absolutely dominates my corpus um, as well. And the main loss is, of course, the language. So the idea of the mother tongue, like most texts, if not all, I should say, engage with the idea of the mother tongue in one way um, or another, uh, and tries to grapple with the loss of the mother tongue. 
The other sort of box of ideas is the migrant maternal subject subjectivity, and I argue that there is such a thing, and that migrant mothers develop uh, a, a distinct uh, maternal subjectivity. And then there is, of course, the whole question of integration through different mothering uh, styles. Because I feel I have talked about uh, language and, and mothering through migration to this audience so many times, I will only uh, cover it very, very briefly. So, talking about the loss, uh, it is one thing that is uh, independent from the circumstances of uh, dislocation. Every, like it, across the board, everybody feels um, a degree of pain uh, related to the loss of the mother tongue. So, uh, and I'm sorry for some reason I put quotations in English. Uh, so, the uh, Yin Chen, who actually writes in French, although she is of Chinese origin, uh, but she lives in Canada now and in Quebec. Uh, she doesn't live in Quebec, she publishes in Quebec. Anyway, uh, she says that in her essay, um, La Lanteur, uh, I have the title somewhere, right? Anyway, La, La Lanteur des Montagnes. Yeah, thank you, La Lanteur des Montagnes. So anyway, so she says that, you know, I knew that it would happen, I just didn't realize that it would hurt so much. And, and then uh, the same idea is reflected in the text, in an essay by the Lithuanian writer, the Lester Pompey. Uh, the Nancy Houston, you would be familiar with her work, famously said in 1986, So, for some people, or in some texts rather, the um, situation remains the same. So the loss of language is related with the loss of a homeland, but not more importantly so, it is related with the loss of the bond between the mother and the child. The, the loss of the mother tongue somehow inflects uh, an insufficient, unsatisfactory relation to the child. And some people, uh, in some texts, mothers feel that they are locked in that inability to reach out to their children, to have a meaningful relationship. But in most texts, uh, the, the, narrative, the narrative subjects try to grapple with the, uh, with the loss and through the creative work of language, through the maternal in language, they manage to resolve that situation. So I very much read that through the semiotic relationship uh, to the language. And Yin Chan, for example, says, um, and again, sorry about the English translation, just it doesn't matter what language, n'importe uh, quelle langue on parle, si on parle le même langage, ça va aller. So if we speak the same inflection of language, if we have the same feeling uh, towards language, we can keep uh, the bond and we can continue living uh, together. Uh, now, this author, Delesta Pompute, she uh, uses a different uh, metaphor of a shuttle translation. Um, to reflect on the idea that the mother, uh, the migrant mother, has to become very agile and has to be able to function in several different cultural and linguistic contexts at the same time in order to um, keep the relationship with the child at all. And in Several years later, sorry, um, I think that the date is wrong here. So, 12 years after uh, Nancy Houston writes Les enfants et les, les livres et les enfants, je ne peux pas le faire que dans une langue non maternelle, she then writes the following, un paragraphe n'est venu en anglais lors d'une insomnie suivant un réveil nocturne de mon bébé, ma vraie, ma vraie vie d'écrivain 
démarrer à demain à ce moment-là. And it is funny because, uh, sorry, I will uh, brag a little bit. I will be interviewing Nancy Houston tomorrow at the Literary Festival. And uh, the Literary Festival is going to happen in Virginia, and we have asked her to possibly speak in English, and she has agreed. And she is now reading. She has chosen to read, to do all her readings in English. And I said, well, but you can still read in French. But she's like, no, 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 I'm going to read in English. And so anyway, the transformation is pretty amazing, and I will be asking her about that, uh, definitely. So anyway, but uh, so in, in Houston's work, what happens is that through, her, her, through becoming a mother and through working in French and speaking in French to her children, she then reconnects with the mother tongue uh, creatively and makes herself whole, makes her um, makes her creative persona, makes her uh, narrative uh, linguistic persona whole by integrating both languages. So the language of writing and mothering and the mother tongue. And it's the only way she can um, function as a mother, as a human being, and as a wife. So anyway, uh, I will now talk a little bit more. Sorry, how am I doing for time? I haven't. Um, okay, that's good. So I would now like to talk a little bit more uh, about this um, novel by Kathleen Cusset called Un Brillant Avenir. And um, I would like to advance this idea that the circumstances of migration produce a certain um, type of migrant maternal uh, subjectivity expressed through a distinct set of mothering practices <coughs> in migration. So there are two migrant mothers featuring in this novel, and one of them is um, the mother-in-law, Elena Tiberescu, who flees to Czesku's Romania in the uh, 1960s, whilst the French daughter-in-law, Mary, lives in the US in the 1990s because she's offered, um, she moves to US because she's offered an academic uh, position. Now, the story is told in, uh, in the, through the third person narration that from the point of view of um, uh, Elaine. And her, uh, the two characters correspond very closely to what Braidotti defines as a migrant who has a clear destination and a set path. She goes from point in space to another for a very clear purpose. And as opposed to a nomad, who is, that is rather a figuration for the kind of subject who has relinquished uh, all idea, desire, and nostalgia for fixity. So we see um, this mother, Elaine, who moves to uh, US for a very specific purpose, and that is to create a safe space for herself and for her children. And uh, her, her migratory path is rather complicated. She doesn't go from one place to another. She has to move a lot <coughs> and be detained a little bit and had to, has to wait in Rome and, and be exposed to dangerous uh, situations. Um, and her sort of, um, the, the impossibility of, of her sort of happiness or sort of personal fulfillment as a migrant is sort of prefaced uh, by a very graphically described miscarriage in a public toilet at a um, refugee uh, center in Rome. And so when she moves to, to the US, she says to her son, Notre vie n'a pas d'autre but que faire de toi un homme libre dans un pays libre. Nous avons tout sacrifié pour ton avenir. Et maintenant, tu veux le gâcher, tu brises le cœur de ta mère. And the way that, in her mind, her son wants to 
Gashe Sabi is that he doesn't want to go to Harvard and he wants to live his own life and he wants to get married to a French woman and move to France. And she's saying, you're throwing everything out. You know, I've given everything so that you became American and now you want to go to France and be a nothing and be a migrant thing. <coughs> so anyway, um, and Marie, who is her, Ellen's son's <coughs> wife and mother of his child, she supposedly doesn't have any points of fixity. She, her life is chaotic, she teaches in France and in the US, and they fly one another, they fly to one another uh, to, um, to carry sperm to, uh, at an appropriate time. So, you know, they are, their life is completely uh, sort of fixity free and at the same t and of course that lack of fixity or the privilege of the not having any fixity is to do with Mary's westernness and her whiteness and, and her western uh, privilege and yet it is not true to say that she doesn't have any fixity because she does say to her mother-in-law do you know, I spent all my summers in Brittany and the fact that I'm married to an American man and, and, and have a daughter in America is not going to stop me to do that. So it's just a little detail to say that uh, although some people might want to pretend that their geographical fixity doesn't exist, um, it still does. They're simply not tied by it in quite the same way. So, uh, to conclude, I would like to say that maternal subjectivity and resulting mothering practices may seem like intimate parts of human existence. However, mothering is also a profoundly social activity and as such is significantly informed by social and political structures as well as migratory regimes. Migrant mothers are subject to it therefore seems to me that in the age of the growing classification of the migrants into the good and the bad, the desirable and non desirable ones, the growing policing of migrant families and parenting overall, the link between parenting styles and the circumstances of the parents' dislocation should probably not be undermined. And I thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to look at uh, mothering from a German perspective with uh, Katie Stone's uh, intervention on maternal regret. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you as well for having me here. It's um, a real pleasure and I suppose like Hegel, I just also would like to think back. I think it was 2013 that I first met Jill as part of the big, um, I always forget the name of the conference, the, the massive interdisciplinary motherhood conference. Um, and that was back when I was doing my PhD. And it opened a huge number of doors for me. Um, Jill very kindly asked me to get involved with the CCWW and um, through gym uh, language websites. Uh, I contributed to the book and that resulted from the conference. Through that, I met Valerie Heffernan, who then employed me as a postdoc over in Ireland. Then I managed to get a second postdoc with her help, which has then led me to get my job today, um, working on motherhood on this topic, which is, you know, oh God, six years later. And I'm still sort of on this motherhood topic, um, which has really opened a huge number of doors for me. Um, and I think what really stands out is obviously I'm a journalist. Jill had no reason to support and help me as much as she did, but she really always has and has helped, sort of helped me find ways to organise little events that would help me sort of make my little mark uh, and help me sort of get my foot in the door of the academic career of the world. So um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I only sort of can apologise for the fact that I'm not giving a very uplifting paper today. Um, as you may be able to guess from the title of Eternal Regret, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm looking at it, literary representations of this notion of maternal regret, which I imagine the sort of the, the, the backstory and also the consequences um, for women who admit that they uh, regret becoming mothers. Um, when I come to the end of my paper, unfortunately, I end with quite a tragic story, and um, so I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> 
Um, the starting point for this study is really a social, for, my, for my paper, is a sociological study by uh, Orna Dona, uh, who's an Israeli sociologist. Uh, and in 2015, she published, or she published a groundbreaking, um, sort of trailblazing article in Science on the topic of paternal regret. And she'd interviewed 23 Israeli women who were willing to um, discuss their answer to the following question. So if you could go back in time with the knowledge and experience you have today, would you be a mother? And these 23 women from various different backgrounds were happy to go on record and say, no, they would not make the same decision if they could go back. Um, now clearly uh, this is a very radical confession and it's something that is not only a taboo in mainstream society but also in maternal studies where previously the, the focus has been on ambivalence at best where ambivalence is understood as something that usually ends in acceptance uh, and what these women say is no that acceptance never comes I have never come to terms with my maternal role um, and it wasn't my ambivalence hasn't just been a temporary obstacle to happy mothering Dona's study makes no claims for representativity. She says she only interviews obviously 23 women. Uh, she doesn't say that she thinks maternal regret is particularly common. But what she does say is that she thinks it's really important to acknowledge that regret is a possible maternal emotion, and that actually talking about this very extreme maternal emotion might help to challenge um, the sort of systems of power that compel women to see motherhood as uh, an inevitable part of femininity. Now, these systems of power that she talks about crystallised in a debate in Germany <coughs> triggered by this academic article. So, in April 2015, um, a sort of dis this article in Science was picked up by one of the major broadsheets in Germany, the Zu Deutsche Zeitung, um, which reported in a fairly um, factual manner about what had been written here and why it was interesting from the German point of view. And this initial article then triggered a storm of comments on Facebook and Twitter. And you can see here, this is just a, a bit of the Facebook page of the original article that shows that very quickly it picked up one and a half thousand comments. Um, within a couple of weeks, all the major newspapers in Germany, regional and national, had poured over this topic. They sort of started to debate why it was that this academic article seemed to be so interesting to the German population, why so many people were going on Twitter to comment on it. And the debate was also very heated. There were two very interesting signs. As Germans started to think, why is this uh, so interesting <coughs> to the German population, uh, there are a couple of trends that um, or recurring points of discussion, which I'll just briefly allude to. So the first, that there was a sense that the German discourse in mother of motherhood was very much defined by its history. Um, so this idea that motherhood is still very much viewed as something that's quite sacrosanct, a public role in Germany, going back to the sort of Protestant and Enlightenment tradition, but also obviously because of the Third Reich. Um, motherhood also became a major site of contention during the, third, um, during the Cold War. So in West Germany, you have a sort of very traditional model of motherhood. Um, political discourses seeing mothers and family almost as a path to the redemption of the nation after the Third Reich and as something to be protected, which meant that the sort of male breadwinner model uh, persevered through much of the 23rd cent uh, 20th century in West Germany. In East Germany, there was a much more, um, I suppose, modern in inverted commas conception of motherhood, where mothers were expected to work and to be mothers, and they weren't supposed to choose between the two. Um, and all this has then led into sort of still ongoing debates about motherhood in 21st century Germany. On the one hand, because of the low birth rate, which has led to people sort of think, why don't women want to become mothers anymore? What's wrong with the German setting? Uh, and the uh, sort of common response to that has been that the persistence of a patriarchal family model in Germany has made it very, very difficult for women to combine a uh, career and motherhood until very, very recently. So against this background, it hardly seems surprising that Dona's study had emboldened many mothers and women in Germany to share their negative experiences of mothering. Um, and there were certainly many sympathetic voices um, that well, there, were many, there were many people that were sympathetic to Orna Donat, Donat's argument um, that giving voice to overlooked material emotions could help to redefine what it means to be a mother and also what it means to be a woman in contemporary Germany. And they felt that this notion of regret had provided quite a robust vocabulary for talking about material experience in a much more um, nuanced way than it had previously been possible. 
However, there was clearly, um, as you would probably expect, a major sort of conservative backlash against this whole discussion of maternal regret. Um, a couple of themes that stand out are um, journalists who thought the whole thing was a bit of nonsense. Um, they, uh, editor of the Develop, which is another major newspaper, Robert, Robin Alexander, uh, described everything as nonsense. He said the whole thing bypassed really important issues by which he meant things like nuclear negotiations with Iran, peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. Who cares, basically, in this context? Um, this sort of words like nonsense, self-pity, whining, really recast rec the whole discussion. Um, so where some sympathetic participants in the debate had actually said, you know, all of this shows the, how far we've still got to go in terms of um, creating a political infrastructure that supports mothers and families in Germany. Others just said that it was a personal problem uh, and that people should get over themselves. Uh, the most extreme contributions um, labelled regretful mothers, mothers and ambivalent mothers are sick, shameful, out of control. Um, and there was a tendency to therefore imagine that these women who admitted that they uh, did not feel comfortable as mothers and regretted becoming mothers, uh, they tended to be depicted as young and irresponsible. Uh, so a nice tweet from Twitter, uh, Twitter, you know, if a couple of young people would think about the consequences of their actions, the hashtag regretting your mother wouldn't exist. Um, so this is sort of symptomatic of the way in which Dona's study was reframed in the German context. Um, so none of the women interviewed by Dona's had been um, teenage mothers, they, most of them hadn't been single mothers from the outset. Many had post-secondary school qualifications, and the majority self-defined as middle or upper class, uh, and yet this is how the German context imagined that they must be. Now this is 2015, and there's very much signs that this debate still continues to resonate and also shape discussions of um, motherhood in Germany. There are a number of follow-up um, publications, there have also been a few sort of artistic engagements with the topic, um, and the two novels that I want to talk about today, which are Charlotte Rorsch's Meeting for Alice, which sort of translates to Jill of All Trades, uh, and Verena Hazel's Lasse. Lasse is a Norwegian name, but the German verb Lassen means to be, so it's a really sort of ambivalent title. Um, both of these novels, when they were reviewed, were connected to the hashtag regretting motherhood debate. So my paper today really wants to look at um, why that is, the extent to which we might be able to see um, Orna Dona's research um, having a wider impact in contemporary discussions of motherhood in Germany. Uh, I think it's important to point out that both these novels are narrated from the perspective of a mother, and that is still a fairly recent trend in contemporary German uh, literature. So there was a lot of mother-daughter writing in the 1970s, um, in the sort of early 21st century, there are a number of multi-generational um, novels written by women that did give voice to mothers, um, but not necessarily as narrative subjects in their own right. Whereas here, it's the, they are matrifocal narratives, they are about the experience of mothering. Um, so with that in mind, I'm building on Jill's um, own look at matrifocal narratives. Um, and the extent to which, by allowing mothers to become narrative subjects in their own right, authors are able to powerfully testify to ambivalent experiences of pregnancy and early motherhood, uh, and to the extent to which women may become engulfed by modernity. Um, like the writers that Jill has investigated, Roche and Hazel demystify mothering. And with varying degrees of earnestness, they explore um, the circumstances that could lead a woman to adopt a stance of regret in relation to her children, and they also consider the ethical consequences as to what happens after a woman admits that she regrets having her child. Uh, and in this respect, they do risk demonising uh, these mothers, contrary to what Orna Dunath was trying to do. So I'm going to start with Mädchen für Alles, Jill of All Trades, which is the third novel from the standard author Charlotte Roche, who is very much famous in Germany for transgressing to be about sex and the female body. Uh, and here she's adding motherhood to the mix. Um, and I think, like all of the novels, this one is sort of just there to shock people. 
Um, so she demystifies the experience of maternity, describing things like the pain of breastfeeding, the isolation that comes with maternity leave. Um, and she uses the language of performance to emphasise the narrator, Chrissy's struggle to inhabit maternity. So when Chrissy takes her daughter, Mila, for a walk in the pram, she comments, that's what you do as a mother. I have no idea why. <laughs> um, another example, um, she goes out, she sees that the nanny is sat out in the garden with the baby. She thinks, oh, I should probably go and sit with her. And we just sit down in a motherly way. So motherhood is something that she's always consciously doing. Um, and this obviously dramatises uh, Miel Chandler's conviction that mother is best understood as a verb, so as something that one does. And this denaturalises the connection between femininity and motherhood. Um, as you might have already guessed, this is a novel in which the performance of motherhood quite often fails. Um, so when Chrissy accidentally gets a corrosive substance in her eye, she and her husband rush out of the house to go to the doctors, forgetting their baby. Uh, when the couple return home to the sounds of Mila crying, uh, their differing reactions are telling. Neither of us speaks. The looks on our faces say everything. Mine says accusation, his desperation. Um, and I think we have to be very thankful in this novel that the father exists. Um, so the narrator constantly delegates responsibility for childcare to Jörg, her husband. When she talks about them feeding their daughter, she even uses the German word stillen, which is to breastfeed. So she uses this word uh, because he does it so much better than me, and he remembers better than me too. Uh, and she's very open about the fact that she's a pretty shitty mother. Uh, the novel also de-romanticizes de what Diane Negra calls the retreatist master narrative of post-feminist culture. So Chrissy says initially she decided to have a child because she found work uh, very stressful and she thought perhaps it would be better if she could just stay at home with a child. But obviously that was um, a myth. Because to be completely honest, a child is much more tiring and comes with much more pressure than the job that I had before. What a bad decision. <laughs> so she... Um, and Orna Dove has talked about the fact that one of the cultural criteria of good motherhood um, is evaluating motherhood as worthwhile. Uh, so by this standard, um, Roche's protagonist, Chrissy, is very much a bad mother. Um, and that's before twist in the novel, which is when she becomes increasingly infatuated with her nubile maid slash nanny, um, which distracts her entirely from motherhood and um, mothering. So the jail of all trades in the title is Marie, the nanny, who's initially hired to help around the house and provide childcare support. But Chrissy starts to imagine that this woman could replace her completely as mother and as wife. Uh, so she thinks, I'm going to teach her how to cook my mother's favourite recipes, for example, um, so that she can teach my daughter one day when I'm not here. Um, she manipulates Marie into spending more and more time with her, and this reopens the doorway to a de decadent lifestyle of partying, drug taking, that Chrissy had abandoned before becoming pregnant. Her obsession with Marie peaks when Chrissy discovers that her parents have decided to remarry. And this is something deeply traumatic for Chrissy, who had been really um, thrown into crisis as a young girl by the divorce of her parents, and the fact that now, finally, when she's got her life settled, they decide to get back together again, um, really plunges her into crisis. Uh, and the final chapters see her really fantasising that Marie will allow her to take revenge on her parents, and these fantasies become more and more violent and more and more erotic. And the final chapters see Marie and Chrissy embark on a drugs and sex filled journey home to Munich to visit the parents, and they leave a sleeping Mila at home alone, which is a final refusal to perform the maternal role. Um, this conclusion is interesting, um, and it really is supposed to dramatise the limitations of the language of performativity when applied to mothering. You cannot simply refuse to perform uh, the task of caring, and that's something that Envy Jeremiah and Miel Chandler have both talked about in detail. <coughs> to a certain degree, Roche sidesteps ethical questions through the hyperbole, um, the hyperbolic characterisation of Chrissy who is completely narcissistic and um, very much um, displays histrionic tendencies, is not really portrayed in the realist character, more of a caricature. So we're not invited to take her seriously. 
At the end of the novel as well, Roche frames Chrissy's refusal to perform maternal identity with revenge fantasies that are very much reminiscent of popular culture, and these obviously typically have a cathartic function. And I would argue that this frame provides a sort of generic insulation that reminds us of the fictionality of what we are reading. And Roche's tongue-in-cheek prose sort of revels in these joys of transgression, and they create a, a cognitive playground where anything goes. And I borrowed this term from um, Leon Rappaport, um, who talks about risque humour. Um, and he says the important thing about this sort of humour isn't that it's inviting us, it's not inviting us to abandon our moral values, but just to rise above them for a moment, to take a breather from being good and from the serious work of trying to make a better world. And um, so maybe we'll carry this burden of goodness a little more lightly, and with the broader perspective that we follow from having a good life, to our sacred cows. And of course, we know that there are none more sacred than motherhood. Um, how, how am I doing? Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Um, I was, uh, the, the second novel I want to talk to is much more earnest in that it takes um, as its sort of um, central character a typically at risk mother, um, a young girl who has no parent parental network, who falls in love with a junior doctor uh, and really sees him as the ticket to a better life for herself, projecting her fantasies for family onto him. Uh, when she falls pregnant, uh, this is another very delusional character, um, very naive as well. Uh, when she falls pregnant, her sort of uh, delusional nature becomes very clear to him and he leaves her. And this character really tries everything that she can in order to um, be a good mother. She buys all the right books, she consumes in order to become a little respectable mother. She feels like motherhood is the way for her to really uh, attain perfect femininity. And she is obviously deeply disappointed and shocked as well by the reality of motherhood, um, which leaves her very much alone, um, dealing with um, obviously the traumatic after effects of birth and the difficulties of trying to mother with very few uh, financial means. Um, and she also realises that there is nobody there who is really willing to listen to negative experiences of mother mothering. All the groups that she goes to are all about celebrating maternity, celebrating babies, nobody wanting to help her. Uh, even medical professionals seem not to recognise that this is a woman in crisis. Um, at the end of the novel, um, Nina sort of goes on to a forum. Um, she, at this point, she is on an ecstasy binge as well, so we have her as an irresponsible mother. Um, but she goes on to a forum, so does anyone know that feeling where your child is screaming and you just want to be a long way away? Uh, and this comment triggers a sort of very negative, shaming reactions that we're familiar with from the regretting motherhood debate. The baby's screaming in the background, uh, and finally she lets out her frustrations, expresses what she's really feeling to the only person that she can get to listen to her, and that is her own uh, infant child. And here she sort of, uh, admits her regret for uh, what's going on. Never did I imagine a life with a baby would be like this, not like this, never. And clearly her only sort of frame of reference was the mummy guys that she's been able to buy, but she has no family of her own. Um, you know what, not even your father wants you, do we understand what that means? I don't want you either, I've made a mistake, a terrible mistake, but am I meant to pay for it forever? Um, the ending of the book is particularly shocking because it's actually sh um, shouting us at the baby, she's obviously shaking him as well. And the book ends um, with the death of the baby, which this character is in absolute denial about because for all she sort of recognises that she's finally a perfect mother with a perfect child who was in crying. Um, and it's a very, very um, tragic ending to a novel. And when you start off reading this book, the character is very unlikable, very much like the character in Roche's novel. She's ridiculously naive, um, and it's very hard to take her seriously. But as the novel goes on, you um, actually start to bristle at the fact that the entire rest of the world is ignoring this girl who is trying to do the very best that she can. Uh, and this is particularly the case of the father, Leonard, who's a junior doctor, and his parents, who refuse to take responsibility for either Nina or for the baby, even though they realise that she clearly is going to struggle with this job. Um, 
how to record the paper that ends like that. Um, I come back to Jill because um, you've done a very good job of dealing um, with um, these radical attempts to open up conversations, taboo conversations about mothering and the way in which mothers are treated by society. Um, and you've talked about the extent to which in confounding our judgment, um, such narratives as those I've spoken about today confront us with our own prejudices and invite us to think about the multiple possibilities of what it means to mother and be a mother in these challenging, changing times. Um, and I think that's a, a nice way to wrap up, so I won't say anything else. <laughs> Thank you. paper is Jasmine Cooper. She's a doctoral student at the University of Cambridge and she's going to talk to us about the concept of queer childlessness. And so slightly changed it and <coughs> queer and childlessness mainly because one of the central topics um, or themes of my paper is looking at a fear um, and vulnerability. Um, but I also just want to echo the um, sincere thanks. Um, I mean, personally, feel very indebted um, as um, not only a student, but now teaching some undergraduates to whom I always usher them straight away to um, Jill's work. So um, it's a great honour for me, especially so early on in my academic career, to be able to present a paper here. Okay. So in that, in in that, in this. In that um, mindset, let's carry on and think about Jill's Rye, uh, Jill Rye's work on lesbian and mothering narratives and surrogacy in France and how crucial that was when it was um, emerging um, in, the, in the last 10 years or so and how relevant it is now um, as the very live political debate about um, lesbian mothering and also single um, women in France as that debate is still continuing and anyone's followed the story of PMA was recently um, Pass through, I think there's somebody in the net, so it will um, pass that now lesbian mothers and single women can access reproductive treatment. Um, Rise timely and detailed tracking of the ongoing um, debates in France vis a vis these changing family paradigm uh, captures the centrality of traditional family structures um, to the story that France tells about its own identity, specifically how high the stakes are for the French Republic in overturning its outdated reproductive laws. And this is primarily due to the distinctive French notion of filiation or legal kinship, as my details are of. So these are some of the protests against that we see here. Um, it's a lot of anxiety, male anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is primarily, um, I would say, um, due to filiation, which I define as um, determines who can or cannot be a parent, who can or cannot have parental authority over a child. The laws of filiation hold that children can only have two parents, one of each sex. And right outlines how the emergence of narratives of non-normative familial mod models often reveal a narrative excess to normative discourse <coughs> of parent and kinship, troubling um, and calling into question the way family relationships are enshrined and normalised in the laws of the French Republic. <coughs> so we've had a radical shift in attitudes and our legislation towards homosexuality in the 20th, 20th and 21st century and a widening scope now who can partake in the traditional institutions of marriage, parenthood, adoption, medically assisted reproductive technologies. And as such, we may be seeing the moment where the reign of the heterosexual couple as commensurate with the norm starts to be overturned. So since uh, Rye's exploration of, um, there we go. Um, <laughs> um, so this is, again, this is a kind of, a, yeah, you can see. Um, so since Rye's exploration um, of lesbian mothering and narratives mother in 2009, and her work since, um, we're seeing now these laws radically change, which makes her question all the more um, that she raised in that text all the more relevant to discussions today. And just to explain, um, the anti-PMA people went around Paris and sprayed the resistance, and then the pro-PMA people went around and put hearts all over it, which I quite like <laughs> as, a, as a decent protest in these um, fraught times. Um, so I thought I'd put that there. Um, so Rye asks, how did new reproductive technologies call into question the very concept of mothering? In what ways does the gap uh, between expectation raised by recent legislation and the realities of lived experience issue a challenge not only to legislators, but also to practitioners and theorists of the family, as well as to, uh, to feminist interpretations of mothering? <coughs> so um, with any change of law, with any um, kind of emancipatory, if we want to think about it like that, or kind of assimilatory model that's 
um, see that comes in when laws change. I, I like to think about what is both gained and also what is obscured. Now, as I look at childlessness, and I think about, um, I frequently think about what is obscured, and the childless figure is one that is frequently either um, ignored as a huge silence around it in discourse. And I'm interested now in how, with this shift to a kind of um, uh, how queer parenting is becoming normalised, will the stigma attached to childlessness and the heterosexual paradigm will that also get translated across? Will the queer subject who doesn't choose to reproduce become childless and associate and all the associated um, stigmas apply to them as well? So it's this move from a condemnation of childlessness and a political infertility, if you like, to now actually in taking on the fear of childlessness within uh, a queer context. So to begin to answer Rice's question, I turn to Paul B. Preciado's work, um, whose notions of progress, um, uh, whose notions of progress with regards to queer parenting, um, he might see as frequently misnomers for assimilation and a fundamental expansion of the pharmacopornographic regime inherently patriarchal colonial and cannot possibly be read as progress, but rather more of the same, which would dangerously lead us down a route perhaps where the total domination of the body is being faced by rhetoric which pertains to progressive ideals. So um, here we see, um, so some of the things that are going on with a literal surveillance of the female body at the moment, um, I do recommend signing up to the Guardian's weekly patriarchal, patri weekly patriarchy um, mailing. Um, but this is the quote that was from one of um, Preciado's um, articles from Liberation. Um, la souveraineté d'un corps est direct, directement proportionnelle à la position qu'il occupe au sein de l'hégémonie de classe, de race, de sexualité et de, en, euh, et de handicap. Dans une société donnée, classe, race, sexualité, genre et handicap ne sont pas des réalités empiriques, mais des relations de pouvoir qui déterminent la capacité d'un agent social à utiliser librement son corps, c'est-à-dire à disposer à sa vie de ses organes, de ses cellules et de ses fluides. Knowingly, my laptop is frozen, but that's fine. Um, so, uh, Preciado is recognizing um, the very intersectional way in which we can be subjugated. He's also pointing out the fact that these categories of identity are not empirical realities, then, um, are, and, uh, and they are not ontological categories, but rather ways in which we are um, categorized in the system. So far, so so um, reasonable, but this separates then questions out of the capacity of the body, can a body reproduce, so questions of reproduction, to questions of legitimacy, should this body be allowed to reproduce, and then how can we encourage or discourage this body to reproduce. So the text I'm going to be looking at today is Les Orientales by the Franco-Iranian author Nega Javadi, which was released in 2016 to break critical acclaim in France, and then in the UK following the translation in 2018. And the novel alternates between a recounting of Kimia's family um, history and childhood in Iran, um, her life as an adult in the present, her, the opening chapter begins with us meeting, um, uh, meeting her in the fertility clinic. Um, and Kimia is not infertile, mm. but must attend a fertility clinic with Pierre, her supposed fiancé, because he is HIV positive, and this clinic washes um, sperm, so it can um, so it can them to reproduce. Pierre is not really her fiancé. Pierre has pretended to be in a couple with Kimia and her lesbian partner, Anna, who they meet by chance. And so whilst Pierre is also, Pierre is also not gay, so there's a lot of interesting queer tropes being picked up here, um, he's divorced from his wife, but they all three of them desire um, to become parents. The novel structure situates Kimia's narrative as one of self-discovery. It's a very rich novel, it's quite long, and it's got a lot of stuff in there about migration, about identity, about race, about language, about mother tongues, actually, so it might be really interesting. Um, and it's, it's so one, it, this is just one aspect. And um, it's, as I say, what about um, self-recovery, self recovery of a past, negotiating questions of her race and nationality? Also the centrality or sometimes the non-centrality of her sexuality to her identity. She was with men as well as with women. She's a queer, very contemporary queer character in that way. She also experiences gender dysphoria. So there's a lot going on with her as a character. However, the treatment of motherhood and queer motherhood is perhaps not as, uh, I would say, progressive as it might first appear. Indeed, the novel ends with Kimia just about to give birth to twins, which is foregrounded quite early on in the novel through this prophesizing of her and Nani in Iran, who says, you will have twins, 
and then kind of that's how it happens. Um, and so motherhood is also seen as some sort of arrival or the ultimate recovery of selfhood. And it's interesting listening to your paper about the fantasy, the difference between the fantasies of motherhood that we get versus actually then the expression of regret, the difficulty, and that's something that's not at all really explored um, so much. So. Um, I turn to Ahmed here to look at vulnerability. So one of the key ways in which the childless woman is invoked in this novel is as a foil for Kimia in, in the clinic. So whenever Kimia is obviously infiltrated this clinic, she's not legally allowed to go in there, she's a lesbian. Um, in a lesbian relationship, she doesn't qualify, she doesn't take any of the boxes. But with Pierre, she's bolstered by Pierre's whiteness, but also the vulnerability, the fear and the anxiety that manifests on and through her body is mistaken as an anxiety about childlessness. And that's the interesting bit when there's an affective misreading. So vulnerability involves a particular kind of bodily relation to the world, Ahmed says, in which openness itself is read as a site of potential danger. The clinic is a complex web of micro vulnerability and, and macro systemic vulnerability, through um, which is kind of shown most, um, most clearly through the subversion of the system. But the precarity of Kimia's situation on a micro level is that it's a mix of queer vulnerability of being discovered, the racial um, vulnerability of being vi uh, visibly and um, racially other, and also um, uh, and there's, uh, there's this play between the blatant and the latent that's going on. The fear of being inserted back into a discursive position, position i.e. being kicked out of the clinic, um, reinforces how fear functions as technology of governance. In a particular appeal to the reader, the reader Kimia says, so I won't read all of this, but you can see how violent this is. Um, if they discovered that what she was doing there, um, you can see for yourself, the, the language is very strong. Um, and the fear that she is visceral. It is through her writing that she exposes herself, and ex in exposing her story is important and urgent. It reveals the very violence that queer women of colour face in France. And well, maybe perhaps this will change now, but this is an important story to be telling. Indeed, the success in playing on the system is, is a victory. The reader feels great, you know, kind of shares in that joy. You know, we want, we kind of want them to win against the system. But um, there is a sense in which this, this becomes problematic, as I've come to show. Um, the the, but it's the fundamentally vulnerable um, part of the system which misreads her body in space, um, which links to Ahmed's um, description of how readings of openness can be uh, misapprehended. So we have emotions may involve readings of such openness as spaces where bodies and worlds meet and leak into each other. So this talks to the paranoia of the French state and um, when it comes to filiation, when it comes to parentalité, when it comes to this, we only want men and women, you know, and, and also, we, let's be honest, there's a racial um, uh, dynamic to that discussion as well. So there's a perceived threat of the queer and racial body and um, leaking and merging. And as, as suggested by Ahmed, the merging does occur but it's mixed, and that's crucial. She's misread as a pathologically infertile body, not a queer, politically infertile body. So initially, this approximation between Kimia, this politically infertile queer body, and the women who are infertile, struggling with um, a pathological infertility, seems um, to make a natural, they seem natural allies, right? But Kimia often directly, so she directly identifies with the women in the clinic, but there are also many instances where she distances herself from them. So here are some examples of this kind of push-pull. Uh, je dis peut-être car je n'en sais rien, je suis pas dans le cas. Um, but then the next quote we see, I, I, you know, I don't know them, but I, I feel, I know, and I know that I would do anything to have a baby, and they also would do anything to have a baby. Um, we see the sheer stress and anxiety. She's not sure how she re it can be read. You know, she's very much it's a it, you know we're in her head. It's a first person narrative. So we have this interesting like inability not only of her to read herself, but paranoia that she'll be read incorrectly. So there's this kind of yeah interesting identification and also real sense of difference. And um, the novel is attempting to show on the one hand that the desire to become a parent. Um, is not queer. She's a parent that's queer. Actually, there's quite a lot of shared feeling going on. But this is where it starts to kind of split away. This is where the infertile woman um, and the and the and the and Kimia, who is not infertile, um, kind of butt heads a little bit. And she makes this clear in the way that the narrative progresses. We don't find this out actually until quite a way through the novel. Um, with this stunning line. 
I told, I asked her if that was necessary, given I wasn't infertile. <laughs> Oh, wait, up until that point, yeah, she hasn't been explicit. It's very unclear why she's there. I just thought I'd put some propaganda from the French state on there as well. So, um, this is like, you know, it's a don donor. And that's that she talks about this plastered around the clinics. There's a lot of pressure. And she makes quite a funny remark. She's like, I don't know why anyone who's there would go and then look at these and feel inspired. You know, she's like, who are these for? The people here have already, you know, um, which is quite good. But, so, uh, da da da. Hmm. She doesn't experience the pressure that women feel in the room. You know, contrary, uh, so I think hopefully, uh, there's a, another quote, just contrary to what my doctor thinks, I don't feel any pressure. Oh, thanks, Kimia. Uh, that's great for you. But, <laughs> and, but you see, and then she's now, you see this weird turning in this, or this kind of, again, this push pull. I identify with them. I, you know, I look at them and I see that there's, you know, these lost children in a supermarket. And then she's like, well, I don't know, I'm just kind of impatient. I don't want to get on with it. So this is a real interesting way in which the childless anxiety that is palpable, palpable in the clinic, actually helps for her paranoia, kind of an anxiety that's going on at the same time, to be misread, the, the, that she might be discovered. Everybody just thinks she's sad that she can't have a baby. And then, but it's not for the reasons that they think. So this constant playing of proximity and distance in infertile women reveals the extent to which the involuntary childless body is useful to elicit pity. And this has a key link to desire, normative desire and normalcy. Um, which I'll move to. Uh, yes, I think I've got that on there, but yeah. Um, returning briefly to a fear structure, the object of fear may pass by, and this structure possibility is part of the lived experience of fear. We get a sense way that fear is very much linked to hope as well, how fear is conditioned directly by our desires. Um, and that's how the avoidance of the object of fear is often through moving, uh, moving closer to the object of love. She says also the turning away from the object of love, uh, object of fear, involves this turning towards love. So part of the conditioning of what or who is to be feared is directly linked to what or who is desired, and the goal of desire resulting or coalescing with the object of love. As I will show, this desire for normalcy um, is a conversion of the, actually the bare female body, in this case, to a maternal body. The fear of infertility or non-motherhood seeks to bolster a desire for normalcy. I don't want to be like them. I want to get on with it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Crucially, Ahmed poignantly hits a way in which this fantasy of love is also commensurate with the preservation of life, and there is no figure more contiguous with life-giving than that of the mother. So, uh, this is the moment where they get approved for treatment. J'avais tout simplement la sensation joyeuse et effrénée d'être une fille ordinaire, sensation qui ne m'avait pas traversée depuis longtemps. Um, it's another fun, exciting, upbeat poster about donating um, as well, just to... Um, so, <laughs> normalcy is the companion bit, and this is another way in which um, the construction of desire, the construction of, um, is complicit in narratives which sustain a sense of subjectivity as emerging from an innate or inherent desire. And Lauren Berlant is very useful here because desire visits you as an impact from the outside and yet inducing you an encounter with your affects makes you feel as though it comes from within you. We've all kind of touched upon this nat naturalized desire, maternal desire. And we see that's very, uh, it's particularly resonant in this, any discussions of fertility and reproduction. Um, which is a maternal instinct, the biological plot, female desire to reproduce. You know, these are so inhered in normative female um, normative discourses, which uh, construct the female subjectivity even today. It's also uncannily close to the intimate and literal space of the female body in which this desire seeks to um, be resolved. Indeed, they assumed the latency of maternal desire as commensurate with a normative female desire has enabled surface readings of childlessness as a site of lack and a blatant lack, there is no child next to me, an internal lack, there's a pathological insufficiency. The medical language around childlessness is all about absence, mm -hmm. and that absence is somehow locatable. This location is within the pathologized body whose purpose is always already to be fertile, whose subject and whose body is always already desiring children. So through quiescing with this discourse, um, of the naturalizing discourse of the female bodily desire, um, there is potential for the queer child as subject, Kimia, and the involuntary child as subject to converge, because in both cases there is a normative desire for children. They are not problematizing the desire for children. And that in itself is also a desire for normalcy. In the same way, queer political infertility has been upheld due to a paranoia in, in the, by the French state, as Roy um, um, explores in various essays, 
on lesbian surrogate parent, parenting, as well as Judith Butler in her seminar that says kinship always already heterosexual. Heterosexual articulated desire for children completely coalesces with pronatalist ideology. So, I just want to keep going. Maybe you can five here. Yeah. Okay, perfect. This intimacy of the desire for the child allows for it to feel natural. <coughs> here you go, Berlin. She says no. She says this means that your objects. This, uh, in short, uh, she argues this means that your objects are not objective, but things and scenes you have converted into propping up your world. So what seems objective and autonomous in them is partly what your desire has created, therefore a mirage, a shaky anchor. So I like this idea of the mirage or the shaky anchor, you know, this way in which desire for children is so naturalised. There's nowhere better witness than within the clinic, fertility clinic, and how it reinforces time and time again. Just think about how happy that woman was with a smiley face to donate her eggs. How happy, you're selling hope, you're not selling a baby, you're selling the fantasy of what it is to have a baby. There is no, uh, there, Berlant indicates there is a desire that is bound to an object, but what needs to be determined is what exactly the object is. The straightforward answer may be a baby, but I'm going to actually argue that the object of desire is a transformation of the self, that is, from childless woman into mother. The notion of re-encountering yourself is incredibly potent when translated in the clinic. The clinic is a space of conversion. Those who desire normatively, um, yet whose bodies are desired as non-normative, so they're infert infertile, uh, try to leave normal. They want, to, they want to leave converted, change. So this is the space of conversion of desire into love. And the Lantern describes love as the embracing dream in which desire is precipitated. Rather than being isolated, love provides an image of an expanded self, the normative version of which is the two as one intimacy in the couple. So this expanded self um, is elevated into realm of pregnant woman, leading to motherhood. motherhood. Bilan argues about this expanding self as a cup of form, but I think this is more about a kind of maternal plenitude, a, fantasy, a fantasy of maternal plenitude, both the literal and subjective expansion, upheld most clearly through the stigmatisation of childlessness. So I'm going to go through this really, really quickly. <coughs> but fundamentally, the unproductive body is an abject, sad, and ultimately undesirable body. And much of the anxiety, fear, and shame, and humiliation that fills the clinic is to just not be a childless person anymore. So even the doctor, you know, the doctor says, oh no, you can't really, not very good at accepting childless women, or the women might not have kids. She felt the pressure. There's a surveillance of the, um, uh, even further on, many examples of this that we can see here that um, women are valued and validated in accordance with their reproductive output, output function with the language contents. Is to be an identity machine for others, producing children in the name of the future, in service to a national culture whose explicit ideology of natural personhood she's also helping to generate. We have many examples of the hackneyed um, uh, language used around, you know, women's bodies, so, you know, failing them, women's flesh converted into a battleground. The clinic is described as both a purgatory, but they pray to the god of fertility. So, uh, this is dire consequences for women in many respects. The triptych of desire, fear, and love leads to a deeply schismatic relation of the body of the woman of the woman to herself and her body. If the discursive body is not is the locus not only of desire and love, it's also the locus of fear. The body, whilst the source of des uh, source <coughs> of desire, may not be able to deliver that desire. Thus, her body is also potentially mutinous, like typified by the non-normative, non-fertile, non-productive body. That means that the body can also be a site of annihilation. If you can't have a baby, if I can't have a baby, what am I? What's my point? I don't feel like a woman. These are things we hear all the time anyway in discourses and stories from women who couldn't have children. Thus there's a willful move into the pressures and binds of the pathologized female body in this novel. It pretty much props up many of the myths about motherhood, especially maternal plenitude. Indeed, the novel ends with um, Kimia's mother Saha saying, Elle, quelle que soit ta vie, débrouille-toi pour faire des enfants. Il faut faire des enfants, tu sais, c'est la seule consolation. For anyone without kids, <laughs> you know, when you read that, it's like, oh good, well, well, that's nice to know, you know, what's the point of my life? But, um, the wish is to confirm and told again. Kids, having children makes suffering worth it. It's the consolation for existing. It's what make life, makes life worth living. So to wrap things up very, very quickly, this is not arguing against gay parenting, children or families, but it does warn against quite, you know, lazy or leaving unchallenged this politics of pronatalism. 
I'm not seeking to advance a claim, a claim therefore, that the queerest subject of them all is the childless subject. It's far too simplistic and neglects the very ways in which privilege works and the ways in which violence is exerted in bodies. I support Nelson's assertion, and uh, Maggie Nelson's assertion, why bother fucking this child or queer woman when we could be fucking the specific forces that mobilise and crouch behind this image. Put another way, the demand to be subsumed within the dominant, or the demand for the dominant to expand to include me, we have to understand which part of me is being included and which part of me is still being excluded. Or in order that I am no longer excluded, which me was calling for inclusion? And against whom did I need to distance myself from or stand in opposition to now that I am subsumed within a legitimising discourse? I.e., what does my privilege or my call for equality then marginalise? What is lost to me by entering into the centre, into the home of normative politics? What did I sacrifice? Who have I left behind? Those I once was and once stood with, now that I am here at the centre. Can a demand for equality ever be anything other than a reinforcing of binary politics and identities? Should the demand not be for freedom from such discourses rather than equality? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to all three speakers. I think it's um, very obvious from um, the complexity of the three papers, um, the different angles um, that they're using to approach motherhood, just how far we have gone um, in narratives um, of mothering. You know, we started off. Um, just being really excited to even have a text where the mother was a je, mm. and now um, we've, we've just gone so much further in that and um, I'd like to just reiterate again the, the thanks that have been expressed to, to Jill um, for opening up this you know, um, immensely rich um, area of study to us. Thank you, Jill. Okay, I, I think we should make a start um, with our first keynote. Does any... any um, Early career colleagues who are here today do not take this as a model of timekeeping and <laughs> <laughs> aberrant. Um, so I'm really delighted that Amalina Damre has, uh, has agreed to give the first keynote uh, for this. I'm not going to read you her whole bio because it's, it's very neatly there on uh, the list of abstracts. Um, but I'm very delighted that she's a, a near neighbour to me now since she joined Durham last year. Um, but Amelie has worked very closely with, with Jill um, on a number of projects, uh, which is one reason why she is such a great choice. And the other one is that her current research project, very exciting, fits so brilliantly with the narratives of mothering that we've just been, been hearing about. Um, and I won't take any more time. I will leave you to Thank it, Amelie. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'm going to stand up there, can't I? Because I, I can't see Jill. It's <laughs> 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 very low down. <laughs> Uh, and all I can see are bottles of water. Numerous glasses. Um, thank you, Shirley. And, and I also want to say thank you to, um, to the three speakers in the first panel um, for, for some really excellent papers. And it's going to be much to think about. Um, and I hope in some way my, my paper is going to dialogue and respond to um, some, some, of, some of the thoughts that we've been having about, um, about bodies, about interiority and exteriority. Um, in particular. Um, but before I begin, of course, I, I have to thank Jill. Um, I, my connection, it's lovely to be here and to, to be sharing in the celebration of Jill's work, and it's also lovely to be here specifically um, at the Institute of Modern Languages Research because um, this is where I first met Jill um, in 2002. Um, well, it wasn't called the Institute of Modern Languages Research, was it? The Institute of Romance Studies, yeah. So I, I first met Jill um, when I was studying on the MA in Cultural Memory, um, the then MA in Cultural Memory. And um, Jill has been a, a source of inspiration, a tremendously generous um, and, and, and warm um, source of intellect um, since that time. Um, I did my PhD elsewhere, but we stayed in close contact throughout, and, um, and she was then the external examiner for my PhD. Um, and after finishing the PhD, Jill invited me to um, collaborate with her on three publications that were coming out of um, one of the major conferences on women's writing that she had held in 2010. Um, which was which was just a tremendous opportunity for me as an early career researcher at that time um, to learn from Jill um, in so many ways um, and to and to sort of become more involved with this wonderful community um, of scholars working in, on contemporary women's writing. 
Um, so thank you, thank you, Jill. And um, what I'm what I'm going to be talking about today, um, narratives of birth, is, is obviously directly inspired by by Jill's um, excellent work. So. Um, Without further ado, um, so Jill's pioneering work, about which we are going to be, I think we're going to be using that word quite a lot today, <laughs> pioneering. Um, Jill's pioneering work on narratives of mothering has, of course, inspired a swell of critical interest in literary representations of the maternal. In her landmark narratives of mothering, Jill opens with an epigraph from Susan Suleiman, it is time to let mothers have their say. Mothers, Jill writes, are an omnipresent force in literature, but we do not often hear them speak as mothers. They are overwhelmingly objects of the narratives and discourses and the fears and fantasies of others, of sons, <coughs> daughters, husbands, lovers, of omniscient narrators, and of religions, ideologies, and politics. Jill draws attention to the emergence of literary works at the beginning of the 21st century, in which, by contrast, the mother is herself the figure whose point of view is paramount. In the decades since narratives of mothering, we're hesitating about the date, it is a decade. Um, in the decades since narratives of mothering was published, stories that, still, that, that explore the still embedded institutions of motherhood and that expose the challenging and multifarious experiences of mothering have pro proliferated. They include literary fiction and life writing, as well as increasingly the sharing of popular personal narratives in print and online media, such as newspaper columns and so-called mummy blogs. In line with Jill's emphasis on mothering as an open-ended experience and as a process, rather than the self-enclosed, politicised, reified and restricted institution of motherhood, such narratives have broadened the scope and meaning of idealised normative motherhood to provide new perspectives on the contemporary realities of mothering, including lone parenting, queer parenting, new reproductive technologies, child loss, childlessness, and living child-free, as of course we've just been hearing about. So why continue to talk about motherhood? Um, well, one response, one obvious response, might be that reflecting on motherhood in contemporary culture continues to raise important questions about enduring, the enduring structural impact of sexual inequality but also that it touches upon wider, urgent political issues surrounding care and nurture, and what it means to hold the other, literally as well as otherwise, within the self. Um, in a recent essay on motherhood, Jacqueline Rose identifies mothers, um, quite problematically, I think, as being uniquely in touch with the most difficult aspects of any fully lived life. Um, this is something Jasmine will <laughs> rail against. Um, <laughs> in possession of, of a secret knowledge. She writes, motherhood is, in Western discourse, the place in our culture where we lodge, or rather bury, the reality of our own conflicts and what it means to be fully human. It is the ultimate scapegoat for our personal and political failings, for everything that is wrong with the world, which it becomes the task, unrealizable, of course, of mothers to repair. So Rosa's book is, is all about highlighting the pressures and anxieties um, of contemporary life that are frequently, she argues, poured into the figure of the mother who becomes a, a scapegoat. Um, Sheila Hetty's um, recent novel, Motherhood, philosophical mother, um, novel, I should say, Motherhood, um, instead encourages reflection on the ways that discourses of motherhood shape and structure the lives of all individuals whether they are mothers themselves or not. Hetty wants to trace commonalities and to redefine the distinction between being a mother and not being a mother, or as she puts it, being not a mother. Um, this is quite a difficult passage to read, but I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. Um, she writes, so she's talking here about, um, the, the, the book is really about um, her own, her, her confronting um, the idea of a decision or a choice um, to be or not a mother. Um, and she's, she's talking about um, not wanting that decision or choice, whether it, it can indeed be considered as a choice, um, to be imposed upon her. She writes, I don't want not a mother to be part of who I am, my identity to be the negative of someone else's positive identity. Then maybe instead of being not a mother, I could be not not a mother. I could be not not. If I am not not, then I am what I am. 
The negative cancels out the negative, and I simply am. I am what I positively am, for the not before the not shields me from simply not, from being simply not a mother. And to those who would say, you're not a mother, I would reply, in fact, I am not not a mother. <laughs> By which I mean that I am not not a mother. Pause to get your, <laughs> your heads around this. Um, yet someone who is called a mother could also say, in fact, I am not not a mother. Which means that she is a mother, for the not can cancels out the not. <laughs> to be not not is what mothers can be, and what the women who are not mothers can be. This is the term that we can share. In this way, we can be the same. Um, before that, I'm trying to create that sense of, sense of commonality. And I find, I find her um, work here really interesting, but particularly on this idea of um, cancelling out negatives, and that's something I'm going to be sort of talking, talking about a bit later on. So I'm really drawn to Hetty's expansive way of thinking about motherhood and about the female body, and, um, and to her way of thinking that, that seeks not to privilege nor to elide particular experiences. Um, that, that also underscores the, the extent to which the discourse of motherhood um, impacts in different ways um, on, on, on all of us. Um, Hetty's careful cancelling out of negative identities makes space within that very discourse. Um, and I think it allows for, for a different kind of um, holding of the other within the self. Um, so this is, a, this is a way of thinking that I want to bear in mind today in my own reflections on motherhood. Um, and and what, what I want to emphasize in particular is this sort of um, um, moving beyond notions of a, of a secret shared knowledge um, or a mysterious mythologization of motherhood, um, which are of course notions that are pernicious to us all as, as not not mothers um, <laughs> in every sense of that phrase. Um, but particularly so as I narrow my lens today to the specific topic of birth. Um, so this is part of a new project that I'm developing, and it's, it's, I want to say new, it is all very, very new. I actually haven't worked very much on motherhood before this project. My, my work has been sort of more on, on, on the body. Um, so this, I'm sort of building on, on, on my previous research in that area. Um, but because I haven't worked very much on motherhood to this point, I'm very eager to hear from, from all of you who are probably more experts than, than I am on this topic. Um, so despite the often expansive ways in which discourses of motherhood, mothering and mothers are now being scrutinised, I have I've long been fascinated by the fact that the subject of birth itself um, I think still remains relatively overlooked. Um, and this is something that, that Jill has addressed in a 2006 article um, registering trauma, the body and childbirth in contemporary French women's writing. Um, and in this article, Jill comments on, on the dearth of liter literary narratives of birth, and she observes that there have been historically very few women-authored um, birth stories in literature. Um, so she writes that childbirth narratives tend to be either male authors' accounts of their own birth, or audience-based narratives, such as obstetrics or manuals, or the accounts of a bystander, or an omniscient narrator. Alternatively, birth in literary text simply happens behind closed doors um, off stage. Um, and I think that last one is, is, is particularly common. You often have um, stories about, but that seem to be on the surface about birth, um, and that are very much about pregnancy and then new motherhood or new parenthood, but, but that actually the, 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 the physical process of birth itself tends, tends to be kind of glossed over. Um, so my project, um, and the, the, the paper today, but also my project more broadly, um, proceeds from the premise that this relative paucity of cultural narratives of the experience of the birthing body directly contributes to the forging of, um, the continuing forging of sexual inequality by making it difficult to talk about birth in, in meaningful ways. Um, so Rachel Cusk, um, who I'm sure, I know many of you have worked on and, and, and read. Rachel Cusk has written that childbirth and motherhood are the anvil upon which sexual inequality was forged. <clears throat> um, and 
in, in, in my paper today, I'm, I'm going to suggest that, that birth um, still tends to be enshrined as an experience that is somehow part of this sort of secret and mysterious body of knowledge. Um, that I was referring to before, um, and that we can see in sort of um, Jacqueline Rose's um, evocation of, of, of motherhood, but that there is this kind of secret and mysterious body of knowledge, which I think is particularly relevant um, to the topic of birth. Um, and, and I think this, this is a sort of an enshrinement that corresponds to, to quite complex, politicized, um, and pernicious mythologization of the birthing body that is bound up with and has far-reaching consequences for women's rights more generally. Um, I'm going to look back to, um, to, a, to a text um, by Adrian Rich, um, Of Woman Born, which was published now in, in, in the 70s, but I think it's still, still very relevant. Um, Rich writes, the, the majority of women, literate or illiterate, come to childbirth as a charged, discreet happening. Mysterious, sometimes polluted, often magical, as a torture rack or as a peak experience. Rarely has it been viewed as one way of knowing and coming to terms with our bodies, of discovering our physical and psychic resources. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do today is I'm gonna look at a range of, of theoretical and, and literary perspectives on birth. And um, what I want to ask, um, <clears throat> which I may not answer entirely today, but, but I hope to over the course of the project. And what I want to ask is, is how, how can we think about birth? Um, what kinds of knowledge circulates around birth and how does birth enter into knowledge? Um, what lines are drawn around thinking about birth, experiencing birth and narrating birth and how, how might those lines be redressed? Um, and in what ways might recent literary narratives of birth, because actually there are now um, I would say in the last sort of five years or so, um, increasingly more literary narratives of, uh, of, of the actual physical experience of birth. Um, so in what ways might recent literary narratives of birth contribute to forming a feminist understanding of birth, and what kind of knowledge would that be? <clears throat> and so, um, the forms of knowledge that, that circulate most widely in contemporary culture, are arguably birth preparation manuals. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, I've just picked a selection of birth preparation manuals here. Um, these have been long criticised by feminists for being dominated by male perspectives. And I've got the male perspectives over on the left here, the, the most, um, the, the big names are Michel Audon, the Lamars, obviously, and then more recently, um, William Sears and Martha Sears. It's, you know, they're, they're a partnership. Um, it's co authors but, but anyone who's read this text will know that William Sears' uh, perspective really dominates um, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the textbook, in the manual. Um, and then on the other part of the slide, I've, I've got more recent um, female authored um, birth narratives. I'm going to talk about um, the kind of dichotomies that are raised um, by, by, these, um, by these texts. So, Generally speaking, birth manuals have been criticised by feminists um, by being for being dominated by, by male perspectives, in which the, the birthing body um, has been culturally determined by notions of suffering as a natural female destiny, or punishment, um, or otherwise viewed as, as passive and regulated by um, a male medical gaze. And, and to, to their credit, none of these male authors actually do that, so that's, this is more kind of, you know, thinking historically. Um, so since the Enlightenment, of course, the birthing body has been subject to, to immense scrutiny and surveillance um, until the 1970s. Um, Adrian Rich talks about this. Birth in most countries, in most Western countries, um, has been highly institutionalized. Um, I've got some images here from, um, from art. This is actually from, I just lived at this from, um, a blog about birth on, on um, the Welcome um, Institute. This is a Damien Hurst painting. Um, this I, I've been trying to chase up. If any, has anyone come across this before? I've found the image, I find it compelling, but, but I have no idea where it's from. Um, and this is um, Giselaine um, Howard. Um, so since since um, since the Enlightenment, really, um, the birth the, the, the kind of the conventional image of the birthing woman has been a woman in a supine position, legs and stirrups, medical interventions such as forceps, a routine part of the procedure. Um, so in in her detailed historical analysis of the submission of the female body 
to um, patriarchal medicalization, Adrian Rich writes that the real issue underlying the economic profit of the medical profession is the mother's relation to childbirth, an experience in which women have historically felt out of control at the mercy of biology, fate, or chance. To change the experience of childbirth means to change, women, change women's relationship to fear and powerlessness to our bodies, to our children. It has far-reaching psychic and political implications. Um, so since the 1970s, there's been considerable attention um, paid to the ways that um, the medicalization of birth, although it in itself was initiated as a response to the real threats posed to women, um, to mothers and to infant survival as, as living conditions worsened under industrialization. Um, the, since, since the 70s, this like, notion of the medicalization of birth um, has been critiqued as having constructed birthing mothers as objects of medical knowledge rather than subjects with their own um, agency um, and, and importantly knowledge. Um, so we've seen this kind of rebuttal of medicalization um, in the last um, three, four decades. Um, and discourses of birth have begun to emerge which encourage women instead to take control um, of their own bodies, um, to view birth as, as a normal process um, in, in the fabric of human existence rather than a, a medical event, but also as a process that, that could be empowering. Um, I can't remember if I have, did I put it? No, I forgot to put this one on. Um, Oh no, how do I forget that? I found this lovely one this morning actually that I was trying to include that was, um, that was called Orgasmic Birth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just thought was brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, so, so the, um, what was I? Um, <laughs> so there's been this rebuttal of medicalization um, and, and, and an emphasis on the ways in which women can take control of their bodies during birth and, and even experience birth as an ecstatic. Um, empowering experience. Um, so Anne Oakley, for example, um, calls for a feminist project of control over um, one's own body, um, and she writes that the medicalization of birth has changed the subjective experience of reproduction altogether, making dependence on others instead of dependence on the self, a condition of the achievement of motherhood. And the you know, vocabulary here of achievement, which is obviously um, problematic in different ways. Um, so, we see figures like um, Sheila Kitzinger, um, who was a British um, anthropologist um, who advocated a, a psychosexual method, um, which has given rise to these sort of ideas of orgasmic birth, um, that emphasizes the need for women to trust in their own instincts um, and suggests that, that birth can indeed be a sensuous and um, exhilarating experience. Um, so Kitzinger's work, um, along with that of the American midwife who's at the top there, Ina May Gaskin, um, who, who runs a, a kind of, uh, it's, kind of it's kind of a commune, I, I think, um, but she's written various books um, which feature sort of multiple <coughs> perspectives on sort of positive, empowering, exhilarating birth. Um, so Kitzinger, um, May Gaskin, um, and also the French doctor. I love this image. What is he doing? <laughs> In a birthing pool, fully dressed. <laughs> <laughs> all, all three of these things have been hugely influential in, in creating the birth manuals um, of today. <laughs> Um, and, and most contemporary birth manuals tend to emphasize um, the birthing woman's agency over her own body and over her birthing choices. Um, so there's very much the language of taking back control, um, eliminating fear, confronting cultural mythology. So it's kind of the idea that you know, we, when we hear about birth, we hear that it's something just well, I'll talk about what we don't hear in a moment, but um, if we do hear anything, if we see it on television, it's always, it's always horrific and, and, and awful, and so you know, we have to confront these mythologies and eliminate the fear. And this is all with the aim, in most both birth preparation manuals these days, with the, with, it's all with the aim of giving birth with, with the least medical intervention possible. Um, 
And such manuals tend to suggest that, that empowerment can be found in resisting pain relief um, and in opening oneself up quite literally to the experience um, of birth through breathing techniques and, and self-hypnotherapy, so hypnobirthing is, is very popular. Um, now, what's very striking to me about much of the language in such manuals, which um, I don't want to sort of um, do away from, from the work, the manual work that, that they do do, actually, because there is a lot of evidence to suggest that that hypnobirthing, breathing, relaxation, all of these techniques can lead to um, less complicated births. Um, but what I find unsettling, um, more than unsettling, in the language um, in such manuals is that taking back control over the body seems to require at the very same time what is often referred to as shutting down the neocortex. Um, so we are all animals, women are told, and, and all one needs to do to experience a natural, normal birth is to connect with one's primal self. Um, images here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> think less, feel more. Um, <laughs> let their instincts take control rather than their logical skills, and then of course you've got this lovely, friendly-looking tiger. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, well, <laughs> while the effectiveness of, of such advice, <laughs> while the effectiveness of such advice can be seen, and the huge popularity of hypnobirthing and natal hypnotherapy. Um, as long with, as, as I've said, statistical evidence that such techniques can lead to a quicker, safer, less compromised birth experience. Um, as a feminist, I'm, I'm sure you don't need me to point this out, one, one cannot help but balk at the suggestion that empowerment can be achieved by, by shutting off one's mind. Um, so there is clearly, um, and as Alison Phipps has noted, um, an unapologetically, biologically essentialist narrative um, here that, that really exists, I think, in tension with a kind of a feminist narrative, or a supposedly feminist narrative of empowerment. Um, so there's this feminist agenda of taking back control and um, you know, resisting that kind of you know, centuries of, 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 of the male medical gaze. Um, but then taking back control seems necessarily to, to only be possible in relation to kind of the promotion of the, the natural, the normal, and, and just hunkering back down into, into the body. Um, which, you know, it, 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 it seems to me that there must be some way through this, there must be some middle ground. Um, so Alison Phipps has argued that, that, that they have developed in, in recent years Regimes of truth, um, she's absolutely right. Um, there are developed regimes of truth around, um, around birth and around breastfeeding as well um, that emphasize lack of intervention in the case of birth um, and in the case of both that promote the natural, the normal um, in ways that, that seem to provide the illusion of empowerment um, but that mask an enduring politics of subordination. Um, and, and Alison Phipps is also interested in, as you'll see from the title, she's also interested in the kind of the, the ways in which such discourses mask a neoliberal commodification of birth and, and of mothering. So she writes that agendas which began in feminist efforts to empower women have now been transformed into messages, messages that should be, um, which can put pressure on mothers on a number of different ways while excluding other caregivers, of course. Um, so, you know, these, these birth manuals and, and natal hypnotherapy, hypnobirthing, it's often aimed at a class of, of white, privileged, middle-class women with abundant social, cultural, and economic capital. Um, so there's this kind of new reproductive activism which, which romanticizes natural, um, the natural and promises personal empowerment and the attainment of a kind of an ideal of motherhood um, but it also coexists, of course, with a lack of structural support for mothers and for parents. Um, and it serves to vilify those with less access to resources, um, as well as those who come to be parents in different ways or who are carers in different ways. So it's, this, this whole project um, has come from my sense 
that there is this absolute polarization of discourses, the medical and then the rebuttal of medicalization, um, that really misses the opportunity to, to provide genuinely empowering forms of, of knowledge um, about birth. Um, and, and that fail to account, to fail to provide ways of thinking and knowing, um, so fail to, to, to provide um, a model of knowledge that might account for the centrality of a woman's body to giving birth without reducing her to it, um, or less indeed address the many different ways in which birth can occur. Um, <clears throat> so, where else do stories about birth circulate? Thankfully, not just in um, those manuals. Um, Often, of course, birth stories will be shared anecdotally between women. Um, there tends to be a combination of hushed tones and horrified hyperbole um, in these moments, which I think, which I think also corroborates the idea that, that birth is something secret, unspeakable, unknowable, and unshareable. Um, so see the following passage from Rachel Cusk's A Life's Work. Um, she writes, my mother had, has always been fairly honest about her own experiences of birth. When the time comes, she says, take any drugs they offer you. I've had troubling hints from other women too, women who bark with jaded laughter at the mention of the word pain, or who remark mysteriously that afterwards you're never the same again. Such clues are never explained. Indeed, everything suddenly seems to go rather quiet, as if some vow of silence has has been unintentionally broken. So such anecdotes seem to begin with a sense of, a, of an impending disclosure um, of the experience of birth, but then they, they sort of quickly fade into silence. Um, in um, Nobody Told Me, which is a collection of poems and stories on becoming a parent by <laughs> Holly McNeish, um, she, she writes a list enumerating um, <laughs> her first thoughts after birth. Um, it's a wonderful book. <laughs> Absolutely um, recommend reading it. So she begins with, so she's got this list, I think she's got about 11 points, and you know, first thoughts after birth. And she begins with this sort of retrospective humour, which is unthinkable during the birth itself. Um, she writes, salt and pepper's push it was not as funny on the birthing CD as I hoped. <laughs> Um, and in the list that follows of 11 further thoughts, this, this overriding sense of nobody told me um, is, is really palpable. So the following passage is point number five on her list. And she writes, there's again this, this notion of something secret, secret club, secret um, something that, that now has, uh, that she's entered into. So I think I've joined a secret club. Why didn't no one tell me this stuff before? I phone out my grand, the politest lady I've ever known. I expect her to cry with joy at the news of a new great-grandchild. She lets out a huge sigh of relief. Oh, Holly, I'm so glad you're okay. Fucking horrendous, isn't it? My auntie, teacher at a local primary school, says simply, <laughs> shitty a watermelon. My mum, a nurse for over 30 years, and the only one I expected to ask me about the birth, just bursts out crying and cannot speak for heavy sobs, apologising, as she always does when she cries, I cry too. Um, so the vow of silence that we see in Cusk and, and the secret club that we see in McNeish, these are ways of approaching birth that, that tend to hover, I think, in the cultural imaginary. So they hint at something eventful and momentous, um, even sort of fetishized in its mysteriousness, while we're never really getting to the experience itself. Um, and of course, you know, there are good reasons for this, or, or perhaps there are reasons for this, um, conventionally, um, many of those reason, reasons have been bound up with maintaining propriety. Um, there's also the, the, the quite commonly acknowledged notion that if women knew what it was like to give birth, then they wouldn't do it, um, which, which seems a sort of considerable underestimation or perhaps the deliberate circulation of myths um, that undermines women's strengths and capacities. Um, Many of the modern birthing um, manuals that I was talking about before, before advise expectant mothers to steer clear of difficult birth stories, um, precisely because they create fear and anxiety. Um, so instead, to focus on, on the empowering, the positive. Um, so that adds just another, uh, an extra layer to this hesitation about sharing anecdotally one's birth experience. 
Um, but birth is, of course, too traumatic. Um, and in this sense, it is an unspeakable event that resists articulation much like any other trauma. Um, it's the opening of the maternal body, the passage into life, the cleaving of one body into two separate beings. Even an uncomplicated birth, if such a thing exists, can be a traumatic one. And um, I'll first again from Holly McNeish, um, who writes, I had a good birth. I know that, and I'm so bloody grateful. The midwife was the greatest, most peaceful supporter I could have wished for. Dee was brilliant, and Dee is her partner. Um, Dee was brilliant, and everything is okay. But when the doctor came in after labour and ticked the hospital form box, which was labelled normal, uncomplicated, I felt like punching him in the face. <laughs> uncomplicated? You fucking think so, do you? You fucking try it then. They should change that wording on hospital forms at least it adds. <laughs> <laughs> So in Jill's article on narratives of childbirth, she's looking at works by Christine Angot, Virginie Descamps, and Camille Laurence. Um, and, and she writes, these stories illustrate some of the challenging, unsettling, harrowing ways in which the body is being figured in contemporary women's writing in France, notably by describing the body, the birthing body, into problematical contexts, respectively incest, infanticide, and infant mortality. So Jill's analysis foregrounds narratives that are themselves bound up with, with multiple forms of violence and trauma. Um, and, and I think in doing so, she, she positions the body and childbirth itself as a kind of battleground at the, at the very edges of experience, which is not an uncommon uh, metaphor. Um, but but I find something quite interesting here, which is, that, um, which is that people write about war and death and the body and, and, as a battleground all the time when it's about war, but, but not, not about birth. So in an article on the literature of pregnancy and new motherhood, Lily gerton Wachter too observes the paucity of narratives of birth compared to war literature. She's, she's an academic and she's, um, her specialism has been um, war literature itself, war poetry. Um, <coughs> so despite both stories foregrounding the, the traumatic account of the body in battle, we don't have a familiar canon of nuanced literary or philosophical texts about the experience of having a child even though having a child too is a profound, frightening, exhilarating, transformative experience at the boundary of life, an experience from which one comes back a different person. Um, it is indeed striking that while death, our commonly defining finitude, has come to be a structuring principle of continental philosophy um, and holds prominence in metaphysical existential reflections on life, birth has yet to receive quite the same levels of philosophical reflection. Um, and this is all the more striking, I think, when, when one considers the proximity to death actually encountered in birth. Um, so as Maggie Nelson writes, we've already heard that Maggie Nelson, I'm going to be talking more about her um, at the end. Um, as she writes in, in this book, which is astounding, um, an astounding reflection on, on love and loss and birth and death. Um, if all goes well, the baby will make it out alive and so will you. Nonetheless, you will have touched death along the way. You will have realized that death will do you too, without fail and without mercy. It will do you even if you don't believe it will do you, and it will do you in its own way. There's never been a human that it didn't. Um, she goes on to say, I wonder if I'll recognize death when it comes around um, again. Um, so Nelson argues that while philosophy should look to pregnancy, childbirth, and parenting as an opportunity to think about the distinction between self and other, body and mind, the meaning of life itself, most philosophers have approached the topic in tangential asides in which they try to control women's bodies rather than understand them. Um, so Luce Irregaret's recent book on birth to be born might, might perhaps be an exception, um, and her philosophical arguments contained therein revolve around the central premise that coming into the world amounts to exposing oneself to dying or living. Um, Eric Gray's work offers a philosophy of natality. It's focused on being born and coming into the world um, rather than the ends of life. And, and, and it's an astonish, astonishingly, astonishingly, this seems to be a new way of conceptualizing from a philosophical perspective the meaning of life. But she's not the only one to have talked about natality. Hannah Arendt, Adriana Cabrero, um, Leo Dark too, um, have accounted for natal experiences in the theorization of the human subject. But such philosophical scrutiny tends to approach birth from the perspective of being born rather than giving birth or rather than a combination of the two. Um, 
We might also think of Julia Kristeva's theorization of the sem semiotic or Bracha Ettinger's conceptualization of relational subjectivity, but via what she terms the matrixial border space. <laughs> And these models pay due psychoanalytical attention to the signification of the maternal, the pregnant body, but the actual physical experience of birth itself is, is oh, well, he's still alive in. Um, one promising philosophical framework of birth emerges, annoyingly, <laughs> in, um, in, in this work written by a man, um, in, in Peter Sloterdijk's Bubbles, um, which is volume one of his epic treatise, um, Spheres. Um, Sloterdijk debunks what he refers to as the confused narcissism um, concepts of psychoanalysis, and above all, an expression of its fundamentally skewed conceptual disposition and of the way in which it, it was misled by the object and imago concepts. He writes, the true issues of the, feet of the primary fetal and perinatal world, blood, amniotic fluid, voice, sonic bubble and breath, our media of the pre-visual universe in which mirror concepts and the libidinous connotations are entirely out of place. place he conceptualizes instead what he refers to as the basic rule of a negative gynecology. Through the basic rule of a negative gynecology, one must reject the temptation to extricate oneself from the affair with outside views of the mother-child relationship, where the concern is insight into intimate connections, outside observation is already the fundamental mistake. So the rejection of an external objective view with an outside observation of the mother-child relationship merged here with attention to, um, to the bubbles, the physicality of blood, amniotic fluid, voice, um, and breath, I think provides an interesting frame within which to think about birth, perhaps from a feminist perspective. But what, what exactly this means and how it might be articulated isn't very clear in, in Slotherdijk's writing. And he actually goes on, um, to sketch a model of observation that does still seem to be articulated in relation to the empirical, um, albeit he terms it a, a delicate empiricism. Um, and, and he continues to, I won't read this, this, this um, quotation um, in its entirety, but, but you can see here that he's continuing to use tired metaphors of exploration, excavation, the female body, the female reproductive body as a cave. Um, so here too, a negative gynecology sort of seems to promise a way of thinking about birth um, in non-empirical terms, and yet, yes, it is a delicate empiricism. It's reduced still to being in the cave and being thrown out of the cave. In other words, about coming into the world and about being born rather than birth as a more expansive experience that involves the perspective of child and mother. So negative gynecology seems to hold promise in the suggestion of not extricating oneself from the affair with outside views, but I think the question remains an epistemological one. How to think birth, how to think about birth, and from whose perspective? Um, as Maggie Nelson, who actually um, mentions Sloterdijk um, in the Argonauts, as she comments, I feel no urge to extricate myself from this bubble, but here's the catch. I cannot hold my baby at the same, at the same time as I write. <laughs> <coughs> How am I doing the time? Oh, I've completely lost track. I'll just continue. Um, so, so how then can we think or rethink birth? So my, my wider project considers whether recent literary narratives of birth might contribute to forming new, new feminist epistemologies of birth. So I'm looking at works by Camille Laurence, Marie Dariasek, Catherine Cusset, but also beyond French studies, um, I'm looking at Maggie Nelson, um, Elisa Albert, and Pamela Ahrens, and I would be very grateful for suggestions of, 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 for more reading in this area if anyone's come across any interesting stories of birth. Um, I, I'm not going to have time today to offer any extended close readings of, of these works, um, and what I wanted to do instead was just to focus my initial musings um, as to how, how to theoretically um, in a project that seeks to explore birth, um, how to shape and position that in relation to existing <coughs> bodies of knowledge which fail to provide a framework for birth, as I said before, which, which emphasizes the birthing body as, as feeling, experiencing, as well as thinking and knowing all, all at once. Um, so what I want to do now is just to try and sketch out two ideas um, that might provide ways 
um, into thinking, or rather from rethinking birth, by foregrounding birth as, as a way of thinking or as a way of knowing. Um, I'm going to go back to Rich briefly. Um, in, in A Woman Born, she suggests that there are ways of thinking we don't yet know about. Thinking is an active, fluid, expanding process, intellection, knowing, our re re recapitulations of past processes. In arguing that we have by mo no means yet explored or understood our biological grounding, the miracle and the paradox of the female body and its spiritual and political meanings, I am really asking whether women cannot begin at last to think through the body, to connect what has been so cruelly disorganized, etc., etc. I mean, again, remind that she's writing in the 1970s, and, and I, think, I think we should bear in mind that feminism, French feminism, has of course closely engaged with notions of thinking or writing the body, um, and I think there are all sorts of interesting new developments and sort of interactions between philosophy and, and neuroscience that, that could also be enabling here. But all of that said, I think there is something worth probing here with particular relation to birth itself and to birth as a way of thinking or knowing, which I don't think is as yet um, unexplored. So to try and imagine what that might be, I'm going to take two ideas um, from recent narratives that conceptualise and thematise birth. The first idea comes from um, Camille Laurent's short prose text, Abandonné, um, which is in, in this volume on birth, and the second comes from Maggie Nelson's The Other Lords. Um, so, Abandonné, um, oh, hold on. Yeah. Abandonné appears in a collection of short texts called Naissance, Birth, by a number of leading French female writers, including Dalia Seck, Julia Brizac, I think you say, and so on. Um, it was published in 2005. Um, it's striking to note when you read this book the prominence given to the idea that for, for myriad reasons birth is something unthinkable, unknowable, unnarratable. So all of pretty much all of the stories in this talk about talk about that un unthinkability. Um, I might just zip through some of these examples because I'm aware of them. Pushing, pushing me for time, possibly. Um, so, Dalia Sex Encore La, uh, which opens the volume, is, so it's all about the, sort of the narrator's sense of guilt for having had a caesarean, not being present, we were talking about this earlier, not being present to the birth. Um, this comes through in sort of this repetition and an effort of not knowing, um, not knowing is, is, is there throughout. And, and she, she talks of her, her scar, um, her C-section scar, giving bodily proof of the birth, but her inability to imagine and to know that her belly is no longer carrying a child um, then expresses itself in, in an anorexia um, that would evidence and stage the evacuation of her body. So that's that's a second, not knowing. Um, Helena Vilovic, um, her narrator claims, according to the conventional mythology that oh, I've forgotten everything, you know, um, I've forgotten it all, all of it, I don't remember, I'm no good at birth stories. Genevieve um, <coughs> Blizak's account gives a sense of the unthinkability of birth, um, what could be more beautiful or, and more unthinkable. Marie Desplechin's narrator talks about sort of family anecdotes of birth um, that indicate this, this sort of idea of unnarratability in, in the manner of, um, that calls to mind what they were saying about Rachel Cuss. Um, so you've got this context of an overwhelming sense of what cannot be thought, known or said. And I think Camille Laurence's um, um, reflective prose text in this provides an illuminating perspective. Um, so for Laurence, um, whose son Philippe, as, as many of you will know, um, died two hours after he was born, birth is bound up with an unspeakable trauma and, and with absence. So the absence of Philippe in the case of, of his birth, and then she talks in, in this text about um, the absence of herself in the case of the daughter, the birth of her daughter. <coughs> her daughter was born under C-section, so again, you've got this little sense of not being present um, to the birth. So she writes, um, I've had two children, a boy and a girl, but I have no experience of birth whatsoever. Um, Laurence draws attention to the fact that birth stories may be recounted and circulated in fragments among family members and friends, but they are rarely put into one's own words. Um, so she says that birth, again, she's creating a connection with death. Birth, which is, along with death, the most intimate experience there is, that could be shared with it, not being able to be recounted. In the story, it's always the experience of the other. Um, Further to the idea that narratives of birth always belong to somebody else is the reality that birth is inseparable from the experience of the other simply because birth involves 
two people. Um, so what I'm interested in in Laurence's um, short text here is um, what she does with this idea of um, naissance, naissance of birth and connaissance. Um, so she's playing on the French composition of words for birth and for knowledge, naissance, connaissance. Um, and she gestures very briefly, um, it's, 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 again, it's a very short text, but, but I, I find it, I think that's there's more thinking to be done around this. She gestures towards the idea that to give birth is to be always already caught up in relational webs of knowledge of self and other. Um, so in the biblical sense, to know, dans la, I'll read the French because you can't always can't really get the sense of the wordplay. Dans la vie, le connaître, c'est faire la paix, c'est faire l'amour, mais la naissance est une connaissance, une connaissance. Il y a la mère qui met au monde, il y a l'enfant qui vient au monde. Ça va ensemble, ça se tient, sinon c'est naître. Um, so viewed from this perspective, birth then is imagined as something that would not be submitted to knowledge in the sense of an objective or empirical knowledge from the outside, but as an experience that is both imbricated and implicated in a kind of relational epistemology. Um, importantly, I think, Laurence's notion of connaissance places knowing itself at the centre of the experience of birth in the perinatal world. Um, but, but there's also a sense of that, that knowing being staged, staged as a question. So that's, that's kind of the first idea that I wanted to elaborate. Um, the second idea comes from Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts, which is, which is just this beautiful, powerful reflection on, on, on as I said, on birth, death, um, love and loss, at the heart of which lies a kind of epistemological conundrum. Um, so she opens the text, and, and running through the text is, is this idea of, can words ever be enough? Can words ever, ever be sufficient? Can everything be thought or not? And her writing is steeped in philosophical musings, so she, she refers to Wittgenstein, Bach, Deleuze, Butler, Irigaray, Preciado, um, and it's interlaced with, with really lyrical passages that evoke um, moments of birth, death, queer parenting, um, and sex that are drawn from her life. Um, so at the beginning of the text, she described, the narrator describes the beginnings of her love affair with her, um, with her partner, who is transitioning, um, is transitioning but also identifies as non-binary. Um, her partner is Harry, um, an artist. Um, and with the beginnings of this love affair, bodily pleasures really mingle with, with intellectual play. Um, and Maggie alludes to having spent a lifetime devoted to Wittgenstein's idea that the inexpressible is contained inexpressibly in the expressed. And she says, she says that this paradox is quite literally why I write or how I feel able to keep writing. And Harry, her partner, um, on the other hand, rejects the ideas that the idea that words can ever be good enough and argues that once something is named, we can never see it in the same way again. So th this is a kind of a conundrum that runs through Nelson's writing and um, the following passage is, is kind of a way of responding to that conundrum, and it's, it's also the passage that gives the text its title. Um, she writes, a day or two after my love pronouncement, now feral with vulnerability, I sent you the passage from Hollenbach by, French, I mean, but Hollenbach by Hollenbach, in which Bach describes how the subject who utters the phrase, I love you, is like the Argonaut renewing his ship during its voyage without changing its name. Just as the Argo's parts may be replaced over time, but the boat is still called the Argo, whenever the love utters the phrase, I love you, the lover, sorry, its meaning must be renewed by each use, as the very task of love and language is to give to one and the same phrase inflections which will, for, which will be forever new. Um, and I think that how to be engaged in this task of renewal in love and in language, but in those things at the same time, is, is really what's at stake in, in Nelson's writing. Um, and much of the text is, is her kind of railing against the ingrained dialectic between thinking and embodying that is raised by her own experience of pregnancy and, and maternity. So Nelson is an intellectual, she's an academic, um, as well as a writer. And she, she's got plenty of anecdotes about the seeming incompatibility of, of motherhood and intellectual life. So in one episode, she recalls um, talking to 
um, a Renaissance scholar, male, um, patronising, um, for example, who, who she's, she's pregnant and, um, and the scholar is trying to kind of reassure her by way of anecdote that her interest in intellectual pursuits will probably come back after the first two years of her baby's life. Um, and then in another episode, she's at a, a Q&A where she's giving a talk about her, a book that she's written on cruelty and um, someone in the audience, again, a man, asks her a question about how it was possible for her to handle the darkness of the, the material while being pregnant. Um, she writes, leave it to the old patrician white guy to call the lady speaker back to her body so that no one misses the spectacle of that wild oxymoron. The pregnant woman who thinks, which is really just a pumped up version of that more general oxymoron, the woman who thinks. Um, so throughout the text, there is this kind of um, the scrutiny to thinking, um, knowing, um, and it's the way in which it's pregnancy, maternity, birth, um, has conventionally sort of created this, this dialectic which, which doesn't allow thinking and knowing to come, come into contact with feeling and experiencing. Um, if the task of love and language is to give to one and the same phrase meanings that will be ad new, Nelson's writing brings that task to bear on the meaning of birth as feeling at the same time as thinking and knowing. She describes birth as falling forever, falling to pieces, um, and she evokes here a sort of an, an embodied and cognitive shattering. To let the baby out, you have to be willing to go to pieces. But <coughs> but going to pieces in Nelson's writing is, is never a kind of a relinquishing to the outside. It's never a loss of self to the mastery of the medical other, nor is it a submission to nature in the complete absence of thought. So I think Nelson's writing is really interesting in finding this kind of middle ground that, that, I'm, that I was um, hoping for. Nelson in inscribes the physicality of birth, blood, bile, it's, it's all there, layered with reflection on the proximity of birth and death. So in the episodes in which she recounts birth, um, she's talking about her experience of the physical experience of birth, but she's also simultaneously um, reflecting on her partner Harry's grief about his mother's recent death. Um, and I think in the text, writing birth becomes a sort of an act of, uh, an act of love, but also an act of rethinking and renewal in articulating new meanings for birth. It's a tribute to the love between Harry, who has never, who says that he is never quite at ease in his own body, and to Maggie, who is far from being at ease in the experience of birth itself. So where Laurence renews the meaning of birth in her elaboration of birth as connaissance, um, Nelson draws striking attention to another word um, often used in birth scenarios, which is reckoning. Reckoning at the bottom, and reckoning is something that, that, that comes up in, um, in, in birth manuals. Um, I'll, I'll read the quotation first, then I'll say something about that. So, at the bottom, which one cannot quite know is the bottom, one reckons. I've heard a lot of women describe as reckoning, it might also be called nine centimeters, at which one starts bargaining hard as if striking a deal to save your conjoined lives. I don't know how we're going to get out of this, baby, but word is you've got to come out and that I've got to let you, and we've got to do this together. And we've got to do it now. Um, so reckoning is often described in birth manuals as being um, this kind of point of no return, um, as it were, as sort of, you know, the mother's stark realization that there is nothing that can be done to stop this birth from occurring. Um, and it tends it tends to be presented as as a moment of necessary submission to to the event, to the bodily event. Um, so to reckon is, is to bargain, um, and, and we can see Maggie bargaining here with, with Iggy, her child. She names him before he's born, um, she, talks, she talks to him as Iggy. Um, to reckon is to bargain, um, and as she bargains with Iggy, birth is imagined as something in which they are both actively, actively and physically engaged. But to reckon is also to think, um, and in Nelson's writing of birth, which calls attention to the structuring dialectics that have disallowed women from experiencing and feeling at the same time as, alongside, through and within, thinking and knowing, I'm wondering if reckoning offers a way to think about birth that again places thinking at the centre. Significantly, 
It seems to be a way of thinking that significantly it seems to offer forms of thinking both from within and without the mother-child relationship. So forms of embodied, experiencing, feeling, thinking. Um, like the Argonaut, then, Nelson makes space in this narrative of birth for that moment of reckoning, renewing its meaning without, in fact, changing its name, Give it it, giving it in acts of love and language inflections that are ever new. So I have been trying today to think about how an epistemological framework um, to think about, I suppose, an epistemological framework that might account for the centrality of a woman's body and the experience of birth without reducing her to it. In Laurence's writing of birth as connaissance and Nelson's thinking, feeling, reckoning, my sense is that we can glimpse ways of thinking birth that slip within and without the perinatal world of blood, amniotic fluid, voice, breath, that Sloterdijk imagines but that his model of delicate empiricist excavation undermines. In connaissance and in reckoning, new narratives of mothering, which account for the experience of birth, suggest not a negative gynecology then, but a relational epistemology of birth, as embodied cognition, as thinking, feeling, experiencing. Articulating with due patience and rigour the complexities of birth, they provide new insights into embodied experience from a feminist perspective, allowing us to perceive a new, and I'll end with rich, that um, we are neither inner nor outer constructed, our skin is alive with signals, our lives and deaths are inseparable from the release or blockage of our thinking bodies. Thank you. Brazilian literature and culture at Oxford, um, and she focuses on women's writing, minority writing, on the Lucifer world, um, and she's told me that I don't need to give a big uh, introduction, so I think I will let you launch <laughs> straight in, uh, in, for the sake of timekeeping as well, uh, to your paper, which is Networks and New Interpretations of Motherhood, in, and I won't watch the title. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so this panel is... Um, is what was to be made up of three of us from the steering committee of the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing, uh, who aren't specialists in French. Um, uh, many of us can't make it, unfortunately, but we had we had sort of planned a triptych that would be like a baton. Sorry, too many <laughs> metaphors. A baton passing from one to the next. But um, I'll just jump in in the middle, which is my my place. Um, and because uh, I'm from a different um, language area, uh, I will insist on introducing you to some Portuguese, but translations as well. Um, and also, I, I am not working on motherhood at the moment, so this is this is really a paper that's an, um, that's looking at uh, a book that came out this year that is about mothers and some of my thoughts about it, which we can discuss afterwards. Um, so it's quite a subjective paper, um, but it's, but this is, one thing I've learned from the CCWW is not to be afraid of being anecdotal and bringing subjective experience into our academic work, and alongside our academic work. Um, so Shirley kicked off this morning by saying that the, uh, no, it was Catherine saying that the CCWW was the jewel in the crown of the IMLR. Well, I'd like to say that Jill is the Queen Mother. tribute to Jill, a celebration of the fantastic AHRC motherhood network she masterminded and ran with such warmth and panache, and which many people here contributed to. And it may at some point seem like uh, advertising for a number of books, 
for which I apologise. Although, Christmas is coming. <laughs> um, so, like everybody else, I'm going to start by thanking Jill for inviting me to be a member of the, of the steering committee, um, representing Portuguese. When I joined in 2009, I was starting a new job at Oxford, and though it felt like I was being put on a lot of committees at that time, this one involved a trip to London and uh, the chance to participate in the activities of a vibrant research centre with colleagues from across modern languages. So I jumped at the chance. Over the last 10 years, I've learned so much from the women on that committee. We've shared disasters and triumphs, good practice, sensible advice, warnings, and we've become firm friends. Jill at the helm steered the committee with grace and good humour, full of ideas, and excellent at spinning gold from a tight budget. That's something I really admire. And Shirley and Godela have taken over uh, along the, the same lines. Thank you so much. Um, so this is, this is sort of down memory lane. I think the M and the L in IMLR can stand for memory, memory lane today. Uh, one of the pro biggest projects that Jill initiated was um, the AHRC Motherhood and Post-1968 European Litera Literature Network. I've never been part of such a large international, interdisciplinary network of brilliant and inspirational women. So you'll have seen it's, and that was the idea, to initiate cross-cultural, transnational and interdisciplinary dialogue on motherhood, bringing together researchers from the UK and Europe, studying motherhood in a variety of disciplines. And how does it work through a series of workshops, online resources, activities, uh, readings, and a major conference and exhibition. Um, and I particularly warmed to um, this description of how literature and um, real life uh, fuse. Um, and I often refer to this when I'm trying to argue for um, the humanities and literature as being just as important as other subjects. Uh, so this network ran from March 2012 to November 2013 <clears throat> and it involved a number of uh, workshops, um, podcasts and recordings of these workshops and some of the conference events are still available and accessible online so if you really want to revisit then um, you, can, you can do that and there are some wonderful resources there. Uh, so the project involved the workshops, fun, online resources, author readings, and the conference in October 2013. I became pregnant about halfway through, as did one of the other colleagues on the network. So it felt like magic. <laughs> and uh, suddenly, but also, what we had been discussing and reading suddenly began to get very real. And my daughter's now six, this was 2013, so um, a lot of it has become even more real and uh, relevant. So it was almost like a training program. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about it many times. I found the workshops particularly fascinating because they brought together life experiences expressed through literature from different European countries, read and discussed by colleagues from different disciplines and languages. I'll never forget the incredibly moving Italian short story, Tempo Parziale, by Carmen Covito, translated by Adalgisa, especially for the workshop on mothering and work, which took place in the basement. Do you remember anyone? We were in the basement. I can't remember why. <laughs> yes. So there was no natural light. It was quite a strange uh, day. Um, and the story was so moving, it stunned everyone in the room into silence. I'll never forget um, law lecturer Ruth Payne's presentation about the media's portrayal of mothers who <coughs> kill. Nor the letters uh, of Greek writer Margarita Limperaki to her mother, brought to us, shared with us by a colleague from Thrace University. The conference took place over three days with keynote speeches by philosopher, Kine, uh, philosopher Christine Battersby, author of the seminal 
Gender and Genius, sociologist Gail Leatherby, and the Portuguese poet and academic Ana Luisa Amaral, who I have the great honour of introducing. And Ana Luisa is a good friend of the CCW. Well, that's, these are the publications which have resulted. So this is the first book plug. <laughs> um, the amazing volume, Motherhood in Literature and Culture, which resulted from, um, from that uh, conference. So the, the, um, the journals resulted from different workshops um, or were uh, dossiers within those journals. And then the book um, came out of the, the conference. And Anna Louisa is the last uh, chapter in that book, but she was also here at the very first event of the CCWW called Writing Childhood. And you can see the, that her reading um, is available as a podcast. <laughs> Not advertising for the CCWW because it's so wonderful. Um, so. Yes, her keynote speech, Poetry and Potatoes, is included in the volume of essays, which was published in 2017 and launched at the Freud Museum here in London. Anna Louise's poetry is rich in allusions, allusions both to her cultural foremothers, including Sappho and Emily Dickinson, and a number of her poems that particularly interest me are spoken by a mother to her daughter. The mother recognises that raising a daughter is fraught with challenges, especially the huge responsibility of introducing her to the wonders and dangers of the world around her. <clears throat> but what shines through the poetry is the love she feels for the person to who she gave, gave birth and who constantly presents her with wonderful surprises. Not so much um, maternal ambivalence in uh, here, not too much. Uh, the setting is usually domestic or commonplace, a trip to the park, an accident in the kitchen, a mother and daughter sharing a pillow. And the content falls into a number of themes, some of which overlap. So gentle comments, perhaps gentle complaints about the difficulties in reconciling motherhood and the process of composing poetry. Uh, the daughter as source of inspiration and amazement at her own creativity and precocious wisdom. And the mother's fears for the future and how to protect her daughter by preparing her the best way she knows how, teaching her both recipes and more profound lessons about life. Um, and at the conference, people enjoyed Anna Louise's poetry um, and her talk so much they were asking if it was available in translation. Since then, there have been two, um, two volumes have come out in translation by Margaret Jill Costa. And I brought an early Christmas present for Jill, which is What's in a Name, the, the um, second volume of poetry in translation. That's the second book. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, to Adrian Rich and a woman born, and thinking about mothers and thinking about influence and thinking about modelling. In a woman born, Adrian Rich proposes that the most important thing one woman can do for another is to illuminate and expand her sense of actual possibilities. The quality of the mother's life is her primary bequest to her daughter, because a woman who can believe in herself, who is a fighter, and who continues to struggle to create livable space around her, is demonstrating to her daughter that these possibilities exist. Anna Louisa's mother poet follows this pattern, but I think that Jill does too, or certainly did for me as a young academic, showing me possibilities, showing how uh, to struggle to, to create livable space. For the Motherhood Network, I found it quite difficult to source appropriate Portuguese texts that discussed motherhood through the lenses chosen for the workshops. This April, 2019, just before Mother's Day in Portugal, an anthology of short stories came out that would have provided me with plenty of material. <laughs> and it's upon this collection that I will focus the rest of this short paper. The title, this, this is the invitation. I couldn't, <coughs> I couldn't go, but um, 
This is the invitation, and this is the succulent which will appear in the rest of my slides. So it's um, Mainz Kitudu, uh, which literally means mothers who everything. Now, there's no verb, so we can assume it means that women do everything. Mothers do everything. Mothers do. Mothers do everything. Preface explains the rationale behind the book. Nine stories, commissioned and edited by Clara Capitan, Director General of Penguin Random House in Portugal. And these are the writers. Um, they are from top left uh, to right Ana Margarida de Carvalho. Claudia Pimenta, Jaimia Pereira de Almeida, Felipe Martins, Isabel Lucas, Isabel Figueiredo, Luisa Costa Gomes, Marlene Ferraz, and Raquel Ribeiro. Uh, the authors, as you can see, vary in age. <coughs> what we don't see uh, is how they vary in length of career, uh, number of books published, um, and most of them have another, do another job. It's difficult to live solely from literature in, in Portuguese letters. One of these is an academic in the UK. Others are journalists. I'm not going to ask you to guess which one, <laughs> just to, sh to show you the, the variety of their uh, other professions, other um, hats. Uh, one's a civil servant, a second, one other's a secondary school teacher, another an architect. The, uh, the anthology is a showcase of female talent, undoubtedly. But why the topic of motherhood? The first line of Capitan's preface is intriguing, not least because it creates a shared community of nós, us, daughters for whom the maternal body is mysterious, protective and inescapable. <coughs> I think it's quite interesting that she uses that adjective. Existirá na nossa vida figura mais inescapável do que a mãe. It moves on to the corpora, the preface does. The fact that the mother's body stretches to accommodate the body within, as we were talking about, as Anna Lina was talking about. She is described as an involucro, a casing, a casulo, which is a cocoon or a pod. But she's also a figura polyedrica. Enigmatico, uh, enigmatico labirinto em que fascina perdernos. So she's not just a vessel or container, she's a, a maze, an, uh, an enigmatic, three dimensional labyrinth. Then the editor makes a confession. She is being a malabarista, a juggler, who has to balance her own desires and tastes with those of her potential readers. And this book is actually first and foremost something she wanted to publish. Um, the stories in their variety plumb the depths of what it is to ser mãe, ter mãe, perder a mãe, ser mãe da mãe. Mothers cannot be escaped, they are inevitable. And Capitão says she could not avoid commissioning these stories. So let's look at the titles of the stories just quickly. Of course, the first one doesn't quite work because mm -hmm. it's about a palindromic word. Um, but if we look at them in general, we can notice something just from the titles. Two of them mention <coughs> land and one mentions geographical features. These are echoed in the photographs that separate the stories from one another and portray natural scenes, a lot of trees. I'll just find one more. So there's a road through a forest, one of those sort of views from above, from a drone or a crane shot. <coughs> Cacti, tree trunks. Uh, pebbles, the natural world. Three of the stories mention women's roles. The ayah or nurse, in other words, a surrogate mother. Um, mother, the role of mother in, two, in this story, two mothers, which are, who are a mother and daughter, 
and woman in the last story, Uma Mulher. They gesture, the, story, the titles gesture towards uncertainty and discomfort, someone who may never stop crying, an unnatural <laughs> mechanical clockwork heart, and a woman disinherited or disavowing her inheritance. And indeed they do lean towards the dark side, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> Death, grief, <laughs> resentment, sacrifice, suicide. In several of the stories, the mother's behaviour or absence has marked the protagonist indelibly. Fathers are hardly mentioned or of no use. These are not all stories about women's relationships with men. Women's choices or lack of choices are foregrounded instead. So the woman in Duesh Meinsch is consumed by the duty of looking after children and home, which prevents her from writing the books which are shouting, screaming and struggling inside her brain, so behaving like children, but she, she doesn't have the time to focus on them. The woman in uh, Dose Millimetrus weighs up whether or not to have an abortion, the 12 millimetres millili millimeters is the size of the of the embryo that <coughs> she's in in the story. Uh, and in some of those pregnancy guides, I, I suppose that would be the size of a baked bean, would it? When they say, this month you, your, your embryo is the size of a pumpkin. pumpkin. It's a poppy seed of pumpkin. As a mm. Yeah, I've always found that a little bit strange that they're edible. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a watermelon. It's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it does build up. Yeah. So just a, just quite small, um, and it's the relationship with her mother which becomes key to the decision whether or not to have an abortion. The daughters in Desertus and Ciel Chorai worry about their mothers, trying to spare them pain. Grandmothers step in when mothers cannot. The dark-skinned um, Afro-Portuguese mother in Terra Santa proudly tells her daughter, who she scathingly calls, you international businesswoman, sua executiva internacional, that she has resorted to Google Images to find a photo of fair-skinned, fair mixed-race twins that she can claim to be her grandchildren. So this is a story about generation and race and whitening. And she, the grandmother rejects, well, she isn't really a grandmother, the mother rejects her own and her daughter's skin colour and phen phenotypical markers in her belief in racial, racial whiteness. In other stories, women care about each other and care for each other. A group of women support a woman in labour in the very first story. Women sacrifice themselves, do anything and everything for their children. Fazem tudo, mas fazem tudo. And the authors also ask difficult questions highlighting the pressures upon women, the expectations of responsibility. So there are questions in different stories like, what are you doing to your daughters? It's your fault. Um, or what are, another uh, woman asks herself, what am I doing to my mother? So it's blaming oneself. But they do celebrate those mothers who buck the, tra buck the trend and have careers and have strong wills and a certain majesty which inspire one daughter to, and I'm quoting, to emulate, to go into combat, to embrace autonomy and solitude. So to do something different. And this desire to emulate returns in the story Isiel Shurai, where the daughter contemplates a photo of her mother aged 17, when she was a daughter and sister, but not yet wife of or mother of. And the daughter looks for traces of herself, resemblances, features, and echoes, because that 17-year-old girl is where the narrator began her personal chronology. Even though she, the mother, is now heading towards a time they will not share, uh, death. Oh, sorry, yes, I've nearly finished. I said it was short, but... <laughs> I've been speaking very slowly. Um, in, the last, in the last story, the narrator reveals her decision never to have children and what it means in grammatical terms, reminding me of um, the network's discussions about terminology and also Amelina's not-nots. 
So, here we are. Não ser mãe foi uma difícil decisão que tomei cedo, muito antes do confronto, se, se as mulheres terás filhos. Alteram-se então os verbos. Ter filhos, ser mãe. Ter mãe, ser filha. Os filhos fazem-nos passar do haver ao ser. E não os ter significa também ser. Sem filhos, como dias sem sol, como noites sem dormir, como pessoas que sem cerimónia vivem vidas sem sentido. There are names she notes for children who lose their parents, we call them orphans, but not for parents who lose their children. The passing on of knowledge, recipes, coping strategies, sewing and mending techniques from one generation of women to another will be interrupted by this decision. But this narrator suggests that this passed down wisdom is in fact only useful for hiding things and keeping women invisible and silent, serving the men who pass down more important things like names and property. She will avoid the traumas that her four mothers had to bear and expected to see her have to endure. Instead of reliving their experiences, she's very happy to inherit from her mother books and a kink in her hair that means that her fringe is never straight. And at the same time, she knows she'll leave nothing behind, apart, of course, from her writing, which is here for posterity. So I wanted to talk about this, uh, this anthology today. That's the last book although I'm sure, not sure that anybody um, will want it, um, <laughs> apart from me. Um, because it emphasises the strength of networks of women, both in the content of the stories and in the act of collaboration it represents. There are, interestingly, there are no biographical details provided about the authors, perhaps encouraging the reader to come to the stories without preconceptions or comparing length of career or numbers of prizes won. So this collection of short stories which interrogate conventional interpretations of motherhood echoes for me the discussions we had in the Motherhood Network workshops and the texts we read particularly under the headings of Mothering and Work, Changing Models of Motherhood and Motherhood and Migration and Exile. One difference, thinking back to the preface of the book, is that we don't choose our biological mothers, but we can choose literary and intellectual mothers, authors we admire, and mentors in our professional and personal lives. So I'll just end with another thank you to Jill to say I'm just very grateful for her sharing her expertise, initiating projects, driving them forward. She's paved the way and made it possible for many other generations of scholars to follow in her footsteps, to carry out research on contemporary women writers, <coughs> maybe about motherhood, uh, if that's what they want to do, and to flourish <coughs> in supportive networks. Thank you. introduce Adelida Giorgio, who's the senior lecturer, uh, a senior lecturer in Italian studies at the University of Bath, um, as we all know, also a member of the steering committee here at the CCWW, and has written extensively on women's writing and um, mother-daughter relationships. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, I'll just get myself some water, I'm sorry, I hope I won't get into a cough, because I'm coming out of a, of a cold. Um, I'm also trying to time myself, so I'm going to walk over time. Okay, um, thank you very much, and thank you, um, Codela and um, Shirley, for organizing this wonderful day. Um, and of course, thank you to Jill. I will not repeat what Claire has already said, because I share exactly uh, all the things she said about Jill, but also because I will come to the centre later in my talk. Um, so I will start uh, by jumping directly into Elena Ferrante. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that most of you have heard of this writer, and um, you probably all know that the Neapolitan novels tell the story of a female friendship between Elena, the narrator, and Leela, arguably the brilliant friend of the title, um, um, born two weeks apart in 1944 into a poor neighborhood in the Neapolitan suburbs. At the age of 66, Leela, 
disappears and Elena, a writer by profession, decides to write about their intertwined lives. In the prologue to the first book, Elena declares her desire to outdo her friend. When she says, we'll see who wins this time, revealing immediately the agonistic nature of that bond, a bond filled with ambivalent and alternating feelings of love, admiration, protection, competition, envy, resentment, conflict, and even hatred. It is in the intricate amalgam of envy and recognition that lies, according to the critics, the novelty and originality of Ferrante's story. Ferrante herself has suggested that women writers should depict the imperfection of female friendships <coughs> alongside their unrecognized value as strong foundational bonds in real life. Accordingly, Elena and Lila's reciprocal support and desire for recognition in the novel go hand in hand with a ransacking of each other's energies, abilities, affections and inner life. Critics seem to assume that the rivalry between the protagonists is a natural and inevitable component of relationships between women. And indeed, Ferrante shows competition to be already at work as soon as the girls are introduced. That the quadrilogy uh, proposes duality as a condition of individuality is undeniable. This is suggested by uh, Ferrante herself extra textually in her reflections in Frantumaglia on Adriana Cavarero's philosophy of narration, according to which we gain an understanding of our particularity and uniqueness as individuals through the words and gaze of the other, and especially the mother. And also paratextually, through the epigraph that opens the quartet, a quote from Goethe's Faust, in which God states, quote, man's active nature, flagging, seeks too soon to the level. Unqualified repose he learns to crave. Whence, willingly, the comrade I, uh, him I gave, who works, excites, and must create as devil. The literal trans trans translation of the last two lines in the Italian original, which you see on the, on the board, uh, would be, I willingly give him a companion or friend whose task is to prod him and play the devil's part. The English translation leaves out something that I don't want to go into uh, now, but I will talk about a bit later, contains, however, contains the word create which is helpful for my discussion today. The devil's part has been taken in a literal sense, mostly by the, uh, the critics, given that Lila is characterized right from the start as cattiva, nasty, ter terribile, and capable of diabolical thinking and behavior. This would justify the presence of envy and competitiveness as inevitable, inevitable motors for improvement. While this is a correct reading of the plot and the relationship between the two friends, it seems to me that it neglects the positive element of exchange, reciprocity, and productive collaboration that ensue uh, from a life companion who plays the devil's part in a metaphorical way, which I believe is contained, uh, contained <coughs> in this in the Goethe's line. Today I want to focus on the bond between Ferrante's protagonists as a source of collaborative creativity, which, by the way, directs both the story and Elena's meta-narrative reflection on life writing. This will be the starting point for a reflection on the practice of female collaboration and co-creativity that has characterized the first 10 years of our center under the guidance of Jill. With some asides of my personal experience, of both the centre, obviously, and of growing up in Italy, in an environment very similar to that in which Ellen and Lila grew up. In doing this, I propose that Ferrante asks questions on uh, women's relationships with language and culture, uh, very similar to those posed by early feminist theorists. We have here um, a picture of the, the girls. The friendship between these two highly gifted little girls begins with a literary pact, inspired by little women, 
namely to write a book together which will be a great success and will make them rich. <laughs> we know that their dream of emancipation through a joint literary project is shattered, and why? Leela's parents do not give in to the teacher's appeals to send her to middle school, while Eleanor's parents do. This assigns them to very different life paths and sets the tone for their future relationship. Leela marries at 16 and becomes more and more enmeshed in the brutal life of the neighborhood in Naples. Eleanor embarks on a brilliant university career away from Naples and becomes a successful writer. Eleanor's life, as we learn from her account, has been a 60-year-long e battle against her feelings of inadequacy. Her struggle to emancipate herself from her neighborhood, class, family, gender, and become an autonomous, desiring, speaking and writing subject is also a fight for autonomy from the power and thrall of Lilia's genes. Like, uh, Lilia's life, in turn, is presented as a struggle to put right to the original luck, education, what she could not have, which becomes an impassioned, at, at times desperate search for outlets for her genius and creativity, for a way out of that world without leaving it, and a way to change it. A search marked in Elena's perception by Lila, natural, Lila's natural <coughs> meanness and even cruelty. Elena's academic success is the result of hard work, a strict discipline and dogged willpower, thanks to which she enters a language, an intellectual system and institutions that are masculine and elitist, and which she discovers exclude her. Her efforts to become part of them earn only apparent admiration from Leela, who indeed plays the devil's part. More often, Leela expresses disapproval, criticism, and even contempt for Elena's masquerade. Elena learns ready-made formulas from which she can draw in different circumstances to disguise the gaps in her knowledge ensuing from her humble origins. Leela's criticisms push Elena to fill these empty formulas with life and experience. Lila's instinctive and bold creativity translates itself into a need for authenticity and truth that are missing in Elena's life and work, which she subjects to surve continuous surveillance. The story of their bond is a story of the ups and downs of an intellectual exchange, similar to a, pro a process of osmosis which continually attempts to equalize the two sides. Part of this process is Elena's use of Leela's intuitions, ideas, words, and even life events as inspiration and material for her school essays, university theses, articles, and novels. However, if Elena is empowered by Leela, Leela is empowered by Elena who does not let Lila's intuitions and ideas go to waste. These aspects of Ferrante's quadrilogy take us back to the quandary of such early feminists as Irigaray, Sixu, Cavarero, Luisa Muraro, Adrian Rich, Audre Lord, Elaine Shaw Walter, Dale Spender, and many others. How can women make space for themselves in linguistic, intellectual, and literary systems and institutions that are intrinsically masculine, when the only tools they can hope to learn and use are precisely those that exclude them. They suggested, uh, the, these critics, uh, these theorists, suggested appropriating the masculine tools. That was the only way, using the language that we can speak, using them to revise those systems from within. Sixou famously played on the French word voler, meaning both stealing and flying to argue that stealing from male discourse is a necessary strategy for women to run off, to fly off with language. In 1984, Audre Lorde warned white feminists that, and I quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but will never enable us to bring about a genuine change, end of quote. This was not an invitation to inaction, of course. Lord continued by saying that, quote, this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. So what, did she, what she asked, what she advocated, she advocated difference, 
feminists must embrace sexual, racial, and class differences because differences provide, quote, a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. And in Lord's uh, opinion, this is the only means to really overthrow patriarchy. Lord's essay is full of such words as mutuality, shared support, interdependence, acknowledgement of women's different and equal strengths as the foundation and sources of forces for change. From the perspective of a black lesbian, she focused on heterosexual and racist patriarchy, but her argument is applicable to almost everything in every context. The story of Elena and Lila's friendship illustrates the difficulties of the project of dismantling the master's house. Elena becomes aware that she remains a subaltern, and three times so, a woman, a proletarian from the South, even after her degree and her success as a writer, validating Lord's belief that to use the tools of racist, elitist patriarchy to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy means that we can only achieve limited change. But their relationship also demonstrates the possibilities inherent in a community of women. Two friends who put together their different strengths and utilize them together to produce change. And culture. Elena finds in the words of the Italian feminist Carla Lonzi an example of a woman who can think against, who can overturn man's language. And she can, through Lonzi, understand the subversive potential of a friend Lila's way of thinking and writing. In this passage, Elena shows her awareness of the power of female alliance and woman-to-woman -woman dialectic, as described by Lord, and their potential to expose and undermine gender, class, and other power imbalances. But Lila has not been able to realize fully her potential, because ironically, she had been denied the possibility of entering the master's house. I sometimes imagined what my life and Leela's would have been if we had both taken the test for admission to middle school and then high school, if together we had studied to get our degree, elbow to elbow, allied, a perfect couple, the sum of intellectual energies, of the pleasures of understanding and imagination. We would have written together, we would have been authors together, we would have drawn power from each other, we would have fought shoulder to shoulder because what was ours was inimitably ours. The solitude of women's minds is regrettable, I said to myself. It's a waste to be separated from each other without procedures, without tradition. Their friendship, complete with periods of disconnection and conflict, as well as exhilarating moments of creative connection, becomes the basis of their resistance, a political collaboration leading to acts of co-creation, a collaboration that, if it does not succeed in dismantling their world, goes a long way to threaten it. It would, of course, be unrealistic to expect change to be accomplished during the course of one generation and in a place most impervious to change like Naples. Lila and Elena are still subjected to adverse forces which silence them, not least because of their vulnerability as mothers. It is the disappearance of Lila's daughter, possibly at the hands of the Camorra, and as a consequence of their writing that worsens Lila's marginatura, the loss of margins of the self, that causes her desire to erase herself eventually bringing that friendship and collaboration to a halt. But what is the relevance of all this for today's event? Are envy and rivalry necessary for us to create and produce writing that dismantles the, path, the master's house? In Ferrante, rivalry is productive from a narrative point of view because it's you know, what the, the plot uh, stands on. But it is not shown to be essential or intrinsic to female relationships, rather a consequence of that specific socio-economic context that is strongly marked by class and gender discrimination. In the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing, we have practice and collaboration based on equality and respect for each other. Each of us recognises the strengths of the others 
we use our knowledge without imposing it, we always offer it without self-importance or condescension. And this helps the others to recognize their strengths and deploy them. This way we work, we work um, so the, the way we work in our center is exactly the kind of work that Ferrantes Elena, Elena advocates for herself and Lila. In the next quote, Elena describes the interpenetration of two minds who complement each other. Lila's intuitions spark off Elena's creativity. Elena gives form to Lila's unformed thinking, bringing cohesion and borders where there is magma and disorder. As usual, a half sentence of Leela's was enough and my brain recognized her aura, became active, liberated my intelligence. By now I knew that I could well, especially when she, even just with a few disjointed words, assured the more insecure part of me that I was right. I gave to her digressive complaints a concise, elegant organization. Now that I was surrounded by admiration, by this time she's a successful writer, uh, I could admit without uneasiness that talking to her incited ideas pushed me to make connections between distant things. In those years of being neighbors, I on the floor above, she below, it often happened. A slight push was enough and the seemingly empty mind discovered that it was full and lively. The mechanism of work here describes the spirit that animated the workshops or the motherhood network and also the preparation to the workshops, the work we did as a steering committee and even you know, when we put to, when we help chill with a bit, just a bit of help to put through the application for the network. And also for the publication that followed, which took another two or three years probably, which was another bonus because we could continue to work with Jill even after she retired while we put through all these publications. In the past 10 years, I have drawn ideas and clarity from the activities and the events of the centre, from Jill's words and those of the steering committee. The, scene, the, the Fernandez words in this uh, quote also describe the synergy between the three of us sitting here, one only in absentia, unfortunately, <laughs> in organising this panel, all three facilitating one another, sparking off one another's ideas. In the past year, I have drawn strength and uh, lots of support, and I hope I've given some also from to and to Claire and Maria Cosette. And I go back to their emails and to their words when my strength starts to wane, <laughs> concretizing the act of making space for the maternal of our title. My academic building was very similar to Eleanor's. And I had first-hand experience of the solitude she mentions, despite the presence in my life of a number of women who did play the devil's part in stimulating my passions and intellect. I was lucky to share my studies at university with two women with whom I experienced that mechanism of bouncing ideas described by Elena. I also had the, 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 the luck of a supportive sister who, for being less determined than I was, and having fewer desires than me, although this is debatable because I probably took from her, <laughs> um, and she facilitated my emancipation, my emancipation. I had a high school teacher and a best friend for whom I felt an emotional and intellectual passion and who later, when I read feminist, uh, Italian feminist philosophers of difference are recognized as what they call the passion for the mother. I also had a mother who had a hard life. She worked 12 hours a day when I was in uh, school, but who supported my aspirations simply by not contrasting them and that was not in a negative way. And who, unlike other mothers at the time, was not complicit with the father. My solitude remained, however, because I had to make my way in institutions that, like Eleanor's, even though a good 10 years later, were still deeply elitist. Class conspired with gender and geography, severely limiting the opportunities and curbing the aspirations of young women from the south of Italy. Like Eleanor, I had to struggle to find a voice in Italy, 
and also in the UK, but the UK gave me a lot, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> I found a very congenial environment, even when I arrived. And Tina started to read women writers and feminist theory. Like Eleanor, I had been trained at school and university to speak and think like a man. But unlike Eleanor, I had never become fluent. <laughs> A few days ago, I came across a letter that Naomi, Naomi, is she here, Naomi Siegel? I saw her earlier this morning. She was. She was. Anyway, that Naomi Siegel sent to the London Review of Books in 1985. By chance, I found this letter online. In that letter, she gives a definition of women's discourse while she takes to task men who wanted to describe what reading as a woman was. So she explained it to them. So anyway, this definition of women's discourse, um, of which I, uh, in my experience, the center has been an embodiment, was an exchange of reciprocating affirmations and a non-disputational dialectics that cultivates comfort instead of conflict. The center has been for me a place of intellectual exchange, collaboration, and pleasure. And Jill's role in making the center everything I have just described is crucial. But more on this later. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everyone. So here we are at panel number three, reading slash writing for change. And we've got three researchers who are going to talk on this theme. First of all, we've got Sandra Dorosky from the University of Bath. Um, Sandra is a teaching fellow in French studies at Bath. She carried out her doctoral research at the University of Exeter with a project analysing the reception of fictional works by contemporary French women writers, especially Julia Christeva, Marie Dariussec and Monique Wittigue. She guest co-edited with two other colleagues, the summer 2018 special issue of L'Esprit Créateur, centered on women's creative, women's creative endeavors in literature, film, and the visual arts. Her article on depictions of food in Damien Sec's work is forthcoming in the summer of 2020 in a special, special issue of the Journal of Romance Studies, edited by Shirley Jordan and Judith Stilp. And her talk today is entitled Reading and Women's Identities in the Contemporary French Popular Novel. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you so much, Shirley, for inviting me. And thank you, Jill. And thank you, everybody, for reading. <laughs> I, I, I quote people in the room, and this always happens to me when I'm in this room. So there's a slight, slight change to the title. There's an and that I've added in between reading and women. And it is slight, the corpus is slightly narrower than I intended in the abstract, so I do apologise, but hopefully I'll be all right. So, a study commissioned by the Syndicat National de l'Edition and the Centre National du Livre in 2019 found that 88% of French people se déclare lecteur, so they consider, consider themselves readers, with the majority of grands lecteurs de livres papier, so called avid readers of books in paper format, so the readers who would, read, who would read 20 or more books. So 63% of those avid readers are women. Reading is therefore an activity that concerns more than four in five people in France. One of the most well-known and best-selling contemporary authors in France is Tatiana de Ronet, who shot to fame after the publication of Elsa et Sarah, or Sarah Ski, in 2007, which was adapted for the screen in 2010 with Christine Scott Thomas in the main, the main lead. <coughs> She's one of Europe's most read authors. In, 20, in 2009, she was the eighth best-selling fiction writer in Europe. She also recently ventured into the field of biography, and her work on Nathalie de Maurier, Mandalay Forever, um, published in 2015, was nominated for the Goncourt de la Biographie of that year. If we have a quick look at sales numbers, they will confirm the honest place at the top of French readers' preferences. These are the, this is the top 30 for 2010, and you see Elsa Sarah with more than 250,000 copies sold, and this is the um, Livre de Poche. The book came out in 2007. So this is the pocket edition of that, of that uh, novel. And it only came out in September 2010. And it still managed to get all those sales numbers. And the same year, she's got another one on Boomerang. And that's also 200, up, upwards of 230,000. And that came out slightly earlier. There's also a film of that. 
And if we look at the 2011 sales numbers, she's still in the top 30 with a Sapley Sarah, slightly more than 160,000 copies of the same Livre de Poche format. So it's a slightly smaller format, it probably has something to do as well with the fact that the film came out more or less at the same, at the same time. Despite her success, or possibly due to it, her work is rarely examined by scholars of French, with the very notable exception of Diana Holmes' work on middle brown fiction written by women, in which she studies de Rouenet's 2007 novel, Elsa Sarah. Before I actually go into the analysis, I'd like to briefly outline how I actually ended up being interested in reading processes, and hence my connection to Jill. So, as Natalie said, my doctoral thesis focused on the reading of fiction written by contemporary French women authors, and I looked at Julia Christeva, Marie Dariosec, and Monique Petit. And I tried to establish the reader as an active and engaged actor in meaning creation. The reader as it enters into dialogue with the text, the author, the narrators, and the characters, and it carving out an imaginative readerly space in fiction. The aim of the thesis was to examine how this space comes into being, and what tools are needed for its exploration. There were three main starting points to the thesis, Elizabeth Falaise's study of Simone de Beauvoir's reception and her observation that women's, study, women's writing and reception studies had not been meaningfully intersected, a return to the text, and Jill's Rice's premise that reading can change one's life. The thesis also borrowed from Jill's methodology by looking at textual readers and writers and trying to establish echoes with extra textual readers. Since then, I have kept reading processes at the forefront of both my research and my teaching. And the current paper is part of a working progress project idea, as I like to call it. So I thought, what better environment than this one to come and talk about it? Um, which looks at the reading processes depicted in and encouraged by popular novels, starting from the premise that investigating what, how, and why people read can shed light on contemporary concerns and behaviours. For the moment, I use the term popular novel quite loosely to refer to novels that have had a wide popular appeal and have therefore recorded significant sales numbers. However, I do envisage that this definition will change and that more refined and nuanced observations will be added to the category of the popular novel or the best-selling novel. So in this paper, I will look at two of Tatiana de Rone's novels, Elle s'appelait Sarah, published in 2007, and Mocha, published in 2009, um, analyzing the changes brought about by reading and writing in the case of the two female protagonists, Julia Jarman and Justine Wright. The paper borrows yet again from Jill's framework by showing how reading is essential for the protagonists to make sense of the world around them. This, this essential role of reading is then mirrored in our own processes of reconstructing the text. Elsa Pessara tells the story of an American journalist living and working in Paris, Julia Jarman, who is commissioned to write an article for the 60th anniversary of the 1942 Arafle <coughs> du Verdive, so the Vélodrome du Verdive roundups. Her personal life becomes intertwined with her investigations as she discovers that a flat owned by her husband's family hides a secret directly linked to the events of 1942. For approximately half of the novel, the story is divided between chapters that are set in 1942 and chapters that are set in 2002. Once the 2002 investigation sheds light on the 1942 events, the narrative carries on solely in 2002 without returning to the war timeline. So from about halfway through, we only get, we stay in 2002, we don't go back to 1942. When the article is commissioned, so the article that Julia has to write, she knows very little about the 1942 events. And as such, she proceeds to carry out intensive research, most of it in the form of reading. She will subsequently visit sites like Dorsey, for example, and she will interview witnesses and survivors, but reading is omnipresent throughout her investigative work and is shown to have a significant impact, both emotionally and physically. And I've got a couple of quotations with the French and the English that I'll go through really quickly. These are my own translations, so they might be a bit on the sloppy side. I read all afternoon. I didn't do anything else but read, record information, and look for the books on the occupation and the roundups. I noticed that a lot of the books were out of print. I called a few bookshops. They told me it wouldn't be easy to find the books I was looking for. When I turned off my computer, I was exhausted. My eyes were sore. My head and my heart weighed on me. Uh, everything I had learned weighed heavily on me. Or slightly later in the text, everything I had found out about the July 1942 events made me vulnerable, having awoken in me something I had always silenced 
and which was now haunting and weighing on me. I had been carrying this weight around since the moment I started my, started my research on the Villa de So, leaving leaves its marks on the body, through the pronounced tiredness, I was exhausted, my eyes were sore, but more importantly, reading carries a significant emotional weight, and we see this in the repetition of the, of the word to weigh on me, and I was vulnerable, and it was haunting. Julia has to work through this emotional overload for the rest of the no novel, mapping what she has read onto what she's able to find out through investigative work, giving it all a coherent shape. In both her newspaper article that she had, that she would write and was quite sort of success at the time, but also in the more personal quest of piecing together Sarah's story in order to be able to retell it to those who knew her. Julia experiences this emotional overload fairly soon in the novel. If you look at the page numbers, this is page 60, and the pages just before are 48 and 49. So, and this can foretell the reader's emotional engagement with Doronet's text later on as well. The work of piecing together is essential for making sense of the novel, because the reader has to piece together the events of 1942 with those of 2002, and they echo Julia's investigative journalistic work. However, us as readers will probably figure out the links between 1942 and 2002 before Julia does, just because we have the information presented to us earlier, so we'll probably figure it out before. And it is this availability, or rather the unavailability of information, that actually drives the entire narrative. However, just making information available is not sufficient. It has to be read by multiple characters in order to understand its full implications. It is this work of passing on texts or of passing on information and sharing readings that allows for the whole story to be put together. And it is this very passing on and sharing of readings that can actually reflect extra diegetic processes of what we end up doing with the text and how we engage with it. Even in, this, in the previously mentioned quotation, the unavailability of information is salient. A lot of books were out of print. It wouldn't be easy to find the books I was looking for. This resonates with the silence that surrounds the events of 1942 in French society, and more particularly in sort of the end of 1990s, early 2000s, the situation might have changed a bit since then, just with research and more books being published. Um, but at the same time, this very unavailability stimulates Julia's research. One way of overcoming, overcoming the lack of books or of information is by sharing the few resources available, creating a network of exchange an informal reading group that contributes to assembling both the story of 1942 and the story that we're actually reading. One such exchange is with Guillaume, who was introduced to Julia by her very good friends Hervé and Christophe. Guillaume's grandmother was a survival of the Veldiv roundups, however, when Julia and Guillaume first meet, they're unaware of their interest in the same historical event. It is when Julia mentions her work and research that Guillaume talks about his family's past. This conversation triggers a friendship that is built around the interest in the topic and the sharing of reading materials and resources. I was on my way to the office when my phone rang. It was Guillaume. He found some of the out-of-print books I needed. They were at his grandmother's house and he could lend them to me. It is the lending of books, the passing on of reading materials, that allows this net network to take shape. The fact that the books were chez sa grand-mère, so at his grandmother's house, suggests that they were not necessarily being read. And even if they were being read, they were the readers there, so sa grand-mère or himself, would have been people that were aware of the events, rather than people like Julia or her readers who would have needed to learn more about them. A similar passing on of reading materials occurs later on in the text, when Julia goes to talk to Franck Lévy, who's the founder of, of an organization helping Jewish families find out more about deportees. There's not much to read about the events. You're right, not much at all, but we know how everything happened. It would be my pleasure to lend you some works if you wanted them. This passing on of reading materials adds to Julia's investigation. Moreover, the books need to be passed on. Frank Levy already knows what happened. He's, he says so, we know everything that happened. So his books need to be given a new life by new readers. These two instances of passing on of reading materials raise the question of what the reader should do with El Sable Sarah itself. Is this a book that would then enter a network of exchange after being read? The subsequent popularity of the text seems to suggest so. Moreover, De Ronner herself 
contributes to building this network, because at the end of the novel, there is a list of books that have helped the author in researching El Sardisara. Scholars, I quote here Diana Holmes, have highlighted the strength of the novel in dealing with the historical events. The novel's depiction of the Vichy police's active and brutal role in the death of French Jews is harrowingly true to reality, and the scenes set in occupied France are acknowledged to be admirable in their historical accuracy. The books that are mentioned at the end, as well as the books that are passed on by Guillaume and by Franck Lévy within the diegesis, are all pieces that contribute to putting together both Sarah's story and the actual <coughs> novel that we are reading, El Sapisa. Another important element in this piecing together is the passing on of personal documents, such as letters and journals. One reading of the documents is not enough. The story is made whole only when several characters read the same document, adding to it their own interpretation and intertextual baggage, for lack of a better word at this point. Um, several characters need to breathe life into these documents to bring the story to light and give us the text that we are reading. When reading fails, the characters remain partly unknown to other characters. And this happens, for example, with Sarah herself, because her notebook that she wrote as an adult is only read approximately 30 years after her death. This lack of reading meant that her husband, and up to that point her son William as well, only knew part of the story. I guess he hadn't read her notebook. This is the son talking about his father. Nobody had. We must, he must have found it a long time after her passing away. We all thought it was an accident. Nobody really knew who my mother was. I didn't even know it myself. Even if the notebook was found by William's father, so Sarah's husband, it is the reading of the notebook that would have set things in motion. And moreover, the notebook would have, would have only been one piece of the puzzle. In order to fully understand it, other documents needed to be read. For example, jean pierres letter or the folder that is passed on by Julia's father-in-law, and it is that folder that's passed on to him by his own father that sort of attests to the link between Julia's husband's family and Sarah's family. So, and we can add to this the books that I mentioned before, because those books would then allow the characters to set the personal story in a more socio-political context. I would like to dwell on Geneviève's letter to highlight the importance of passing on documents and of creating informal reading groups around them. Julie and Geneviève are the couple that look after Sarah after she manages to escape the camp. The letter is addressed to their son, their son Alain, but Julia receives it from one of Geneviève's grandsons, Gaspar. And Gaspar and Nicolas were Alain's sons, Geneviève's grandsons, and they were closer in age to Sarah, and they sort of they portrayed to play together and to go on holiday together. So, before I left, he handed me a letter. My grandmother had written this letter to my father after the war. Maybe you would like to have a look. Pass it on to Nathalie after you've read it. Despite the fact that the letter is addressed to Alain, a reading group forms around it. For Gaspar, it is a way of remembering the time spent with Sarah during their childhood. For Julia, the letter is a way of filling in the holes of the story she has so far. For Nathalie, who is Gaspar's granddaughter, so we have lots of generations here, is a way of discovering a completely silenced part of her family's history. What well, that's actually for us as readers is a way of adding to the post-1942 timeline because now we're still, there's no more chapters set in 1942 or shortly after, so this is the only artifact that we have from sort of the immediate post-war period in, in the book. Throughout the sections above, I've tried to show that the simple existence of written artifacts, be they books, letters or family documents, is not enough for bringing stories to life. These artifacts need to be read, but most importantly, they need to be passed on. It is the passing on and the reading as a group that allows both the characters and the reader to piece together the story. These acts of remembering are both mental, so much closer to the meaning of to remember, to bring to mind, but they're also physical, because we're piecing together artifacts in almost in a detective-like manner. In the case of El Sable Sarah, reading together is shown to have the potential to change lives. Do I have a bit of time for my next section? Yes, you've got five minutes. Oh, fantastic. So for the next section, I'll look very briefly at another one of Beaune's novels, the 2009 Mocha, that was adapted for the big screen in 2016, to try to analyse the manner in which reading is linked to the identity of the woman narrator, Justine Wright. Justine is French, married to Andrew, an English architect, and they live in Paris with their bilingual children, Malcolm and Georgia. 
producing as a translator, and it is her job as a translator that ensures she has a particular connection to words and to the reading process. However, other characters have a different view of her translator's job. My father would say, Justine looks after her children and she does a little bit of translation to make ends meet. <laughs> but it's not a real job that would exist. It's just thrown together. You don't go to an office like your brother, for example, or your husband. You do, it, you do it just like that. It's not a real job. I also feel that in my translation, I didn't do justice to the word bricolage. That's, that's in there because it's just, it, bricolage is just richer than what I've said. Um, so her father sees her first and foremost as a mother. Justine élève ses enfants. She looks after her kids. Her translation work is only an add-on. The adverb, un peu de, a little bit, suggests that she's somehow not fully committed to the job of doing it only for the extra financial gains it provides. Financial gains that presumably go towards the family because there's a juxtaposition between her family and her work as a, as a translator. The fact that translation does not need to happen in the traditional, possibly masculine space of the office diminishes its reach and importance in the eyes of the father. While not going as far as her father, other acquaintances build a hierarchy between writing and translating, with the former ranking visibly higher than the latter. But why don't you write novels, some would ask me. Novels, essays, why you limit yourself to someone else's creation, as if you were hiding behind their text. So the dichotomies that underlie the opinions in these two paragraphs, <coughs> writing versus translating and masculine jobs versus feminine jobs, they fall back into old age stereotypes of women's work as secondary, as an add-on of lesser importance when compared to that of men. However, it is by reading the work of a woman that Justine decides upon her future career, which is to become a translator. She identifies Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca as the trigger for her decision to become a translator at the really young age of 13 years old, when a disappointing French translation pushes her to provide her own version. Now, the link to Tatiana de Ronner here is very clear because the author herself considers Daphne du Maurier to be her favorite author. And as I mentioned in the introduction, she published the first French biography of Daphne du Maurier, and it was published to critical acclaim. Throughout the novel, Justine is shown to be reading and translating. So we have paragraphs <coughs> where she just spends time, she talks about what she reads and how her translating work is going. She takes up a new translation job, and that's an American novel peppered with erotic scenes, which is very different to the more marketing type of text that she was used to up to that point. And she does this in order to be able to cope with her family's situation. Um, the kind of the main narrative thread is the fact that her son is in a coma after being the victim of a hit and run accident. So she says that throwing myself into my work was another way of coping. I had accepted the translation of the American book. Unlike in Elsa Pessara, in Mocha, the act of reading does not push forward the main narrative thread, which is the, the mother's look for the culprit, so that's kind of the main, the main story. But reading and translating offer the mother moments of respite, a break from the family ordeal. However, for the reader, the moments when Justine is reading and translating are moments when she's not investigating. They are breaks that allow the reader to anticipate and create their own scenarios, which will be proved or disproved as the narrative unfolds. These moments also force the reader to be patient, because Justine can only return to her investigative work once reading and translating have had a sufficient impact on her. They are simultaneously moments of authorial control, because they pace the rhythm at which we read. We have to, I mean, I guess we could choose not to go through these passages, but if we were to read the entire novel, we have to read the sections when she translates and she reads. But they're also readerly, moments of readerly creativity, because they allow us to predict the results of the main search. Whether that's going to happen or not, it's still a creativity on behalf of the reader. Or, in Jill's words, the mise en abîme of reading about reading is a way of initiating, even directing the reader towards an open, considered reading, yet it does not pretend to control it. The project is in its very early stages and would benefit enormously from any suggestions today. Um, taken as a starting point, the fact that reading is an activity that concerns more than four in five people in France, I'm interested in looking at how the act of reading is depicted in best-selling and popular novels in France, and how this mise en abîme of reading can have an impact on extra diegetic, extra diegetic reading practices. 
As a first case study, I looked at some of Tatiana de Romer's novels, putting forward the idea that in Inés de Sarra, it is the passing on of reading materials and the group of readings that ensue that shape the piecing together of both Sarra's story, but also the piecing together of the story that we are reading, El Sarra. In Mocha, reading about reading and translating has an effect upon the rhythm of our reading processes. I guess the next steps would be to expand my corpus, both with works, with other works by Tatiana de Rone, but also works by other best-selling or popular novelists, especially turning towards texts that put the writing process, or the reading and the writing processes, centre stage. Thank you very much. It's interesting how we're reading, we're hearing over and over again about networks of readers and communities of readers and what's going on in this centre over the years as well, I guess. So now we're going to move on to Catherine McLeod. Catherine is a lecturer in French studies at the University of London Institute in Paris and a member of the steering committee of the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing. Her research interests concern women in French language graphic novels and migration and trauma narratives in bande dessinée and caricatures. <coughs> Her talk today is Redrawing the Female Body in Aurélia Orita's Fais et Chocolat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I only met Jill Ray today properly in the queue for the ladies, no less. <laughs> <laughs> but I've owed you a debt of gratitude for a while now. I'm a newer member of the Centre Steering Committee, which is a role that has already given me several opportunities, so thank you for finding this important research group, and also for your work, which I'm going to be reading uh, in preparation for today, and I was reminded just how engaging and useful it, uh, it was and is. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Aurelia Rita. Some of you have already told me that you remember her speaking a couple of years ago at another centre at the end. So you should uh, know if you've heard her speak, and I will warn you if uh, you've never heard of her at that, my PowerPoint comes with a parental advisory sticker. <laughs> so in 2009, um, graphic novelist uh, Aurelia Arita published an autobiographical bon dessiné, which, which was called Buzzmoi, reflecting on the popularity of her earlier 2006 work, Fraise et Chocolat. This book, she stated, created a buzz. <laughs> and the reasons behind this buzz concern the interaction of the content of uh, Frise Chocolat and the identity of its author. It is a graphically sexual uh, bon dessin narration by a young, hitherto unknown French uh, female artist of the intimate relationship between a well known bon dessin creator, Frédéric Poilly, he is, um, and a character, Chenda, who appears to be representation of the book's author, really, Arita. Now, certain elements of the book's content and creation do link it to previous uh, works of literature and bon dessiné, thus situating the work to an extent within various uh, existing traditions. The openly sexual uh, nature of the narrative and its, its expression by a French woman has led to comparisons to literature of French female authors such as Violet de Pont and Catherine Mie, and in fact, uh, Aurelia Rita has noted um, that in interviews she has repeatedly asked about uh, her links to these uh, these authors. Um, and you, we could also say that, um, as she would, I think, that Bosma is a, a tongue-in-cheek reference to the most famous texts. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the uh, Bondesini presentation of this sexual explicitness uh, that's in Très de Chocolat and its apparently autobiographical nature uh, draws parallels with uh, certain male bon dessiné artists such as Fabrice Snow in his Journal, which is a four volume work. And then to Frédéric Boilet's work himself, um, he's an artist who frequently interviews autobiographical elements um, and explicit representations of often Asian women in his work. Then thirdly, the interaction of explicitness and life narrative drawn by women has also suggested a certain link with uh, certain North American uh, <coughs> comics artists, particularly Aline kaminsky Crum, um, and in the Québécois, uh, Julie Doucet. Um, and the latter comparison with Arita comes uh, particularly from the unabashed depiction of certain realities of the female bodily experience menstruation, one of them. 
Um, however, despite the validity of these individual links to other traditions, it's the combination uh, of all the noted aspects of Fezi Shukula that uh, has rendered this work unique. Um, compounding the still relative uncommonness of the artist's gender in 2006, the book's own preface, which is written um, by the more well-known male artist Ransvar, um, notes, and I quote that, for once it's a girl speaking, um, is the fact that although graphic explorations of women's sexual experiences have always been present in US women's uh, graphic novels, um, autobiographical novels, I should say. The same was not to be visible in their Franco-Belgian uh, equivalents when they later became available. Um, then the incidence of Francophone female artists drawing out with the autobiographical genre um, new characters and sexually explicit scenes more generally is, is quite rare and remains rare today. Um, so Areta's work therefore stands out as exceptional in the Francophone industry. So beyond the challenges to Bondesini norms uh, posed by the basic outline of Chez et Chocolat, several more complex aspects of the narrative um, also confront and defy uh, dominant representations of women and of women's sexual behaviour as they are represented throughout the Bondesini medium and indeed elsewhere in other media. So Arita de-idealises via, via various textual and visual means the depiction of the naked female form and of the sexual act throughout Frédéric <coughs> Chocolat. And further, she challenges via the figure of Chenda certain popular expectations concerning female sexual behaviour. And this paper studies these aspects of Arita's work with the aim to showing how this Bondesini may be used to draw for change, perhaps. And by visually undermining the image of women which is so often presented within the medium. It also examines how the autobiographical expression of the female body may be used to redraw the image of women, um, reclaiming it to an extent from the dominant modes of depiction in the Bondi scene. So one of the features of autobiography is, as Jeanne and others have stated, that the genre implies a shared nominal identity between the author, the narrator, the protagonist. Throughout Frise et Chocolat, Arita does not call the protagonist Aurelie, uh, nor does she expressly attest to the truthfulness of her experiences, as Julie Doucet does repeatedly in her autobiographical work, for example. Rather, Arita hints at the autobiographical nature of her work, allowing identifiable references to become um, visible progressively throughout the text. Um, the Bondi city itself is a mixture of um, dated um, in terms of high <coughs> chronological date and uh, text image diary pages and then uh, short chapters which follow with a more classic Bondesini uh, panel and strip uh, structure. And the main figure is a French female graphic artist of Asian origin, as is Aurelia Arita, and she uses the first person I throughout, suggesting the voice to be that of Aurelia Arita. But no name is attributed to this figure until close to the end of the book when she is simply designated as Chenda. And this contrasts to the identification of Chenda's partner, whose uh, first name is used uh, from the third page of the narrative, and then whose full name, Frédéric Boilly, which would be familiar to the Bondi he's quite he's quite famous, um, is noted not uh, too long after. So via this contrast, Arita appears to play with the notion of autobiographical identification. The precise naming of Boilé, as I say, a well-known Bondesini artist, lends the narrative an air of autobiographical authenticity. The naming of Chenda, however, is less clearly confessional, as although this is actually the artist's given name, as you might expect, Aurelia Arita's uh, pen name, um, the lack of explanation of this and the fact that she was an unknown uh, artist at the time of publication, so nobody would know that, uh, renders, um, excuse me, renders the link between character and creator less definitive. But Arita does progressively reveal throughout the book that she and Chenda are one and the same. On the final page of the book, however, and this is um, during an epilogue uh, in which she reflects on past lovers from ironing, she plays with the notion of autobiographical truth one last time. 
she concludes the narrative with the following words. She says, uh, the story that you have just read is fictional because, of course, I've never in all my life ironed a single one of the pages. Really, Arita. Tokyo to February 2006, and Tokyo is where the, the story of uh, Hedy Chocolat largely takes place. So this statement places uh, a tongue-in-cheek question mark over the lived uh, nature of the experiences present in the narrative. So the autobiographical uncertainty of Hedy Chocolat impacts the narrative in two principal ways. By drawing what progressively appears to be her own body and graphically expressing her own sexual experiences, Arita's work uh, participates in a certain reclaiming of the female body from dominant uh, male creative expressions. And the Bondi scene, although it has experienced a fairly sizable influx of women artists since the start of the millennium, is still massively male dominated. Um, so, as Tixu famously proclaimed in the Rio de la Meduse, women must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing, again stating, by writing herself, women will return to the body which has been more than confiscated from her, which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display. So by writing and drawing her apparent self, in a literal sense, um, Arita presents an authentic female body and experience at odds with the idealised uh, and imagined femininity presented elsewhere in the medium, thus reclaiming the female form from a very frequently distorted norm. By retaining a certain level of ambiguity as <coughs> to her shared identity with Chenda throughout most of Fezzi Chopala, however, Arita is also able to present a less individualised depiction of the sexual women. So as the identity of the main character is not entirely fixed, um, and we must note here, as you can see, that her visual style is very, very simple, um, which leaves visual characterisation open to some interpretation. Um, this contributes to the fact that the figure depicted is able to retain a certain level of female, at least universality. So she is, for much of the book, a woman, a woman artist rather than the woman artist created on the book's cover, which avoids the sometimes distance, distancing specificity of autobiographical expression. Um, but although the um, lived nature of Fezzi Chopra and the autobiographical expression of the female body depicted on the page is often ambiguous, the challenge is that Arita issues in this work two Bondesney representations of sex via her depiction of this body are visible from the beginning of the text and they continue throughout. It's certainly an explicit bon dessiné containing multiple sex scenes which illustrate a variety of physical acts. My mother was horrified that this was what I was talking about today. <laughs> um, but Fizzy Chocolat avoids categorisation as an erotic bon dessiné by shifting focus in many of these scenes onto other mundane aspects of everyday life. <coughs> um, early in the narrative, in a scene showing a sexual act on a balcony, for example. Sorry, that's just another example of how simple her drawing style is. Here we go. So, this is an early um, sexual scene from the book um, on a balcony. Jenda's dialogue normalises this act um, by drawing attention to the fact that what she's really feeling is that she's just cold and she wants to go inside. So this normalises the act in this way, or Arita also does this by shifting focus within these scenes uh, onto the occasional less pleasant side effects of sexual intercourse, particularly those linked to the realities of the female body. So the frais in the title, of et Chocolat, refers to a sexual mishap, for example, encountered in the book involving the unexpected start of Jane's period. Um, so this narrative of the comedic reinsertion of everyday bodily reality into a sexual act, which is so often represented in visual or textual works as seamlessly choreographed, almost exalted moments, um, set distinctly apart from the mundaneness of real life, is accompanied by two uh, notable elements of Rita's artistic style. One is her use of visual details, which are specific in their formatting to the Bondesini medium, to draw attention to quotidian elements. During another early sex scene <coughs> book, for example, she draws a large arrow showing Frederick's hand holding onto her foot. Um, 
This distracts the eye from the intimate image which, images which otherwise dominate the page. She also, on several occasions, adds onomatopoeia to sexual scenes to emulate sometimes amusing noises associated with human bodies having sex. Um, uh, this is a funnier one which shows some Japanese onomatopoeia which she finds very amusing in the book. <laughs> Um, a further stylistic aspect which greatly contributes to the de-eroticisation of sex throughout this book is just the simplicity of Arita's drawings, of particularly the female body. So sketches of Chenda and Frédéric dominate Frézé Chocolat background um, characters. Other characters are entirely limited to background panel detail where they're facing a turtle. And Arita's style fluctuates somewhat in her rendering of Frederic and then Chenda. So Chris Rains, Chikuma and Marie Dino have already noted of Arita that her much more detailed sketches of Frederic in Frézé Chocolat, um, and I'm quoting here, show that the artist knows how to draw more academically, end quote, than the unconstrained style she employs in the rest of the book, um, which they suggest to be between sketch and caricature. Her visual representation of Chenda, however, remains very simple throughout. She's drawn with a very large uh, round head and her facial features are indicated by uh, single lines or circles, as you can see, very simple. In fact, sometimes on occasions, bodily outlines uh, that shouldn't be physically visible are left into drawings. For example, you shouldn't really be able to, be, to see her shoulder here behind her chin. Um, but such sketches are left in um, with an intentional air uh, of rapid creation and carelessness, almost, <coughs> which contribute to the loosely followed journal pre uh, premise of the book. Um, during scenes of nudity and sex, Chenda's body is depicted with very little detail. We <laughs> My mother was right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two semicircles representing breasts in the curved line and an X for the genitals. And this overall lack of detail uh, attributed to Chenda contributes to the level of, as I say, female universality in the figure's depiction. Um, also maintained, as I previously noted, by the autobiographical ambiguity <coughs> of the book, allowing Arita to depict a woman's uh, experience of sex rather than uh, a visually and for much of the book nominally, nominally very specific women's experience. And it also contributes to the challenge applied by Frézé Chocolat to dominant representations of women and sex in the Bondé Cine in two interconnected ways. Firstly, the extremely simple uh, representation of the nude female form for, during, after sex. Uh, presented by Arita contrasts with the most uh, well-known representations of women, uh, female nudity and sex seen elsewhere in the medium of which there are many. So we could, for example, cite 1962's Barbarella, which is the first adult directed bon dessinée that kicked this uh, thing off, um, in which Jean-Claude Forest repeatedly highlights visual markers of the character's sexual difference, you know, the long hair, the curve of the breasts, the bind, etc. And the artists who are most uh, well known for um, eroticism and uh, sexualized imagery of women in the form are Guido Kripax and Milo Manara. Apologies for my pronunciation. They are Italian artists, as they sound, but um, their work was published simultaneously in France as well as in Italy, and they remain extremely popular in, in France. Um, they are, they were and remain highly celebrated in the industry for their detailed draftsmanship and their intricately drawn, beautiful, sexualized depictions of female fi figures such as Claudia Cristiani in the De Kik series or Valentina or Emmanuel in Prepax's work. And then we could talk about uh, Boilet's own more recent work. Um, which is notably marked by beautifully rendered stories <coughs> of women's bodies, which are often fragmented mm -hmm. to focus on elements of their sexual difference and to obscure the visual presence of their male companions during these scenes. <coughs> um, Arita's very understated and undetailed sketches of the naked female form sit in stark contrast to 
these now normalised interpretations of women's bodies that abound in the bond they see to the point of having been and still continuing to be one of its distinguishing features as a medium. As Jara A says, in reading for change of literature, readers bring with them their reading, uh, to their reading, their own personal and cultural baggage, including memories and traces of texts from their past reading. And I would posit that this might be particularly true of the bon dessinée reader in their expectation of a certain visual female form. Um, the lack of definition in Arita's drawings removes this expected um, emphasis uh, this expected emphasis on sexual corporeal features and aesthetically pleasing silhouettes and thus consciously de-romanticizes the visual conception of the nude female form, asking the reader to begin to reform their understanding of it. Um, and this simplicity and de-idealization also contributes to Rita's reconceptualization of sex as a quotidian act removed from imagined and often unrealistic eroticism. So Hilary Shute notes of Alan kaminsky Crumb's bulbous, somewhat grotesque style, that's not the best quality of image, um, of depicting female bodies that uh, kaminsky Crumb's style presents a deliberate challenge to the idea that, um, the, that any image of a naked woman is supposed to be aroused. Now, Arita's aesthetic is obviously very different to that of kaminsky Crumb. Yeah, it produces a similar effect concerning women and the sexual act. The lack of detail in the imagery and of any corresponding uh, invitation to the reader to focus via various means on change of the body beyond that which is required by the narrative discourages the freezing effect that Laura Mulvey suggested that the female body might have on traditional narrative progression. So Chenda's body reclaimed uh, by its simplicity from the continual eroticization associated with the female form in the bond medium becomes just one element on the drawn page amongst several others, rather than always being the dominant pictorial element of the page, allowing the reader to direct their attention to other details of the scenes presented, such as the comedic uh, everyday banalities or mishaps previously noted. Um, the fluidity of Arita's adherence to the traditional structuring mechanisms of the Valnesini. So I've already noted that uh, Freddy Chocolat swings between free-form diary pages and more structured panel and script um, pages. This also on occasion contributes to the diffusion of the reader's attention away from the, the female form, from the expected eroticism of the female form, I should say. As uh, Irene Leroy-Ledurie notes, the lack of bon dessinée architecture on a page allows the look of the reader to wander uh, between the images without being directed in a specific manner by traditional sequential structuring. So unlike the work of the other more well-known bon dessinée authors noted, like Forest or Crépax or, uh, or Boilet, in which the look of the reader is frequently and with great emphasis guided across the page to better focus on the female's exaggerated sexual features. In Fraise Chocolat, uh, Arita often denies the specific position of the case um, and thus allows for a plurality of visual foci. And this fluidity is a further component of a very conscious drawing for change on the part of the artist. So I'm going to conclude that. Um, so, if I had more time, I might say more about how narratively and stylistically this book is also used to challenge um, some dominant myths about uh, what is normal sexual behaviour. Uh, but um, time presses, so I shall conclude. So, as I noted in the introduction to this paper, the shock of the book's content, and you can kind of see where that came from, um, created a buzz. In the conclusion to Reading for Change, uh, Jo Rai notes that when the effects of the reading experience glass beyond the reading of the text, then the way is open for either material or psychological change to take place. A read, a read of challenge in Fresi Chocola, so the simplification, the de eroticization, the banalization of the sexual act, and the naked female form shown through simplified character drawing, flexibility of page structuring, and use of bondage specific. Uh, comedic uh, features has lasted for readers beyond the close of the text, it certainly lasted for the artist. And it has shown other artists how Bondesney can self reflect 
on its own entrenched gender norms using the creativity of its own form. But with no obvious successor to Arita's bold experiment, how much of a lasting change this was, has and will affect on the medium still remains unclear. <laughs> We do some great stuff in this centre, don't we, really? <laughs> so from um, reading for change to drawing for change to writing for change, writing journalistically for change, I think we're moving to Siobhan Machiavelli. Siobhan is a reader in French and Francophone women's writing at King's College London. She's published extensively on contemporary French and Francophone women's writing and on the origins of the French women's press. Her two most recent publications are Figurations of the Feminine in the Early French Women's Press, 1758 to 1848, and a co-edited volume with Julian Nietzsche, Women and the City in French Literature and Culture, Reconfiguring the Feminine in the Urban Environment. And her talk today is Representing the Ordinary, the Sexual Textual Politics of Early French Women's Magazines. Thank you very much, Nathalie, and thank you very much, Shirley, for, for organising today. And thank you very much, Jill for bringing us all and for the reason that we're all here. And I know there's going to be various um, discourses occurring later on, but I just want to say that um, I first met Jill about a quarter of a century ago. I was, I was doing the math. Um, and I met Jill when I started my first, and uh, still, still my first and only permanent job, um, having done a PhD on women's writing where I really struggled to find a supervisor. So the PhD also followed an MA, which was a joint MA that included four taught years, because it was a Scottish university. And for these four, four taught years, I was I did French and German, and we'd done one tiny text by a German woman author. So I really think, as they say, the past is another country. Um, this is fantastic, but when I started, Jill was, you know, for me, Jill represents kind of solidarity, professional solidarity, that there was somebody who would bring people together who were kind of isolated in, in institutions. So thank you very much for that, Jill. Okay, um, in the following paper, I want to take some of the key premises of Jill's book, Reading for Change, and apply them to the genre of early French women's characters. <coughs> and I have to say that Jill's Reading for Change, for me, is a book that very much also practices what it preaches in the sense of provo provoking and promoting reflection and change in its readers as well. And I think it's also indicative of the kind of intellectual, the ongoing intellectual relevance of the book, that we have a panel with such a kind of wide range of, of genre and indeed um, that spans such a wide historical um, period because the magazines or the journals I'm going to be talking about basically date from about 250 years ago. But Jill's book is incredibly relevant to an understanding of them. So my recent monograph focuses on the origins of the women's press in France and in many ways the key characteristics of this much neglected medium have altered remarkably little over the centuries. To my mind these early women readers and writers beautifully epitomise what reading for change is all about. The significance of the press, of the women's press, is that it is a genre produced for and predominantly by women. So in other words, explicit femocentricity is built into its generic categorization. Its political potential for change is particularly relevant during its early years of publication. And I'm sort of talking from around about 1758 onwards when journals were often more accessible to the reading public in terms of both format and availability than, for example, the text of the philosopher. In an article entitled La multiplication des périodiques, Jean Scard remarks that periodicals could be viewed as more pivotal to the proliferation of Enlightenment ideas and to the establishment of the 18th century reading market generally than more heavyweight literary and philosophical texts. And this still has relevance as far as women's magazines today are concerned. Women who don't read books read magazines, and the same magazine often has multiple readers. Equally, the periodical medium is one that fuses the extra textual reality with 
the textual representation of that reality, giving the impression of a writer-reader relationship that exists in the real world. Yeah, okay. So I'm quoting here from an introduction to Jen in the Victorian periodical by uh, Hilary Fraser et al. And they say, the periodical press offering a liminal space between public and private domains was a critical mediating agent between these two worlds. The early women's press thus represented an important means of allowing women to access and contribute to the key cultural, intellectual and political debates that dominated French society at the time and that directly influenced the imposition within it. Despite being such a popular form of written textual production consumed by female readers, however, women's magazines have been a much neglected subject of academic criticism in French. And there's a lot more written in Anglo-American criticism. Um, and maybe this also comes back to some of the papers that we've heard earlier where I think there seems to be an engagement with perhaps the popular novel, um, with the women's press in Anglo-American circles, um, more so than in French academic circles. This academic reluctance to study the women's journalistic press may partly originate in a misogynist snobbery, which considers women's magazines vapid frivolities, whose principal function is to plaire through escapism rather than instruire through any meaningful content, meaningful or inverted commas. While women's journals and magazines have long embraced a variety of different forms and covered an extensive spectrum of divergent topics, a journalistic miscellany that surely accounts for their enduring popularity, they continue to be defined by the same simplistic generalisations as they themselves are accused of promoting. And I thought this was quite interesting as well, that the English term magazine stems from the French term uh, magasin. So, Alison, Arbergham and Women in Print says, the term magazine applied to the periodical did not come into use until the third decade of the 18th century. It was the happy thought of a bookseller named Edward Cave to use it in the sense of a storehouse. So a kind of magasin, almost, of miscellaneous um, writings. Such disparagement is nothing new and was apparent in the earliest descriptions of the French press and its putatively nefarious influence as illustrated in the Encyclopédie of the Philosophe. Their entries under Gazette, Hebdomadaire, Journal, Journaliste, etc., make clear their view of journals as a parasitical, uncreative medium consumed by the unintelligent and the easily influenced. And I think I can also see some parallels uh, with Sandra's talk about translation as a kind of, you know, um, distilled creative medium, um, so to speak, or still, uh, distilled um, creative art. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to, to mention, oh, actually, that the Tom Modern quotation here is kind of classic. Chaque mois, um, chaque jour, nous femmes égarons notre regard sur des pages d'une civilisation patriarcale en déconfiture, la presse si joliment qualifiée de féminine en est un exemple flagrant. And there's a kind of, you know, a uh, masochistic uh, drive. Et nous femmes payons, achetons cette littérature pour nous faire insulter. Such, if such critical neglect is more surprising in our current academic postmodernity, which following the exhortations of critics such as Roland Barthes and Frederick Jameson, supposedly endeavours to embrace both high and popular culture, the ordinary French female subject, in both senses of the term, has long suffered an absence of critical attention. In his work, A Social History of France, 1780 to 1880, Peter McPhee attributes the relative paucity of research into women's social evolution to, I quote, a certain urban and male bias in research in social history, with the result that the largest single social group, the working women of the countryside, is that about which we know, uh, is that, sorry, which we know least about. So, while recent debates, um, uh, sorry, while recent decades have witnessed a significant increase in the scholarly attention accorded French women during the 18th and 19th centuries, the French women's press constitutes a pivotal, yet remarkably unmined seam of the general discursive field in 18th and 19th century textuality, 
providing a uniquely factual perspective on the predominant constructions of femininity throughout this turbulent historical period. The nauseously, sort of citing Bach, the nauseously predictable content of women's magazines, their focus on the déjà dit, accounts for much of their historical critical dismissal from both formal and thematic perspectives. Women's journals, women's magazines, it is argued, have a Sisyphean-like repetitiveness in which the same articles are rehashed indefinitely and little ideological advancement takes place. At the same time, women's journals are often viewed as exerting a dangerously powerful influence on female readers. They encourage an unthinking espousal of feminine stereotypes, and the socialization of the female reader into highly retrograde gender roles. In understanding women's magazines, publishing markets, and readerships, um, sorry, is that there? <laughs> I might got my... Well, I was, I was ahead of myself. So in understanding women's magazines, publishing markets, and readerships, Anna Goff Yates, describes this dissemination of reactionary feminine stereotypes the women's press is accused of promoting. Stereotypes which the poor, helpless reader would appear unable to resist. And she says, the women's magazine industry is understood as a monolithic meaning producer, circulating magazines that contain messages, spill of the masons, messages and signs about the nature of femininity that serve to promote and legitimate dominant interests. Much Anglo-American feminist criticism on the women's press characterises women's magazines as dangerous ideological crutches of patriarchy, which, while claiming merely to represent the interests of their women readers, actually create and sustain those interests in the first place. Marjorie Ferguson makes this point in relation to the typical feminising function associated with women's magazines. In promoting a cult of femininity, and again, I think, obviously, that's highly emotive language that would kind of um, lead you to believe that you are brainwashed and you can't resist. In promoting a cult of femininity, these journals are not merely reflecting the female role in society. They are also supplying one source of definitions of and socialisation into um, that role. In other words, women's journals are both soporifically vacuous and surreptitiously indoctrinating. It's important to counter the negativity associated with such journalistic representations of women by arguing that the role played by women's journals in the internalisation or naturalisation of feminine gender construction can equally be used for more feminist ends. By repudiating the positive and radical effects that the women's press can have on its female readership, feminist criticism is subscribing to the very patriarchal criteria concerning the literary canon that it sets out to deconstruct. These criteria place women's literature, what Beauvoir in the deuxième sex refers to as ouvrage de dame, firmly at the bottom of the literary hierarchy, with women's magazines occupying a lower rung still. Jo Kermes sounds a cautionary note apropos of such feminist dismissiveness in the concluding section of Reading Women's Magazines and Analysis of Everyday Media Use. And I think this is also relevant for what Di is going to be talking about as well. The division between high and low culture, the neglect of everyday media use, and the eternal putting down of women's media are all strategies of domination that define us as users of those genres and even as the researchers. Those definitions ultimately designate the battlefield for feminist media criticism to fight on. Women's magazines clearly play a more intellectually, political and emotionally significant role in their female readers than has been accounted for critically. The women's press is a hugely popular medium that gives so much pleasure to its readers. 
in spite of the general disdain in which it is held. Indeed, in her predominantly negative account of the cultural and semiotic codes that influence readerly, readerly interpretations of contemporary American women's magazines, decoding women's magazines from Mademoiselle to Ms., Ellen McCracken views the pleasurable element in such interpretation as key, and she says, this is a final quotation on the slide, readers are not force-fed a constellation of negative images that naturalise male dominance. Rather, women's magazines exert a cultural leadership to shape consensus. And I think there is the kind of there's room for manoeuvre there, in which highly pleasurable codes work to naturalise social relations of power. And I'll come back to this use of naturalise in a minute. The narrative continuity inherent in serialisation, the sense of dialogic intimacy and community, the often reassuringly predictable format, to name but a few recurrent features, all contribute to the creation of readerly pleasure. A pleasure linked to a recognition, not simply of the formal components of a particular journal, but equally of the aspirations it espouses. My perception of the readerly perspective in the interpretation of women's magazines echoes that articulate, articulated by critics such as Janice Radway, in her now seminal discussion of romantic fiction, and Jo Kermes, who we've just heard from, who accredit the female reader with a greater conscious awareness of the content of the products being read and an ability to take pleasure in that highly structured and familiar content and to negotiate the various representations and mediatic messages provided without being brainwashed by them or indeed even accepting their validity. <coughs> Radway maintains that readers of romance are perfectly aware of the disparity between the real and its idealised fictional versions, that part of them remains self-consciously disengaged through the act of reading. The representation of this type of split personality can be related to the famous division of identity highlighted by Virginia Woolf in A Room of One's Own and by subsequent feminists as being a characteristic feature of the female psyche. The subsidiary, decentralised role of women in patriarchal society places them in the position of both participant and spectator, and makes them particularly aware of the performative aspect of many of the roles they are required to play. Significantly, Candace Proctor dates such splitting of what she terms contradiction theory to the Enlightenment period in women equality and the French Revolution. According to this hypothesis, there was a direct contradiction between women's natural character and the one that society expected from them. The resulting, and this has been a thread that's run through today's papers, <coughs> the resulting need to assume a false character left women open to derisory charges of artificiality, forced from childhood to conform to a traditional imagery that visualised them more as females than as human beings. The women of 18th century France grew up with little sense of self. This divide between private spectator and public participant no doubt contributes to the, the remarkable self-awareness characteristic of many of the readers and writers of the early French women's press, and thus to their potential to renegotiate the components of these public figurations of the feminine. In other words, the 18th century reinforcement of binarized sexual norms helped forge a gendered, often counter conception and consciousness among women readers regarding French women's actual and potential social and sexual roles. Early women's journals demarcate a clear community of women readers and the sense of inclusiveness promoted by these journals stems from the two-way communication they embrace. It's not solely through their role as subscribers that readers can influence journalistic content by proxy, but equally in their role as contributors. Early French women's journals provide a culturally significant source of material on the figurations of womanhood put forward by both the writers and readers of the women's press. The textual spaces offered in and by women's journals allow women readers and writers in the 18th century to carve out privileged sites of discourse and dialogue, to represent, as Jill puts it, a space of exploration, speculation, and creation of new and potential meanings and identities 
which do not necessarily reproduce the phallocentric system. These women, in the manner of Sikhs' exhortation in their journey, write themselves into French cultural representation and provide the reader, both contemporary and current, with access to their ordinary and previously invisible struggles and successes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is the fundamentally dialogic, personal quality of women's journals, which rather than lead to their dismissal as anthologies of coercive anecdotal tidbits, point out their feminist potential for an ongoing and egalitarian notion between French women and the roles posited in the press destined for them. And this negotiation bridges to, again, um, bring into the dialogue, reading for change, the individual and the collective. If the sheer regularity of publication and the often intimate nature of content serve to increase the impression of authenticity and overall proximity to the topical dailiness of French women readers the press seeks to attract, that relationship is not solely one of reflection. Early journals not only mirror the current day-to-day -day reality of women's uh, position in French society, but often endeavour to prescribe and promote non-conventional female figurations, particularly those journals with a feminist content. And I contend that if some of the pleasurable codes in the early French women's press inevit inevitably work to support the ideological status quo, particularly those found in fashion and domestic journals, the political impetus behind many others work rather to denaturalise social relations of power, or at the very least, to render them visible. Women's journals are products of the economic and cultural ideologies surrounding publication, yet can also help modify such ideologies, and thus the extra textual society in which they are published. In other ways, in other words, early French women's journals are indeed directive, but often in surprisingly feminist ways. And um, just in this article about the period of press in the 18th century England and France, um, the editors say, and again, in their choice of what to print, determined in part by the perception of demand, 18th century editors supplied material that may have reinforced or activated various attitudes among the readers. Um, according to this formulation, the 18th century periodical press should be regarded not only as a mirror of perceived reality, but also as an instrument of action and organisation. And I think the key phrase here is, um, as regard to the women's press, is strengthening the consciousness of belonging to this or that definable group. And I think that is, is pivotal. So the cliché perception of the female reader escaping drab reality through the passive consumption of stereotypical images of women ignores the often subversive content of this popular genre and its role <coughs> as a political catalyst for early French women readers and writers. And to conclude, I just want to give a couple of examples of these um, remarkable voices, um, again to, to quote Joe. So just to reiterate then, the women's press provides the first example of a written medium to be predominantly aimed at women. The criterion of femaleness dictates both its content and target readership. And this coherence between production and reception, when combined with regularity of output, allows women's journals to offer a detailed, continuous commentary on a range of important issues affecting women at different periods of French history. That commentary takes on multifarious guises, whether in the register and lexicon of journalistic language employed, in the form of articles discussing acceptable and unacceptable behaviour paradigms, paradigms for women, in advice on sartorial as well as moral or sexual fashions in la mode in the early French women's press is an incredibly inclusive term that refers to language, habits, morals uh, and clothes as well. So it, it, it has a much more kind of extensive um, coverage than our current um, understanding as it being purely sartorial. In the compte rendu of events in French society, in book reviews, or through the inclusion of advertisements for particular products and sketches of fashion accessories. Both the sheer newness and the target audience of this journalistic press 
through which French women could acquire self-representation, and I think that's key, no doubt served to render its content more politicised. Addressing women as a distinct social group or constituency um, had inevitable, if perhaps at times unintended, political repercussions. Early French women... <gasps> okay, I'm just going to very quickly finish and then we're going to move on to die. We're going to forgo questions, uh, but I'm very happy to talk to anybody about um, anything um, later on. So I was just saying, I was just going to let you hear or read some of the voices of the readers. Um, when I talked about, for example, one of the, the journals that I examined, which promotes a kind of, basically it says if your husband is mistreating you, please feel free to write in confidentially to this journal and our readers and writers will advise you what to do. So really kind of pretty um, radical in, in 1791. So the, the journals also petitioned for improvements in women's education, employment conditions, and I think um, they showed themselves, and here I just want to show you a couple of the voices, they showed themselves um, to be a mouthpiece for both quietly resistant individual readers and more vociferous collective ones. And this first is, I think, fantastic because it's, it's from the journal I've mentioned, which was also, it was a kind of almost a journal, a kind of courrier du coeur journal, where it was small arts, where men wrote in looking for women, women wrote in looking for men. Um, and this is one woman reader who says, Il est bien aisé, monsieur, de trouver que tout va au mieux lorsque l'on ne perd rien et que l'on gagne la liberté. Mais si vous étiez demoiselle, si vous aviez 20 ans passé, si un père qui n'aurait que des pensions pour revenus ne pouvait vous former une dot que de ses économies, peut-être la révolution ne vous paraîtrait pas, um, ne vous, ne vous paraît-elle pas le comble du bonheur? So again, kind of criticizing um, the, 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 the kind of monolinguism almost of the kind of promotion of the revolution as being, um, and the revolution as you know was very big on discourse but uh, very slim on actual action as far as female equality is concerned. And the second one then is just um, again basically saying that um, you know we, we, we admit that we don't really have a kind of trajectory of female artists um, but the key thing is, nous pourrions en assigner la cause dans les défauts de l'éducation qu'on donne à notre enfance. This is written in 1774. So basically saying our education is woefully inadequate, nor is it enforced, et dans l'espèce d'esclavage, an esclavage and you know various kind of um, hierarchical um, terms of class was used post-revolution you know, comp comparing men to a kind of aristocratic individual in a kind of hierarchical manner, but to use this in 1774 is really quite remarkable. de notre vie. And I just want to finish with, because my, and note also the use of nous, so the kind of, in the previous quotation, this kind of real sense of collectiveness. And I wanted to just say, because obviously, in many ways, the early French women's press was ahead of its time in the sense it had to negotiate a very delicate balance to keep enough readers on board in order to um, sort of stay in existence, to stay in circulation, but also, um, you know, to nonetheless try and push the boundaries of um, women's rights and roles. And I just think this is, this is fantastic as well because it's not about necessarily, you know, agreeing with the feminist sentiments expressed in so many of these journals, which are absolutely remarkable. Demanding sexual pleasure in 1788, you know, really um, very progressive remarks. But this one again is just fantastic because it's a woman reader basically saying, keep your feminist sentiments. We're quite happy to be feminine. We're quite happy, you know, and she, this is just addressing the editor of the journal. So she's basically saying, you're making us adopt, as Joan Riviere would say, a kind of masquerade, a masquerade of, of manliness in this sense. And she says, Vous voulez donc absolument, madame, nous imposer des lois. Et que vous faites notre paresse? Ignorez-vous que les femmes en général n'aiment point écrire. 
si ce n'est que dans les cas qui leur sont particuliers. Blablabla, bla, bla, bla. then she says, c'est donc sortir de notre sphère que de prétendre nous distinguer dans la littérature. L'esprit et les connaissances sont assez l'apanage des hommes. Ne, ch ne, ne cherchons pas à leur ôter ces avantages. Nous avons bien de quoi nous venger. <laughs> Uh, talk about mixed messages coming out yeah. here. But I think revenge, right? uh, revenge. We've got enough. We've got plenty to seek revenge. We don't need to um, inhabit the sphere of literature and the arts. Um, so just to finish off with then, this heated rejection of equality, albeit one subtended by a rather antagonistic perception of men, illustrates the journal's projection of its female readership, not as a group of passive consumers. And this comes back to my notion of the kind of female readers just being indoctrinated by um, kind of feminine nonsense in the contemporary women's press, this hilariously feminist nonsense in the early French women's press. So basically, illustrates the journal's projection um, of its female readership, not as a group of passive consumers imbibing whatever ideological drip feed is distributed to them, but as actively engaged in dialoguing with, and at times rejecting, the figurations of women placed before them. These early readers navigate an assured path through the multiple discursive paradigms of womanhood and heterosexual relations contained within the journal. Indeed, the intellectual confidence required to assert these sentiments subverts the stereotypical femininity which they espouse. So just to finish off, at its conception then, the French Women's Press aimed to improve women's rights, to encourage readers' engagement in important social issues for women in order to involve them in influencing their present and future position in French society by making the public sphere more accessible and relevant to them. In many ways, early French women's journals are also selling the notion of a better life, like the contemporary women's press, but are doing so not by overwhelming the reader's materialist aspirations with a wealth of consumer products, but by highlighting the need for personal and public responsibility in order to bring about improvements in women's social opportunities and lifestyle. In other words, to employ just terminology, many of the publications that make up the early French women's press sought to enact a transformative reading experience on their subscribers. While the desire for social reform and the political optimism expressed by many journals may have ebbed and flowed depending on the journal in question and the historical context, the feminocentric belief in the positive contribution women can and should make to French society, whether as wives, mothers or feminists, and in women's right of expression. And this is key because of these, these are ordinary women leaving writerly traces of their dailiness, of their everyday experiences. And it really is a privileged mode of access to read these women who say, thank you so much for giving me the confidence to write into your journal, for giving me the sense of being listened to. I would never have dared to express myself in the public realm otherwise. So in women's right of expression, be it radical or conservative, or conservative is ubiquitous in the early French women's press. Final sentence, women readers are figured as a female community and increasingly exhorted to work together to take part not simply in transformative reading experiences, but to translate these into transformative social action. Thank you. And thank you for bearing with us. Well, I think we'll move. I, put, I can't see the refreshments yet, so I, which are due for half past five. So I think probably they've just not been delivered. Um, so we will start with our with our second keynote, uh, who has agreed that at some point we can interrupt her. I suppose half past. Go and get a glass of red or whatever, <laughs> and, and bring it back. I'm going to stand up now. Okay, good support. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um well Di's getting her um technical support sorted. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Diana Holmes, who will give her second keynote lecture in honour of Jill and her uh, wonderfully transformative reading for change. Di Holmes is Professor of French at the University of Leeds. She has published widely on French women's writing from the late 19th century to the present, ranging across the hierarchy of culture from high to lowbrow, with a particular interest in what women choose to read. 
Her latest book is Middle Brown Matters, Women's Reading in the Literary Canon in France is the very book. Soon, and this is a, a real sort of scoop, soon to be announced as the winner of the Modern Languages Association Scaglione Prize for French and Francophone Studies. Yay! further than these four words. <laughs> She's been told she can announce it informally among friends and family, so. Yes. <laughs> friends and family, okay. exactly. Um, but not formally, so that was a very, very informal announcement there. Um, the co her co-edited book, Making Waves, French Feminism and their, French Feminisms and Their Legacies, 1975-2015, uh, with Margaret Atai, Alison Ferry and Jin Long, will appear with Liverpool University Press early in 2020. She's also worked, as you know, um, on film and co-edits, the Manchester University Press series, French Film Directors, which has now reached 50 volumes. As this very brief selection of that is extensive publication record reveals, her contribution to the field of French women's writing is, quite simply, phenomenal. And note that I have deliberately left out the adjective contemporary from that description because, as um, we know, her work also has a really impressive historical as well as thematic and generic range. Dyes is at ease writing about Colette and Rashield as she is uh, writing about Nancy Houston. And I also want to say from a personal perspective, I really, um, I hugely appreciate the lucidity of expression that characterises Dye's work because I think um, she manages to combine kind of real intellectual, you know, incisiveness with, and critical writing should be clear, with a, a really fantastic clarity of expression, in particular her um, 1994 which book French Women's Writing, published by Athlone, which I cite repeatedly, but her survey of French feminism is um, fantastic and really, really accessible. So I will je me tais and I introduce Di Holmes. Reading can change your life, women's middle brow fiction in the light of Jill's reading for change. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to get going any moment. I'm quite glad you all got the gusts of fresh air there because it's the end of quite a long day. I think it's a very good idea to pause in the middle and everybody gets a glass of wine, but I'll try to uh, not send you all to sleep for this last hour. Very quick word about Jill, because we're all going to talk about Jill properly in a few minutes, but I think I've, kn I, I, I've known Jill even longer than the, the quarter of a century that was just claimed. I'm sure. not competitive. <laughs> <laughs> remember exactly when but Jill has always been in my, in my memory anyway uh, a very of course you know effective and active member of the women in French network which most of you I imagine know about and which I would say which Maggie over here is probably the essential the founding leader um, but um, it's been I think a, a, net, a loose network that has been very effective in turning around the gender imbalance that was so unbelievably the case when certainly I started out. Uh, and out of which, in a sense, in a very, with a, a complicated trajectory, the Centre of Contemporary Women's Writing emerged, thanks to Jill, uh, from that. I have lots of other things to say about Jill, but I'll just get going, give me, give me the time. Okay, well, in a curious way, the reader, or rather readers, have long been quietly elided from literary criticism. The quality of a work is judged on its formal properties, the richness and originality of its themes, its textual poetics, whilst the effect that reading may have, and indeed the question of whether anyone other than specialist critics actually reads a text, tends to be rather ignored, or has tended to be rather ignored. Even the wave of reader response theory that surged in the 1980s defined the reader, the implied reader, essentially in terms of properties of the text. Feminist criticism, though, uh, from the start, however one defines the start, <coughs> did at least imply a central role of readership because it read literature through a political and functional as well as an aesthetic lens. The universalization of a masculine perspective was its first target and the absence of symbolization of the world from a woman's point of view, as Jill points out in her book, to which I'll return in a moment, was, to quote Jill, quoting Judith Fetterly, a kind of psychic suicide. 
It was vital, therefore, to recover lost foremothers, rediscover lost foremothers, and to read them for our own psychological, emotional, and political good. It was urgently necessary to write, as Sixus, also quoted by Jill, put it in La Journée, s'il y a un ailleurs qui peut échapper à la répétition infernale, c'est par là où ça s'écrit, où ça rêve, où ça invente les nouveaux mondes. I'm sorry, I've been a bit, um, a bit inconsistent about presenting translations, and I will sometimes gloss with the translation into English. But I think we all know roughly what Sixus said. The assumption was that through reading feminine writing, women readers would be enabled to recognise the legitimacy of their own angle on the world, to find their own voices. Feminist criticism focused on how women's and men's imaginations and sense of self were distorted and constrained by the ubiquity in culture of uniquely male viewpoints and fantasies, and on how to escape the répétition infernale thanks to the new dreams and new imaginings that writing and reading could provide. <coughs> so in Reading for Change, which dates from 2001, a book that is at once groundbreaking and situated as part of a collective feminist endeavour, Jill set about studying what happens when we read, notably when women read women-authored texts. In her own words, she was interested in the ways in which the dialogue of reading can affect transformation of various kinds in the self, in identities, in relationships, in thinking, in social practice. So taking case studies from French narrative fiction published within the preceding two decades, so from 1980 on, both avant-garde, Hélène, Hélène Sixous, and more accessibly realist, Paul Constant, Christian Baroche, Jill argues strongly that reading does have an impact on who we are, that reading can change your life. Focusing in particular on three recurring themes, loss, maternity, and difference, she examines closely how the reading dialogue, your phrase, or interactive engagement that effective texts demand of the reader produce a sense of self-recognition, but also an opening up of new possibilities. Novels can provide the pleasures of escapism and the endorsement that comes from recognising aspects of the self in the text, but they can also produce a transformative, subversive impact on the reader. The reader brings their own situation in the Beauvoirian sense of the situation, their own life history and choices to reading, and sets these in dialogue with the story being told. For example, Jill analyzes a scene from Baroche's L'Hiver de Beauté in which the heroine, Keria, arriving in Rio at carnival time, witnesses a naked black woman running down the street pursued by two men. She's screaming in a way that could equally well be interpreted as expressing laughter or fear. Keria, like the reader, must interpret the situation. Is it playful? This is carnival, after all. Or is it serious? Is the woman in control or is she not? But she opts to intervene, tripping up the first man and frightening the pursuers away, and thus affirming sisterhood and defiance and preventing a potential rape. Jill sets this theme then within the wider narrative context of Kerria's relationship with the male protagonist, Barney, a relationship that's romantic and sexual and yet challenges conventional romance models of the couple. As she puts it, as Jill puts it, the prevented rape scenario, which demands interpretation and prompts action, impels its reader to take their speculations beyond their reading and into the reality of their own lives. And thus, it seemed a good idea to set my own work on women readers and middle brown fiction in dialogue with Jill's splendid book. I agree with her central line of argument totally, reading does change us, Subtly, I think, often, incrementally, sometimes perhaps at an intimate psycho-emotional level, rather than by sending us out to march on the streets, though it can do that too, but change nonetheless. And although it's widely believed that people just don't read anymore, and here I rejoin Sandra's paper, and certainly the competition in terms of possible ways of consuming stories, consuming stories appearing to be a fundamental trait of humanity, 
but the, the ways of possibly consuming stories have, of course, increased enormously with technologies over the last century, certainly. <coughs> Nonetheless, in fact, people do continue to read. At the 2019 Salon du Livre in Paris, the Centre National du Livre published its biennial survey of reading practices in France and found that 92, uh, we've got slightly different figures, 92% of the French consider themselves readers. And there's been little drop in reading despite the competition of the internet, box series, uh, etc. Within those figures, women read a great deal more than men. Surveys by the CNL and the Direction du Livre et de Lecture, which is part of the Ministry of Culture, in 2017 found that sept lecteurs de romans sur dix sont des lectrices. That women are twice as likely to be gros lecteurs. 20 books per year, and the UK and the USA and I suspect other countries do all show the same general trend of a, a consistent, a sustained uh, feminisation or feminine nature of reading, reading fiction in particular. So drawing on the research done for my middle brow book, I want to return to Jill's model of reading as exchange and dialogue. My argument is broadly this that books don't change a lot if they're only ever read by a small number of the already converted who come to them as readers looking for dialogue and change. I think this echoes Jill's implicit point in her decision to focus not only on formerly radical texts like those of Sixus, but also on the more accessible, broadly realist novels of Constant and Baroche. But because women read a lot, and tend to read women authors, there is a whole swathe of fiction that has been very widely read, but, and this is more in France than in Anglophone cultures, but is deemed subliterary because it, it is accessible and attracts a large, popular, mainly female readership. The type of novel that non-professional women readers go for, that comes from Todorov's um, book about, about reading, the useful expression, ordinary readers, there's no satisfactory terminology really, but let's say non-professional women readers, the type of, of book novel I think that non-professional women readers go for, that they buy, borrow, pass on, select for book groups and so on, of course varies enormously. But certain qualities, I think, do recur, and I recognise my own preferences in this. Some of you may also, some of you may not. They tend to build compelling fictional worlds to be the kind of novels that, as Janice Radway puts it in A Feeling for Books, absorb readers totally into their felt worlds. Books in which the rush of a good plot and the inspiration offered by an unforgettable character produce that tactile, sensuous, profoundly emotional experience of being captured by a book. My question is, what effects might this sort of immersive, pleasurable, curl up with a book type of reading have on its women readers? Now, some theorists, and not only feminist ones, have gone against the grain of the hegemonic preference of critics and literary historians for the avant-garde, the difficult, the modernist and postmodernist, and their concomitant disdain for the mere well-plotted immersive tale. These, let's say, kind of counter theorists, have argued that we learn and grow not only by cerebral engagement with ideas and complex form, but also by the very process of fiction of simulated or virtual experience are make-believe. In the book, where I try to outline the uh, middle brow poetics and the apparent <coughs> oxymoron is, is deliberate, <coughs> quite a number of theorists are invoked, but I'm just going to concentrate here on two of the most useful for thinking about reading for change. Jean-Marie Schaeffer, and notably his 1999 Pourquoi la Fiction, and Marie-Laure Ryan, whose 2001 narrative is virtual reality, I found especially helpful. So this is the bit that's closest to, to the book. In a minute, I'll move on to something that was not in the book at all. But I think I need the sort of theoretical base here. So Schaeffer argues that immersion in a fictional story is not mere escapism, 
but is rather an important way of expanding and enriching knowledge, both cognitive and emotional. Fiction, he says, has a fonction modélisante. Uh, I have put most of the quotation, the uh, translations up here. It provides us with an exemplification fictionnelle de situation et de séquences comportementales. Fiction met à notre disposition des schémas de situation, des scénarios d'action, des constellations émotives et éthiques susceptibles d'être intériorisées par immersion. The imaginary world that we consent to enter provides a sort of safe space in which we can try out situations, sensations, emotions beyond our own direct experience, sur un terrain ludique. Ce qui nous donne la possibilité de les expérimenter sans être submergé par eux. And reading fiction, he argues, has the power throughout our lives à enrichir, à remodeler, à réadapter le socle cognitif et affectif originel grâce auquel nous avons accédé à l'identité personnelle et à notre être au monde. So reading for change indeed uh, on that theory. Marilo Ryan shares Schaeffer's conviction that to get lost in the book is also to find new facets of the self and of reality. Ryan's model of the reading experience has two essential and inalienable components, immersion and interactivity that they're in the title of her book. We may feel so present in the fictional world that we lose consciousness of our real surroundings, immersion. But actually, we never abandon all awareness that, we are, that we're reading a book. There's always a degree of interactivity. Reading, she rather nicely sums up, is an amphibian activity, always between the dry land and oxygen of reality and the ocean of imagination. But the dosage of these two components is variable. Reading is always somewhere on a spectrum between the two, with the more cerebral, analytical, textually aware concentration at one end, and the Don Quixote-like confusion of fiction with reality, that she terms addiction, at the other end. I place middle-brow reading, or what I'm calling middle-brow reading, somewhere in the middle, between, in Ryan's terminology, imaginative involvement and entrancement. And also useful, I think, is Ryan's view of the specificity of reading as opposed to, for example, watching stories on, tele on television or, or um, at the cinema. Unlike visual media, language cannot provide a direct representation of the sensory environment of the fictional world, but must use words to, as she puts it, coax the, re coax the reader's imagination into simulating sensory perception process that demands much skill on the part of the writer and willing engagement from the reader, Jill's reading dialogue or interactive engagement. <coughs> so there is a theoretical backup, in other words, for the argument that reading for pleasure, being carried away by a story, carried away by the story that we read, has salutary and potentially transformative effects. But to put the theory into practice, I want now to take two examples of stories written, and it's likely, probably read mainly by women, probably read mainly by women. Stories I would claim as middle brow, they're for different reasons in each case, and try to think through what their effects on readers might be. I've deliberately chosen texts that are not discussed in the book, even if one of them is very briefly mentioned. One is from the 1930s, the golden age of women's middle brow in Britain, though curiously not in France, and the other was published just a few years ago. Following Jill's model, I'm going to use one recurring theme to connect the text, and in my case, the, the recurring theme is going to be that of desire. Now, I did initially want to take at least three texts, you know how it is when you start thinking about something, and probably more, and I had the text all lined up, I was thinking, for example, of going back to Christian Rochefort, the great middle brow writer of the 50s and 60s, and probably Le Repos du Guerrier, her first. And there's a recent story by the much maligned, um, um, sorry, my mind's just gone blank. Uh, 
who has recently published another collection, her first book was a collection of short stories, and she's recently published another one called Fendre l'Armure, and some of those, and one in particular, was excellent. However, there's only so much time that I can stand here keeping you all prisoner, so uh, <laughs> I've limited it just to just two texts, in fact, um, which are the following. How are you doing for time? Do you just tell me when you want to take a pause? It's like 20 past. Yeah, another, another, another ten minutes or so. Fine, okay, so my first case then is Ivan yeah. Nemirovsky, whom I think you've all heard of. Yeah. Nemirovsky, as I'm sure you know, died in Auschwitz in 1942. She was Jewish. More than 50 years later, her daughter found the unfinished manuscript of two novellas in a suitcase her mother had left behind. And they were published under the title Suite Française, which was also adapted into a film. Another typical uh, dimension of Mother Brow Texas, they're very often adapted, because they have a strong storyline, and became an international bestseller in 2004. However, in the years preceding her death, and this had been pretty much totally forgotten, Nemi Hosky had been already been a best-selling author. An accessible mainstream novelist, quintessentially middle brow characterised in interviews and by her publishers as an ordinary middle-class wife and mother who also wrote. <laughs> in her very readable novels, she addressed what Angela Kershaw calls trends and social tensions of the contemporary age in a form and style neither jarringly modernist nor tediously traditional. Mm -hmm. And a quick thought for Angela there, whom some of you might have known, um, and who sadly died last year. Wrote a magnificent book on Nemirovsky. Um, for example, amongst these these um, trends and social tensions, there was uh, the impact of World War One on the young generation, especially women, the restless spirit of the 1920s, and so on. The zeitgeist. She wasn't a women's writer in particular, though I suspect she was always more read by women. Her protagonists are quite often male, the world is often <coughs> localised from their point of view as well, but women's life course does take centre stage in her fiction. Her story, Dimanche, was first published in La Rue de Paris in 1934, and then as part of a short story collection published pos posthumously by Stock in 2000. And interestingly, it was picked up, or her short stories were picked up by Persephone, the UK publishers dedicated to the republication of women's middle brown, thereby proving my case. <laughs> Translated by Bridget Patterson, published in 2010. Dimanche takes place between lunchtime and evening on a beautiful spring Sunday in Paris. The two central characters are mother and daughter, and yes, the mother is married to Guillaume, whom she once loved and desired but who's now become a stout, complacent, serially unfaithful part of familias. Gras, bien portant et heureux. That was from the point of view of uh, Agnes. Nadine, the 20-year-old daughter, is intoxicated with her own youthful energy and beauty, and convinced that for her generation, women's situation has progressed immeasurably. Enfin, maintenant, en 1934, pour une femme, c'est formidable, she reflects as she rushes out after family lunch to a secret rendezvous with the slightly older, seductively experienced Rémi, who stands her up, but later rescues her from utter misery by ringing and rearranging the date. In terms of plot, not very much happens, but the story has a satisfying shape. Agnès, at home with her younger daughter, while the rest of the family are out in the sunshine, passes through different states of mind and emotion. Nadine goes into Paris full of elated anticipation, only to wait, increasingly forlorn, in a cafe, and then return home, where her happiness and Remy's power are restored by his phone call. The unities of time and place contribute to the story's cohesion. Only a few hours pass between family lunch and early evening. There are just two locations, the comfortable family flat in a bourgeois suburb, and the cafe in central Paris. 
And structuring the story too is the contrast between the sunny outdoors redolent of the hopefulness of spring and the darker interiors of house and cafe where <coughs> we wait. Desire is central to the story in two senses. What the reader experiences virtually through the fictional characters is the intensity of desire for life and love and shaping one's own destiny and the particular ways in which for women that desire is blocked and disappointed. Mother and daughter fail to see what connects them. Nadine assumes her mother has never known cette félicité, cette ardeur, cette vigueur, cette chaleur du sang, and this happiness, this ardour, this vigour, this um, the warmth, of, the warmth of the blood. Um, that, sorry, Nadine assumes her mother's never known all of this, that she feels so intensely, while Agnès credits her daughter with an improbable degree of innocence. But the story shows how the two, in fact, mirror each other. They both know the joy of feeling an appetite for life, the sense of possibility and of one's own agency that encompasses sexual desire, but transcends it. Par moment, thinks Nadine, il me semble que je suis par-dessus tout amoureuse de moi-même. Agnès remembers how, à 20 ans, le bonheur me semblait différent, plus terrible, plus vaste. But desire is boundary by relationships of power, and the story makes quietly clear that if there is always, for everyone, a gap between desire and its possible fulfilment, this gap is distinctly larger for women of both generations. And yes, presumably in her 40s, is out of the game, enclosed in the house, casanière et éteinte, as her husband reflects, whilst he, on the, other, on the other hand, on his way to meet another mistress, at 45, has reached l'âge où l'homme est le plus puissant, le plus lourd, vient d'appelant sur la terre, le sang été et riche. Nadine is powerless before any socially condoned promiscuity, and the aura of experience and sophistication that this confers on men. Marriage is the almost inevitable destiny, and the alternative of spinsterhood is briefly evoked only by mention of the dark ground floor flat où deux vieilles filles s'abritaient dans l'ombre, shut out of the spring mood of sunny hopefulness like Agnès herself. The activity that most strongly links mother and daughter and embodies women's socially imposed passivity is waiting. As is the case in all in other Nemirovsky texts, Nadine waits as if any fails to arrive, the clock grimly ticking away the minutes and the hours. Agnès waits in the house for her family to return and remembers waiting for Guillaume in a rainy park. Mesurant lentement et mélancoliquement, Les minutes écoulées sans retour, il ne venait pas. A woman sits down by her in her memory and widens further the sense of waiting as a collective gendered fate. She purses her lips, concierge pensé une de plus. <laughs> the contrast between the elated urgency of desire and the frustrated passivity of waiting is at the heart of the story. And there's a second dimension too, I think, to the characterization of female desire in this story. Though Agnès revolts mentally at her own consignment to domesticity and maternity, j'ai cette maison sur la terre tout à coup avec fièvre, she also acknowledges in herself the desire for serenity, for the security of home. Sa maison, le refuge, la coquille close et chaude, close au bruit du dehors. A home to which Nadine too returns, not to comprehension, but still to safety and a tacit sort of welcome. In terms of effect on the reader, this story does not stick out a foot to trip up the patriarchy. It acknowledges the tension between the human desire for self-affirmation, pleasure and agency, and the opposing but equally real desire for home and belonging and it enables the virtual, tactile experience, to use Janice Radway's um, terminology, of how social power is gendered and desire is more constrained and blocked and in particular ways for women. Whilst inviting an empathetic reading of two women whose behaviour acknowledges and accepts their own powerless status, and yes, waits, remains silent, or not, we assume, change her life, 
Nadine's gestures of self-assertion soon give way to delight at Amy's return. And as her mother reflects, la vie l'éteindra, la doucira, la sagira, comme les autres. Despite our empathetic understanding of how these women feel and think and the fact that they do not revolt any more than briefly, in, in sort of psycho emotionally, psychologically, the story nonetheless proposes a more angry, resistant response through the repulsion implicit in the descriptions of Guillaume, through Agnès's momentary revolt, cela ne suffit pas, she thinks at one point, through the central contrast between aspiration and reality. In 1934 or now, it would be hard not to emerge from reading this story with a sharpened sense of the subtle ways in which one's own desires are shaped and limited by sexual politics, and a heightened sense of the need for resistance. Schaeffer's Fonction Modélisante works through the pleasurable reading of an unemphatic but subtly crafted story. That's where I'm about to move on to Léla Slimani. It's half past five. If you would like to take the opportunity. Thank you, Lars. Let's just let's really dispatch it rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. So as not to break the spell. <laughs> okay. Right, I'll, 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 start, I'll start again then. So with the second text that I've taken, so remember that we're, we're thinking about um, desire as the linking theme and trying to think what books have been very widely read by women in particular, or what it's <coughs> on the reader. So in 2016, Leila Slimani won the Prix Goncourt for a novel that opens with the dead bodies of two small children murdered by their nanny and remains a tough, emotionally demanding read. But literary prizes, especially the high-profile Goncourt, can shift a novel from one brow to another. <laughs> Widely publicised, marketed with new vigour and imagination, the difficult Chanson Douce became a bestseller, reaching a huge audience who otherwise simply might not have come across it, or might well have assumed it was all about misery and pain and not the kind of reading that they would choose. I, I, it was the effect of reading the first two pages had on me, I must have really put it away. I came back to it quite some time later. Um, in fact, Chanson Douce, which is, I'm sure you know, was also translated with considerable success, which is unusual in this country particularly for a, for a foreign language novel, in English translated as Lullaby, and, and in the US as The Perfect Nanny. Lullaby is the better title, I think. Anyway, it's a, high, a highly relevant, socially, it, it is also, you know, amongst other things, a highly relevant, socially realist text that, despite its hard subject, works as a page turner. In the wake of its huge critical and commercial success then, Slimani's earlier novel, Dans le Jardin de, de l'Ogre, was also treated to a great deal more attention and publicity. And again, this is a novel that's quite hard to read, certainly offers no inspirational examples of female strength, nor displays those redemptive qualities that I found to characterise much middle brow reading. And yet, without reaching the stellar sales of Chanson Douce, which had reached 600,000 by January 2019, Dans le Jardin de Logue very soon topped 100,000, <coughs> which is bad in France alone, and is extensively discussed, for example, in the online book club site Badenio by largely by women readers. The story deals with the uncomfortable subject of female sex addiction and has a heroine, Adele, with whom it's often hard to empathise. I want to start with the effect on the reader, inevitably taking my own reactions as the first source of evidence, but also relying for support on friends who've also read the novel and readers commenting on Pavelio, which is just seems to be the biggest of the, the online book, uh, book clubs. As in the case of a violent but compelling crime or horror novel, Don Jardin de Logue is read, I think, with a feeling of nervous tension from which you emerge with some relief. Whatever the denouement, there is some pleasure in leaving behind the suspense, the make-believe but viscerally felt experience of dread, of fear that the heroine will bring about her own destruction. The suspense arises because Adele, whose point of view we largely share, is outwardly an enviable woman who has it all, a middle-class Parisian journalist, wife and mother, 
but she's driven by an insatiable desire for sex with men, often with strangers. Though Adele's experience of compulsive desire for extreme, often violent sex is probably foreign to most readers, um, the secrecy that it demands, the sense of a domestic and professional life built over an abyss of guilt and danger provides a heightened, radically dramatised version, I think, of the anxieties and insecurities of everyday life. The sense that, you know, the nice surface of life has, and beneath it just has the possibility of an abyss into which one might fall. Um, sorry, yeah, a dramatised version of the anxieties and insecurities of everyday life lived through in simulated form in the ultimately safe space of fiction. I think one emerges slightly chastened and bruised, it's a painful novel to read, but admiring. Slimani is an unshowy but pleasingly precise, effective writer, her nervous prose favouring short, unadorned, staccato sentences that mirror both Adele's unrelenting inattention and the third-person narrator's factual, non-judgmental stance. I think most readers also emerge with a sense of having broadened their scope of empathy. For Adele is, as Slimani herself put it in an interview <coughs> in English, an anti-heroine, a bad person in the eyes of society. Adele's desires contravene all the rules, not just of the normative femininity <coughs> that in 2009 most readers, I think, will view as open to question the kind of absolutely standard, you know, normative, traditional kind of femininity. But she also contravenes the rules of the sort of baseline liberal feminism that has arguably become consensual. She suffers from an uncontrolling controllable craving to be the object of male desire. Elle n'aspire qu'à être voulu. She only desires, she only desires she, um, all that she wants is to be wanted. Her sexual desires are voracious, always greater than any possible fulfillment, and bring her neither pleasure nor joy, only a temporary reprieve from the compulsion. And thus, although she values her relationship with the faithful Richard, and her motherhood as refuge, a means to appartenir au monde et se protéger de toute différence avec les autres, to belong to the world and protect herself from uh, dip, feeling different from everybody else. <laughs> um, she's a bad mother, who knows a crime, and a mendacious, <laughs> endlessly unfaithful partner to a man who loves her and is portrayed as unimaginative but kind and doing his best. He's also a doctor, and the Madame Bovary parallels are very strong. Adele is also indifferent to her career, not the crime, though she has an enviably exciting, privileged job as journalist at a news magazine that allows her to travel, to write, to be part of the unfolding world of contemporary events. And she neglects, deceives, and exploits her loyal friend and alibi, Lorraine. She's a bad friend, too. So, a willed self-objectification, intense egotism that makes for callous treatment of others, no sense of social responsibility or ambition to exercise social agency as a woman. So where are the openings for empathy? Well, I think there are several. First, in her pursuit of her own objectification, Adele remains paradoxically in control. It's she who makes the advances, imposes her desires, pays where necessary, drops a man once she ceased to want him, so that despite the abject form it takes, her desire remains in a curious sense, a form of self-affirmation. Slimani's inspiration, <coughs> she says, came partly from the case of Deus Carr, uh, Dominique strauss -Kahn, and the question that this raised for, for her, what if he be a woman? The reversal of a script much more often seen in terms of male sexual behaviour has few overtones in this novel, I think, of feminist revenge, but it still means that the novel's heroine exercises a transgressive form of agency. And could it be, too, that Adele's pathological desire allows readers to acknowledge an element of sexual desire that can easily feel shameful in the age of Me Too, the desire not just to affirm the self, but also to give way, to be taken, to abdicate will and responsibility. So there's that kind of empathy. Secondly, Adele is granted a background 
that without determining her sex addiction, does go some way to explaining it as a malady caused by environmental factors. Through flashbacks, we learn that her mother, too, had a secretive, pernicious relationship with men and both neglected her daughter and used her as an alibi. Adele's introduction to sex as a child was a trip in a miniature tourist train round Pigalle between her mother and a, an unknown man who her mother knew but that she didn't as a, a sort of a, a, a stranger um, who were ex exchanging regards lubriques past pimps, transsexuals and prostitutes half naked despite the cold rain and there Adèle a ressenti pour la première fois ce mélange de peur et d'envie, de dégoût et des mois érotiques that has never left her. There's also a suggestion of sexual abuse in her childhood by an obese, na obese neighbour described in repulsively graphic terms. <clears throat> her father is a beloved and loving figure, but his passivity means that he offers no <coughs> protection from a hostile, jealous mother. And the plot's cohesion gains from the fact that Adele's final fall from grace closely follows on her father's death. And early, uh, no, sorry, still within this, you know, explanation by environmental factors, social class has its place too. The female role that Adele fails to fulfil, though she's good at its surface performance, is a middle class one, far from her own materially and culturally impoverished roots. Richard's family, who try but fail to overcome their instinctive mistrust and to integrate her into the clan, represent a perfect facsimile of the ideal affluent family but in a way that vividly recalls other women's novels of social ascension through marriage, notably um, uh, Annie Amour's La Femme Jeunée and Christiane Rochefort's Les Stances à Sophie. It's, it's very simple to both of those in this sense. In the way that the compliant, kitchen-bound mother-in-law resigned to her husband's infidelities and her children's patronising tolerance reveals that this perfect, this perfect bourgeois family comes at the cost of women's desires. So despite the abject nature of Adele's obsessive desire and the damage she does to herself and others, as a reader it's hard not to feel that you're rooting for her, to recognise her ugly compulsions as a distorted form of a more understandable search for love and self-affirmation. And here, somewhat as in Dimanche, there's also a second, very recognisable, strand of desire that runs counter to the addiction to sex. Adele longs to be virtuous and orderly, to conform to social expectations and thus find a, a, a form of belonging and peace. The novel opens with Adele observing some very 21st century forms of female virtue. Une semaine qu'elle tient, une semaine qu'elle n'a pas cédé, Adèle a été sage. En quatre jours, elle a couru 32 km, elle n'a pas bu d'alcool et elle s'est couchée tôt. Voilà. She returns repeatedly to good intentions, to the sense that rien ne lui semble valoir la peine de mettre en danger les matins dans les bras de son fils, cette tendresse, ce besoin qu'il a d'elle. Elle va nettoyer le quotidien, se débarrasser une à une de ses angoisses. Elle va remplir son devoir. And yet, she continues to seek out her own radical sexual objectification to the extent of hiring male <coughs> prostitutes for violent sex that leaves her beaten up, vomiting and wounded. Le sexe à vif, déchiré, tunifié, comme un visage qu'on a passé à tabac. Adele's desire is split, divergent, conflicted. <laughs> so, this dual structure of desire, on the one hand, the wild urge to kick over the traces, to see pure self-affirmation, to project the self onto the world beyond, on the one hand. On the other hand, the deep longing for security, home, the warmth of belonging. That tension, that conflict, perhaps runs through all human culture regardless of sex. But it's certainly a recurring trope in the stories that women read and tell each other, from the ubiquitous romance, which has both those elements, to middle-brow literary fiction, and even fairy tales. 
Dans le Jardin de l'Aube is a title that immediately evokes fairy tales. Little Red Riding Hood, I was always thinking about fairy tales, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks and all the rest of them venture out, if not literally into the ogre's garden, then certainly into the forest, disobeying the rules by wandering off the track, trespassing on other people's land or houses in the case of Goldilocks, staying out longer than they should and thus choosing to confront the wolves and the bears even as they and the reader or the listener hope for the happy ending of a safe return home. Nemirovsky's story too hinges on the tensions between women's conflicted desires for adventurous agency and the tranquility of belonging. The recurrence of this depiction of desire in women's fiction may be explained by the fact that the gap between self-assertion and the socially approved behaviour that earns security is wider for women. Nadine's sense of triumphant agency will not survive her inevitable future as a wife, casanier et étant like her mother, whereas um, her father's sense of agency is clearly still very much alive and well, and Rémy's, one imagines, will continue to be so as well. When Richard tries to save Adele from her dangerous compulsions by carrying her away to rural domestic life, une vie faite de contraintes et d'habitudes, her relief is soon overtaken by a sense of deadly tedium and loss. Mais guérir, she says to the therapist actually, mais guérir c'est terrible aussi. C'est perdre quelque chose. The coexistence of these twin forms of desire and the struggle between them produces the narrative friction of a compelling plot and enables the reader to engage with the ambivalence of her, of our own desires. This ambivalence is maintained to the end in Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre. The novel concludes with Adèle drunk in a cafe far from home, first weeping for longing to return to the house she shares with Richard and Lucien, then, as they fade into her blurring consciousness, dancing alone with a sort of odd serenity. Yeah. With a sort of odd serenity. Le sentiment de vivre un instant de grâce. Surrounded by men who press themselves against her, pass her around between them. In counterpoint, Slimani then returns to the inter her intermittent adoption of Richard's point of view through the use of style and livre. He is the husband who waits, loving, patient, l'amour s'amie que de la patience, he reflects, but also implicit in the grammatical form of his soliloquy, il ira la chercher où qu'elle se cache, il la ramènera, il lui enfoncera le visage dans le quotidien, and in his controlling <coughs> fantasy of a future Adèle qui saura se contenter de préoccupations banales, Underneath Richard's kind and generous and patient intentions, there is the spectre, I think, of a subtler, gentler, a more subtle, gentler form of the abjection that Adèle seeks at the hands of men. Slimani describes her novel as also une grande histoire d'amour, and it is that, as with all compelling stories of love, it invites reflection on what love means in practice. So in conclusion then, <laughs> I just found a photo of you I'll have you as well to finish off with. In conclusion then, these two stories and many more that time excluded, I mean I, I mean them to be representative rather than just these two, they propose no models of how to behave, but through what Janice Rafe calls absorption into their felt fictional worlds, they invite increased awareness of our own desires and of the commonality of social and gendered structures that shape these, that shape desire. There is also, in both examples, a widening of empathy towards subjectivities, both like and unlike our own. In Adele's case, to a woman who in so many ways is beyond the pale, which means literally beyond the fenced area that is enclosed and safe. And to Lisha, even a Charles Char Bovary for the 21st century. Empathy means recognising ourselves in them as well as accepting their otherness. In these senses, reading quietly, incrementally, I think, changes us. So I'd like to end with Jill's own conclusion, which is equally fitting here. Literature, she says, is a gift, a departure, a send-off, 
but it's reading it actively, interrogatively, creatively, speculatively, and I would add immersively, that takes us in the direction of new paths of possibility, of thought, of life. Our individual readings can feed creatively into the difficult, risky practice of developing alternative ways of living, loving, being, and relating to others. Thank you.